Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr. President, I table documents and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any, any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, senators, I have received through the Governor General from the Governor of Western Australia a copy of the certificate of the choice by the Parliament of Western Australia of Benjamin John Small to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of Senator Cormann, and I table the document. A new senator approaches the chamber. Admit the senator. Senator, please come to the table to make and subscribe the affirmation of allegiance. I, Benjamin Small, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II the heirs and successors according to law. Senator, please sign the test roll and the senator's roll. Give Senator. I'll let Senator Small go to the, uh, get to his seat, and I'll call Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the remote participation of senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I move that the rules for remote participation of Senate proceedings recommended by the Procedure Committee in its first report of 2020 have effect during the sittings of the Senate from 30 November to 10 December 2020. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator, I've got a, a, Senator Griff, then I'll come to you, Senator Rustin. Senator Griff. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave for an additional motion for which notice has not been given to be considered at formal motions today. The motion has been circulated in the chamber, and I understand that I have the agreement of the whips. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Rustin. Um, <laughs> um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of private senators' bills. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Rustin. Move that the following generous bu general business orders of the day be considered today at the time for private senators' bills. Number 56, Aged Care Legislation Amendment Financial Transparency Bill 2020, which may be proceeded with second reading speeches only before uh, the Community Affairs Legislation Committee reports. And number 51, Banking Amendment Deposits Bill 2020. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. General business orders of the day for the consideration of private senators' bills, number 56, Aged Care Legislation Amendment, Financial Transparency Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The title of the interim report of the Aged Care Royal Commission said it all. 
neglect. That simple word cuts to the bone and speaks to the fears we all share about aged care in Australia. It's not easy when a parent or a friend moves into care. It's a conversation many of us put off time and time again. We put it off because it is difficult to give up the care of someone we love to people we don't know. And we put it off because we don't know how to respond to the fears that are felt. The fear of abandonment, the fear of abuse, the fear of neglect. We want to believe that residential aged care in particular will be like home. We want to believe our loved ones will receive the attention they need and the care that they deserve. Mr. Behe. The Royal Commission was gutting because it showed comprehensively the standard of care we expect, we should be able to expect, was often not being delivered. Some facilities were not like home. Some of our loved ones were not being cared for. And some of our fears were well and truly justified. Aged care providers have argued that they do their best with the limited financial resources available to them. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. It's hard to know because we don't have the information to judge their claims. The current reporting systems are totally inadequate. Some might argue that these are private businesses and they should be able to disclose as much or as little as they like. And normally, I would agree. But these are businesses that are receiving over $21 billion in Commonwealth funding every year for residential and home care services. $21 billion. For that sort of money, you would expect real accountability. You would expect providers to show what that money is being used for. You would expect the government to know how much is being spent on care. You would be wrong. This bill amends the Aged Care Act. It will require residential aged care providers to submit an annual report to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner. That report would show us how much income each provider is receiving and the sources of that funding. It would also show how much every facility is spending how much they are spending on food, how much is being spent on medicine, how much is being spent on medical supplies, and how much is spent on training. It would also show us how many staff are employed for each classification and how much the executives are being paid. Financial transparency is a reasonable requirement for any sector receiving tens of billions of dollars of public funds. And the cost of compliance will be trivial. Providers already collect this information, and no private information will also need to be disclosed. For every honest operator in the sector, financial transparency will be a godsend. It will show the facilities where residents are receiving the most care. For others, for those who take public money but neglect their residents, financial transparency will be a nightmare. A nightmare that I am pleased for them to have. It will show exactly how much money is being spent at each facility and how much is being siphoned off to other corporate entities. It will show their residents, their families and the community the type of facilities they are operating. It will show where they are spending and where they are investing. It will show us their priorities and what they value the most. This will allow residents and families to make informed decisions when choosing a facility. It will help us understand how far these dollars are going and whether we need to invest more so good providers can do more. This is information the public deserves to know. It is information that senior Australians deserve to know. 
There is absolutely no justification whatsoever for keeping this information secret or for allowing providers to remain unaccountable. The inquiry into this bill is ongoing. 22 submissions have been received to date, and they have been overwhelmingly supportive of financial transparency. I am grateful to everyone who took the time to share their experiences and their views, including care providers. But I do wish more had taken the opportunity to engage with the inquiry. All who made submissions made important, valuable contributions. In their submission, the Australian Medical Association said, and I'll quote, any older person entering aged care, including their carers, has the right to know how their chosen provider of aged care services spends the funds they receive from the government on the consumer's behalf and the co-funding provided by the consumer themselves. This was a fundamental premise of the aged care roadmap adopted by the government in 2016." End of quote. In their submission, Aged Care Crisis Inc. said, the absence of data has made it impossible to formulate policies that are based on evidence rather than wishful thinking. It has been impossible to make informed choice and has exposed many vulnerable citizens to the risks of exploitation by profit-focused operators. And on behalf of care providers, Aged and Community Services Australia said, transparency in reporting is important, but we must avoid duplication in reporting requirements or adding new reporting requirements that will not materially improve information for consumers, the regulator or government." End of quote. I do understand the point that they are making. But if care-focused financial information was already reported, there would be absolutely no need for this bill. The Royal Commission showed a clear need for better information, for better decision-making and better policy-making. Consumers, regulators and government all benefit from transparency. Finally, the Aged Care Guild, who represents care providers, said it was, and I'll quote, fair and reasonable to expect providers to share information demonstrating how financial supports contribute to care services. Now, we are in wholehearted agreement of this. They go on to argue that regulatory requirements and costs are constantly increasing, while overall funding has not kept pace. I don't know if this is true, but that's not the point. The point of this bill is to give us the transparency we need to monitor costs and funding. It will give providers the statistical evidence they need to make the case for increased funding. And it will give the government the information they need to evaluate if more funding is truly needed. I would like to thank the groups who have expressed strong support for this bill. They include the Australian Medical Association, the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation, the Council of Trade Unions, the Health Services Unions, National Seniors Australia and the Age Rights Advocacy Service of South Australia. I thank them all for their support, particularly the ANMF for their input into drafting this bill. The inquiry on this bill will report at the end of March, after which I will bring this bill to a vote. I hope every senator will support it. And I hope any senator who has concerns about the bill will come and discuss these with me. If you believe financial information should not be reported, if you have concerns or if you have some suggestions, I will hear you out. But I hope you will hear me out too. And I hope you will seriously consider whether the current approach is delivering for the residents of these facilities for their families and for taxpayers. The Royal Commission demonstrated the problems in the aged care sector are systemic and that the aged care system is designed around transactions, not relationships or care. 
No single piece of legislation can transform the sector or solve all of its problems. But there are things we can do and things that we can very much do better. Financial transparency is well and truly one of them. My bill provides for a simple and fair change that will drive providers to do better. It will make a difference to the lives of aged care residents. And it will help us be a little more certain that our loved ones are going to a good place. A place that they can call home, a place where they will truly be cared for. Thank you, Senator Grigg. Thank you. Oh, there you are. Sorry, yes, Senator here Anderson. I am. I've looked for you over there. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. It's my great pleasure to rise and speak on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Financial Transparency Bill 2020. Madam Deputy President, looking after our senior citizens is one of the most important responsibilities we have as a nation. The Morrison government's track record in continually improving aged care is extensive. And we are very proud of many of our key initiatives. Of course, many of them have been incorporated into the 2021 budget. And before I outline those and speak about the details of this bill, I just want to take issue with Senator Griff and the comments he made about aged care being centred around transactions and not care. And I know Senator Griff does come into the Senate with a lot of good intentions, but I really do take issue with that, Madam Deputy President, because so many aged care providers, residential aged care providers, do an incredible job. And I don't want to stand here and allow the misdeeds of a number of residential providers who are not doing the right thing to cast dispersions on the sector as a whole. So I do want to reject the premise on which Senator Griff made that comment. Of course, uh, Madam Deputy President, under our budget we've provided $1.6 billion more for another 23 home care packages. This builds on the $325 million investment for 6,000 or so packages announced by the Prime Minister on the 8th of July 2020. There's another $11 million to ensure ongoing face-to-face -face video and telephone interventions for psychosocial support through the Dementia Behaviour Management Advisory Service and Severe Behaviour Response Teams. There's just over $10 million over three years to support the recently established Aged Care Workforce Industry Council uh, to take a major role in implementing the 14 strategic actions outlined in a matter of care Australia's aged, aged Care Workforce Strategy. There's $10.6 million over three years to establish a national network of system coordinators to help younger people find age-appropriate accommodation, uh, which supports them to live independently in the community. There's $91.6 million over two years to support potential implementation of the Australian National Aged Care Classification Funding Model in residential aged care. This funding builds on previous investments of $167 million announced in the July Economic and Fiscal Update to continue to improve the aged care funding model, bringing the total investment to some $258 million. In the budget also, $35.6 million over two years for the Business Improvement Fund, which provides targeted grant-based assistance to residential aged care providers experiencing viability concerns, and that is a key issue of the sector. $125.3 million for the replacement of the Commonwealth Continuity of Support to the Commonwealth Disability Support for Older Australians program, and that's to continue to support older people with a disability who are not eligible under the NDIS. And there's also $4.6 million to expand the single in-home support program to support older people remain in their homes. So a huge raft of investments in aged care that have just been announced in our most recent budget. And of course, Madam Deputy President, every year under the Morrison government, home care packages are up, residential care places are up, and every single year, aged care funding goes up. The Morrison government, and these are the facts, 
is delivering record investment across the aged care system over the Ford estimates from $13.3 billion in 2012-13 under the previous Labor government, growing to $21.3 billion in 2019-20, and we estimate that funding for aged care will grow to more than $27 billion in the years 23-24. So that is, on average, $1.1 billion of extra support for older Australians each year over the Ford estimates. The government spent over $13.4 billion in 1920 on residential care, up from $9.2 billion in 2012-13. And in 2023-24, the years 23-24, this will grow to over $17.1 billion. So we are seeing massive increases in investment by our government. And I will make this point, this really important point, making improvements to aged care for all senior Australians continues to be one of the Morrison government's most important priorities. And that is precisely why the Prime Minister called a Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. And that is precisely why we are acting. As Commissioner Briggs stated as part of the final hearings of the Royal Commission, I have, however, detected over the last year, Council, a growing determination among officials and in the government to fix the problems of the aged care system and to pursue a genuine reform agenda. And, Madam Deputy President, we are committed to providing that genuine reform agenda, to providing senior Australians with support to live in their homes longer. New home care packages have increased from 60,000 under Labor in 2012-13 to 185,000 in 2023-24, an increase of 208 per cent. Over the same period, funding will increase by 302 per cent due to growth in high-level packages. And what is in stark contrast? is that at the last election, Labor provided no additional funding in their costings for home care places or any additional funding for age quality, workforce or residential age care. So it's pretty rich for those opposite to stand up on age care, and I don't include Senator Griff, who's sitting opposite me at the moment but for Labor senators to stand up and members in the other place when Labor so failed Australians at the last election. In fact, in the opposition leader's budget reply speech, Mr Albanese's reply speech, just a few months ago, aged care did not even get a mention in the entire half an hour budget reply speech. That is really shameful on the Labor Party. I, I make that very strong point. And of course, this year has been a year like no other, Madam Deputy President. The COVID-19 response, of course, has been incredibly challenging. And since the beginning of the pandemic, our government has invested more than 1.6 billion specifically to deal with the response to the pandemic. This includes boosting quality and safety monitoring, support for retaining the care workforce, providing an additional surge workforce, assistance to the sector with additional costs, providing resources to COVID-19 impacted facilities uh, and funding, of course, more Australians to um, stay at home. And of course, as we know, we had a very serious situation in Victoria as a result of the hotel quarantine program, which allowed community transmission of the virus to run out of control and there was a very and of course as we always knew if that happened it would get into the most vulnerable of the community aged care homes and as a result extra funding was also delivered for a victorian aged care response center so i want to turn to the bill before the senate today which proposes amendments to the aged care act and the corporations act uh, which would have the effect of requiring, requiring that aged care providers report certain financial and cost information 
to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner, including income and subsidies received from care and the amount spent on staff. It also provides that the Commissioner will publish reports received from providers and, if an approved provider received more than $10 million in Commonwealth funding in a financial year, uh, greater financial reporting requirements under the Corporations Act. I will make uh, the first point in response as to uh, why the government is not supporting this bill. The usefulness of the proposed public information is not clear because it has the potential to be misleading to consumers. For example, in some instances, there may be reasons why the itemised cost of medical products and continence aids, as an example, would vary between residential aged care services uh, such that the information would not assist transparency for consumers necessarily. Uh, the amendments are also not supported by the government as they and this is a really important point, as they preempt the final report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, which is due in February of next year. The Royal Commission has been critical of constant change and moving targets in its interim report. And embracing these um, proposals or amendments on their own in a piecemeal fashion uh, would not reflect the importance of the government ensuring that our reforms are integrated, cohesive and solutions-driven. Uh, we don't want to preempt the Royal Commission. That would be most inappropriate. And the reforms at their heart, as we recognise, must deliver the best care for all senior Australians, and that's got to be, without exception, putting the care of seniors at the centre. And if we do so in a piecemeal way, we may in fact err in not addressing other really important issues in relation to um, transparency. Senator Griff's proposed amendments also raise issues for the fiscal impact on the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, and while not directly relevant to Parliament's consideration of Senator Griff's proposed amendments, um, the Australian government does need to be cognisant of these issues. While no costing of the resourcing implications has occurred at this stage, the proposed amendments are likely to have resource implications in the form of report collection activity. This will require additional staff and or IT systems, resources to collect the required reports from providers. Uh, there will also be, we expect, additional costs in compliance and enforcement activity to respond to providers that fail to report by the required time frame or who give an inadequate report to the Commissioner. Uh, there will also be report publishing activity costs. This will re also require additional staff and or IT systems resources to publish these reports, whether they are on the Commission's web website or on My Age Care. And there's also a resources issue in relation to data incorporation activity. So further resources would be required to build these reports into the Commission's risk profiling IT systems. There are also, there, and I do want to say already that there are very important existing requirements for aged care providers to report annual financial information under the Aged Care Act. Uh, this requirement includes the, provide, the um, provision that all aged care providers are to provide an aged care financial report, the ACFR, to the Secretary of the Department of Health. Within the, within the residential income and expenditure statement, providers are already required to report on the sources of the funds they receive. That's from the Commonwealth, the state, uh, residential, um, from the residents themselves and other sources, and then explain how these funds were expended against the categories of care, accommodation, hotel expenses, so things like catering and cleaning, administration, finances and other non-operational expenditure. Uh, there's also the requirement that all residential aged care providers must give an aged care prudential compliance statement to the secretary, and all non-government residential aged care providers must provide an independently audited general purpose financial report prepared in accordance with accounting standards uh, as if the approved provider is a distinct 
reporting entity. The department is currently working to expand the requirements of the ACFR and expects revised reporting requirements will be in place from the 1st of July 2021, so it's important to know that that work is underway. The revised requirements will introduce more transparency around the operational results of the facilities uh, that a particular provider operates. This expansion will cover some of the additional reporting requirements proposed under section 92A2 uh, of the bill, as well as new information related to parent entity finances. Uh, and the department will also undertake sector consultation before these requirements are introduced. So all of these changes are being considered in terms of the Royal Commission and the Prudential Standards Review to ensure they are integrated with other reforms and they have the potential, of course, we recognise the potential for increased administrative burden and these matters do need to be appropriately balanced. So, uh, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, we're very proud of the support our government is providing, including in these important reforms, but we await the Thank final you. results of the Royal Thank you, Senator Commission. Henderson. Thank you. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Financial Transparency Bill 2020. This bill amends the Aged Care Act 1997 to require residential aged care providers to provide an annual financial transparency report to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner, who would make the information public, publicly available. Look, it's always interesting to follow Senator Henderson. Um, obviously, she's had um, a, a, a lapse in memory and she's trying to rewrite history. Her government has now uh, been on the government benches for seven years, and during that seven years, they have not had one capable comp uh, minister who um, has sat around the cabinet table and had the authority to support um, older Australians in this country, and they should be ashamed of their record. But to get back to this bill, it requires aged care providers to disclose their income, their spend on food and medication, the amount spent on staff and staff training, accommodation, administration and how much they pay out to their parent body. The Labor Party believes that we need better transparency around funding. In fact, we on this side, and when I was the Shadow Assistant Minister for Ageing, I spoke about this issue on numerous occasions, advocating for much needed reform. People in aged care have been turned into commodities. We have extensive wait times for people waiting for their approved home care packages. People in residential aged care facilities are malnourished, over-prescribed drugs and neglected. Yet, at the higher levels of these corporations, we have managers and executives paying themselves excessive wages. This system is broken and in dire need of reform. I've lost count of the amount of times that I've stood here and said these very words. It's clear that the aged care funding instrument is broken, and we have known that for quite some time. The tool which assesses the needs of residents in the largest source of revenue for residential aged care providers. It's based on dependency, so there is limited incentives for aged care providers to actively encourage reablement and rehabilitation in residents. At the same time as this, many aged care providers are not commercially viable and many are struggling, particularly in the not-for-profit uh, sector. More transparency and accounting for public funding, that is the system that must be forthcoming. It's not an option. Time for delay is over. We need that action now. We need better transparency around funding. We need to know that the funding goes into aged care is actually improving the quality of care and ensuring older Australians can live out the rest of their lives with dignity, with proper high quality care and comfort. You've got it over 20 billion dollars a year going into the aged care system to support older Australians to stay at home and in residential care. We need more accountability about where that money is actually going and more oversight on how that money is being spent. 
because I can assure you Australians are not getting value for money. I and many others, including the Shadow Minister Julie Collins, have been banging the drums for years that there needs to be more transparency so older Australians and their loved ones know what is happening. We don't only need greater financial transparency, we need better access to information on a number of measures. For example, on the number of complaints residential aged care homes receive, the amount and type of accredita accreditation failures they receive, and the processes to deal with these issues that may arise. We also need the staffing levels and the skills mix of an aged care provider to be publicly available information. Information is power and will lead to better care. This information needs to be easily accessible and in a format that is easy to understand and interpret. Often, when it comes to the decisions to put a loved one into residential care, it's usually at a time of high emotions and great stress. So they need to be able to make an informed decision about what aged care home will best suit their loved one. By making this information readily available, it will ensure that there are informed decisions that are made in the best interests of that individual and their families. Because, as I said, it's such an emotional and highly uh, charged situation because most uh, people going into residential care uh, now go in with high dependency needs. So they need, their families need to know that their loved ones are going to have the support and care and the staff around them to ensure that they have the best quality care available. Disappointingly, conservative Liberal governments have failed to improve transparency, even though it knows that older Australians, their loved ones and carers, struggle to navigate their way through the complexity of assessing services. They are unable to gain enough information about aged care service providers that will be engaging with uh, their needs and to ensure they have certainty that their loved ones will be treated with decency, great care and respect. There have been many reports and inquiries into the system, all returning with similar themes and issues. The Morrison government have now sat on their Royal Commission interim report into aged care for over a year and have not enacted any reform. It's time to stand up and say enough is enough. Issues around neglect, malnutrition, lack of staff training, over-medication, abuse, sexual and physical abuse have been well documented and issues for years and years. Enough is enough. And to sit on the interim report and to say, well, we have to wait, we can't preempt the final uh, Royal Commission report is nonsense, absolute nonsense. We have had three failed aged care ministers. We have had countless reports that myself and Senator Seward, who's in this chamber, have sat around and taken evidence day after day, year in, year out. And we all know, we all know what the issues are around aged care. We know about the neglect. The rep interim report was titled Neglect. Now, if that doesn't give a hint to this government that there's crisis in aged care, after all, they did call the Royal Commission into their own failings, I don't know what will. We also know that once you have a diagnosis of dementia in this country, you, to a great extent, become invisible. The carers of people living with dementia become invisible. If it wasn't for uh, Dementia Australia and the fantastic work that they do, those people would be forgotten completely by this government. Now, we have saw with the pandemic the huge impact it had on aged care, particularly in residential care. And it was so evident that those people living with dementia in residential care became invisible. Those living with dementia at home, their carers became invisible. I say enough is enough. 
We all know the issues. We all know what's been happening over the last seven years in aged care. We know uh, that those on this side of the chamber have been calling for years now to have some reform and to look at the real issues, the broken system around how we fund aged care and the lack of transparency. Now, we know that the aged care system under this Liberal government is broken. There has been failed minister for aged care after failed minister, and the current one is certainly not up to the job. They have older Australians waiting for high-level home care packages for almost three years to get the care that they have been approved for. Aged care staff have been stretched to their physical and emotional ends, trying to provide the care that these residents deserve. We have people tragically dying of neglect, but we have no action from the Morrison government. There have been more than 30,000 older Australians who have died over the last three years waiting for their approved home care package. It's a disgrace. More than 32,000 older Australians over two years entered residential aged care prematurely because they couldn't get the care that they needed, the home care packages they had been approved for. Waiting times for aged care grew by almost 300 per cent under the Liberals, with older Australians across the country forced into lengthy uh, queues waiting for care. Finally, 23,000 home care packages were announced in the budget. But it's a different story in terms of how many have actually been delivered thus far. That is a big, fat zero. Zero. Once again, there for the photo opportunity, but not there for the follow-up, Mr Morrison. With only 2,000 of these packages are level four the highest level of care. Compare that to the number of people currently waiting for their approved Level 4 package of 15,873 older, vulnerable Australians. Inaction on hundreds of recommendations for more than a dozen reviews, reports and inquiries. Complaints about aged care doubled to almost 8,000 in just one year, but the Prime Minister has failed to properly resource the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission for handling these complaints. The Morrison government has failed to fully implement even one aged care recommendation from a landmark report to stop elder abuse in aged care released way for it in 2017. More than 110,000 calls for help went unanswered by My Aged Care call centre over the last three years. The Morrison government delivered just 38 emergency food packages to older Australians isolating because of COVID-19 after Wafford announcing they would deliver 36,000 with funding of $9.3 million. Once again, there for the photo opportunity but no delivery. The list of over-promising and under-delivering goes on and on, and we know that the Morrison government did not have a plan for COVID-19 in black and white. This was stated in the Royal Commission's special report into COVID-19. We know the Morrison government was not prepared for COVID-19 in aged care. Despite the early warnings, it didn't do enough early enough. It's clear that the Morrison government has no idea how to fix the aged care sector, and we know that what is happening and what we're seeing repeatedly saying over and over again, year in, year out, since this government came to power, they have done nothing. Well, the buck stops with you, Mr Morrison. It's time to take some action. Now, we have already laid out the eight-point plan that Mr Albanese has laid out as a starting point for this government. We, we say take up the challenge, take our ideas and start putting Australians first. But be assured Labor will continue to hold the Morrison government to account both in the parliament and publicly on the issues of thousands and thousands of Australians are waiting for home care packages. Australians generally are very concerned about the aged care sector because, frankly, the majority of Australians will end up either using uh, residential care at some stage in their life 
or having to rely and wait on the home care packages. Older Australians deserve so much more. This Prime Minister at the last election promised to prioritise aged care and older Australians, and he's, he has failed that. We do need transparency in aged care. We do need financial transparency, but we know this is a Liberal government that could not be any less transparent in all their dealings across government. The Morrison government is failing older Australians. They are very transparent because they are not doing what they gave a commitment to do at the last election. That was to prioritise the care and support for older Australians. They have failed those people working in this sector who give their heart and soul without the resources that they need. What we need is a minister in government that has some power has some commitment, has some interest in aged care, then we might see a change of heart by this government if we have someone in the Cabinet room fighting day in, day out for older Australians, because that's exactly what older Australians need. They need a champion. We will do our job on this side of the chamber. It's about time Scott Morrison and his team did theirs. Thank you, Senator Polly. Polly, Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to make a contribution to the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Financial Transparency Bill of 2020. This bill addresses significant shortcomings in our current aged care system by requiring aged care providers to publicly report on financial information, including spending on food, medical products, accommodation, salaries, wages, administration and staff training. And you wouldn't think this was too much to ask, given that we pay about $21 billion a year for a provision of aged care. It should be common sense that this is the sort of transparency that is expected for that expenditure of resources on some of the most vulnerable members of our community. By requiring providers to report on such information, we would have a much better understanding of how well facilities are resourced and what they're doing with that funding. Is it going where it should be going? We would get a better understanding of any possible gaps in care, quality and safety. For example, just what are residential aged care facilities spending on clinical care? We know from the recent pandemic that that has significantly let down residents, their families across the country, but in particular in certain states like Victoria, where it has been there for all to see what the deficiency in aged care has meant for residents. If they were practising better infection control right from the start, we wouldn't be in the situation that we found ourselves in in uh, aged care in Victoria. In 2019-20, the Commonwealth spent, as I said, around $21 billion on all types of aged care. Yet there are no requirements for providers to disclose how much money is actually spent on care. Our aged care system fundamentally lacks transparency in communication, reporting and accountability. One of the major systemic failings of the aged care system is the lack of transparency and accountability about how providers disclose the way they use government funding to deliver services. This is a regulatory failure that I'm sure has contributed to providers getting away with providing inadequate care to older Australians. And it galls me to have to sit here and listen to the excuses from government about how, why we don't need this and how good our aged care system is when we've got a royal commission into it, for crying out loud. A royal commission because of inadequate care in this country. Account after account after account of the failure of the system. Ants in wounds for crying out loud. We haven't gone far from the kerosene baths episode. We are still have not banned physical and chemical restraints. They still don't have to be adequately, they still don't have to be get permission when they use those restraints. I'm still getting complaints from constituents saying they've found that their loved ones have been physically and chemically restrained. 
We have to ask how can older, older people and their families make informed decisions about aged care services if they can't understand how much a facility spends on, ish on items such as food and staffing costs and other critical care elements. I think we would all agree that residents and their families have a right to know what the facility spends on basic care needs such as foods, medicines, medical products, continence aids, management wages, staff wages, staff numbers and categories. And we have had a debate for so long in this country about minimum staffing levels. We still haven't got there. We still haven't got there. We still don't require a nurse to be on 24-7 for crying out loud. Nor are our staff in residential aged care facilities getting paid enough. Hence them having to work across multiple facilities. And of course we've realised what that means, haven't we? Council assisting the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety recommended the need for more stringent financial reporting requirements. They recommended that from the 1st of July 2000 and, uh, 2023 that the Australian Aged Care Commission should be empowered under statute to require approved providers to submit regular financial reportings. The frequency and form of the report should be prescribed by the Commission. I think that needs to be well before 2023. This bill also raises bigger questions about the role of for-profit aged care providers. The devastation that ripped through aged care facilities in Victoria put for-profit facilities in the spotlight. We saw some terrible examples of for-profit providers failing to meet basic standards of infection control procedures and clinical care and having to be rescued by the government. No one should be making such huge profits from the provision of essential services to Australians. But in the meantime, this bill would introduce a new level of transparency and accountability when it comes to reporting how aged care funding is spent by providers. And also to hear the excuse that, well, we've got a Royal Commission coming, we shouldn't be doing stuff that preempts the Royal Commission. This place is going to debate two bills on aged care in the next two weeks. So we can make changes before the Royal Commission reports. In fact, we need to be making changes. The government acknowledges that themselves with the, issue, the um, bill coming around uh, the different uh, funding or the way we're going to go to a reimbursed approach in, instead of upfront funding for home care. And also we're piloting and um, doing the uh, comparison process for the funding instrument. Now, both of those bills will go through here because they're sensible bills as is requiring a greater level of transparency from our aged care sector. They have got away for far too long of not doing the right thing. And I do agree with Senator Henderson. There are some very good providers in this country, but there are some very bad providers in this country as well, which has been well on display over this year. We need reform. We need it urgency, urgently. We've already seen the interim, the two reports, interim reports um, from the Royal Commission. We've seen the council assisting's comments for the Royal Commission. That report, those very substantive piece of work, is due in February next year. But we've known for a long time that we need to have transparency. We know. We need a better understanding of how money is spent, and we need to be better paying the staff in aged care. And we've known that for a very, very, very long time. It's time for some better transparency. We support this bill. Thank you, Senator Seawood. Senator McLaughlin. Deputy Acting President, uh, I rise to speak to the Aged Care Amendment Fiscal Transparency Bill uh, 2020. Uh, this private member's bill uh, does not find favour with the government. The uh, honourable senator that brought the bill to this place uh, in his explanatory memorandum uh, sets out that the bill seeks factual information from providers 
so we will have a clearer picture on how their facilities are resourced. This will be crucial if we are to engage in sustainable reforms to the sector that will improve the experience and treatment of vulnerable elderly people living in residential aged care. These are noble sentiments and ones which uh, cannot be resisted. However, it is the view of the government that it's, the path it's taken uh, will be more effective in uh, assisting with the regulation of this very important sector. I was minded when uh, listening to uh, this debate of a, one of my more favourite poems on growing old. And the opening stanza goes like this. What is it to grow old? Is it to lose the glory of the form, the lustre of the eye? Is it the beauty to forgo her wreath? Yes, but not this alone. The aged care sector is critically important, and the government has an excellent record and, in more recent times, has a minister that has pursued uh, reform of the industry and, indeed, assisted in its navigation through the more difficult parts of this year with the impacts of the virus. And I take this opportunity to congratulate him. And he has answered a barrage of questions in this place with a great deal of verve. The, we discuss in this place and we debate much about our youth. It was also my experience in the state parliament. And it is heartening that we are having now a similar debate with a great deal of enthusiasm on how we handle and care for our elderly. The archaeologists have found up to 500,000 years ago uh, remains of those who who were considered old in communities and there is clear evidence they were cared for. So how do we find ourselves in these pl this place with regulated care and government funding? Well, in Greek and Roman times, it was the requirement of the family or the elders to look after their, those who were aged in their community. In the early 1800s, uh, institutions were created and they were not happy places. Later in the 1800s, friendly societies and benevolent institutions moved into the space and provided care, and now we find ourselves with a great deal of government interest, and rightly so, given that we fund, have a large degree of funding has been pointed out by members on all sides of this chamber. I've often thought that the care of the elderly is certainly a mirror to our society. A wise of my, mine than my own said, morality consists in a large part in learning to deal with the unwanted and unexpected interruptions to our plans. And this is when caring for the elderly can often be the case. And I would like more debate on the role of the family and community in caring for our elderly. There seems to be an increasing practice in our society to pack our elderly away into institutions and not incorporate them in a caring way, rather simply visiting them as they've been packed away. And perhaps that's where the debate should ultimately be going as us, and reflection on our societal norms, which in many ways are unpleasing. But this is not to distract from the requirements and expectations we have on those that seek in an institutional way to care for those and who are in their daily care and must be rightly regulated. And there are providers which have led to significant disappointment in our community about their actions, and they should rightly be condemned. The government is responding to the findings of the Age Royal Commission. It is a wait, but the industry does need to be consulted, and we do need to understand and the ultimate impacts of any regulatory regulation that comes through this place. The department is, as I understand it, and has a, currently working on requirements in relation to what is disclosed to the aged care, uh, is scared to a regulation, to our regulator, and particularly through the aged care financial report, the ACFR. 
Providers are already required to report the sources of funds they receive and then explain how these funds are expended against the categories of care, accommodation and hotel expenses, administration and finances. All residential aged care providers give an aged care prudential compliance statement to the Secretary of the Department. All non-government residential aged care providers must give an independently audited general purpose financial report. So there is a flow of financial information. I appreciate that the member moving this bill feels that there should be more. But simply requiring more data does not necessarily alleviate the problem. The current, as I said, the, current, the department is currently working on expanded requirements of the ACFR and expects revised reporting requirements to be in place on 1 July 2021. And there is a drive through this initiative to introduce more transparency around operational results of the facilities that the provider operates. But just because you have more data doesn't mean you can compare like with like in any industry. The expansion will cover some of the additional reporting requirements proposed in this bill, as well as new information related to parent, parent entity finances. And as I indicated, consultation is underway. All changes are being considered in the terms of the Royal Commission and Prudential Standards Review to ensure that they are integrated with other reforms and potential for increased administrative burden is appropriately considered and balanced. It's very easy for us in this place to pl place greater regulation, but that does not come, does not produce the effect that we all desire. The expanded ACFR will FR will also play a key role in the residential aged care funding model the government is currently exploring. In essence, we have a model that is going to be revisited and renewed. Whilst the government provides the costs, a key decision provides underwriting of the costs. The key decision for government after implementing a new funding model will be setting the price. So in essence, we have a government intervention in a market which is, in this case, appropriate. But with an intervention of this, of this manner, is that the, the right data has to be provided, not only the right data, but also has to be in an, with an ability to make proper analytical, take a proper ability to analyse. When the new model is uh, implemented. It will support annual costing studies and pricing work and cost data so that the government will be in a place to see about the viability of the industry and where its funds are going and therefore make the appropriate policy responses and adjustments. Having, having said that, it will still be critical that facilities are audited for the level of care that they provide and that those providers which uh, take a less than charitable approach to those in their care will be moved out of the marketplace and their operations uh, terminated. So you can, it's easy to say, let's bring on more transparency. The government is taking this approach, but the transparency has to be effective. Having reams of data which does not assist in the decision-making of families seeking uh, levels of care when their circumstances re uh, require the family to move a family member, which often a very emotional time, into a place of care is not facilitated necessarily by this bill. So I return to the fact that uh, whilst I uh, find great nobility in the sentiments of the mover of this bill, uh, the government's position uh, is that it has, uh, takes into account those matters in its road to reform. I point out in response to some of the contributions from the other side of the chamber, uh, that the government did, and to its great credit, call the Royal Commission, and it is in responding to its findings. And again, reiterate my confidence in the minister. Uh, I'll conclude with probably a, a stanza of one of my, one of my more favourite poems from Dylan Thomas in relation to his father. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against 
the dying of the light. Uh, Senator Keneally, uh, Senator Roberts, uh, can I just get, uh, go to Senator Roberts? He's got a clarification because my understanding is that there was an arrangement that the debate would cease at in relation to the aged care legislation at 11.10, and then we would be moving to the Banking Amendment Deposits Bill. Senator Keneally, perhaps if you would start speaking, uh, and then you may be in continuation after five minutes. That wasn't the. Yeah, Senator Keneally, perhaps if you would like to speak for five minutes and then we will proceed. Right. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam You're Deputy welcome. Acting President. I rise to speak in support of the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Financial Transparency Bill 2020 put forward by Senator Griff. Labor supports transparency in aged care funding and service provision. We did so when we voted for Senator Griff's amendments to the Aged Care Legislation Amendment New Commissioner Functions Bill 2019 to achieve these goals, and we do so in supporting this bill. Senator Griff's amendments last year were defeated by the government, teaming up with One Nation to vote against transparency in aged care funding and in how aged care providers spend or pocket the money they get from the government and from their residents and from the residents' families. It's hard to understand how anyone, including One Nation, can oppose Australians having more information about how the more than $20 billion a year of taxpayers' money going into the aged care system to support our older Australians to stay home and in residential care is spent. When Senator Griff put forward his amendments to achieve just that in December last year, it was already clear that there were serious problems in aged care. We already had the interim report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care. It was titled simply Neglect. One word, condemning the Morrison government for its administration of the aged care system in Australia. One word to indict the Prime Minister for his failure to keep safe our parents and our grandparents. One word that should be shameful to this government, and that is neglect. Neglect is the word the Royal Commission used to describe this government's care for older Australians. It detailed the shocking failures in individual aged care homes. It outlined the structural weaknesses in our system. To quote the Commission itself, the aged care system fails to meet the needs of its older vulnerable citizens. It does not deliver uniformity, uniformly safe and quality care. It is unkind and uncaring towards older people and, in too many instances, neglects them. I don't know how a member of the government can sit there and listen to those words from a royal commission and not hang their heads in shame for the way they are treating older, vulnerable Australians. The Commission says there was, quote, serious, substandard care and unsafe practice, an underpaid, undervalued and insufficiently trained workforce. That was before COVID-19. It has been frequently said that the COVID-19 pandemic hasn't created weakness in our society. It's exploited the ones that are already there. And that was certainly true in the aged care sector. Even before COVID-19 hit, the Morrison government was responsible for an aged care system in crisis. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and his Minister for Aged Care, Richard Colbeck, did very little to deal with the already broken aged care system, to deal with COVID-19. We saw coronavirus tear through aged care homes. We saw it tear through aged care homes in New South Wales and then months later in Victoria. The Dorothy Henderson Lodge report was handed to the Morrison government in April. Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, and his Minister for Aged Care, Richard Colbeck, did nothing. They knew aged care facilities would struggle to find staff during a coronavirus outbreak, and they did nothing. They knew about the potential for a disastrous withdrawal of staff at an aged care home because of coronavirus, but they did not do enough to prepare for this. 685 Australians in aged residential care died. 
died. We know that the Morrison government did not have a plan for COVID-19 and aged care. It is right there in black and white in the Royal Commission's special report into COVID-19. Now, despite the early warnings that the government didn't do enough or act early enough, didn't make sure that all aged care workers had easy access to, to protective personal equipment, didn't make sure aged care workers had proper quality infection control training, didn't prepare a, prepare a surge workforce strategy, had no idea how many aged care workers were working across multiple sites, let alone formulate a policy about it and implement a strategy to make sure that that risk was mitigated and managed. We know that aged care homes were underprepared when it came to PPE and PPE training, not from this government being transparent and accountable, no, because they refused to be. Not from aged care providers making their spending and investments transparent, because they don't. We know because of staff who blew the whistle and because of families and residents who spoke out. They deserve better. They deserve transparency. I applaud the staff who spoke out. I admire the family members who, in their grief and their distress, spoke out. But it should not take them. In a democratic, accountable society such as ours, an open and transparent one, we should have this type of transparency when it comes to funding in aged care. How much do aged care homes invest in their staff? How much do they spend on making sure all their staff have PPE? We simply do not know. We would know if the government and One Nation hadn't gotten together last year to block Senator Griff's amendments. We'd know how much aged care providers spend on things like food. Food! Food! I am telling you, in this World Commission report, it talks about our parents and our grandparents starving in their beds. Neglect. Disgraceful. We don't know how much they spend on food. We don't know how much they spend on medication. We don't know how much they spend on staff wages and how much they spend on staff training. And how much do they pocket as profit? Older Australians need, no, they deserve to know the answers to these questions so they can make informed decisions about the services they want or the services that they need. Labor supports greater financial transparency. We also believe Australians should have better access to a broad range of information, including the number of complaints in a, re a residential aged care facility receives, any accreditation failures, the types of accreditation failures, staffing, the ratio of staffing to residents at various levels of training, measures that, provide serv that service providers put in place to deal with accreditation issues. Some of this information is currently provided on the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission website, but it needs to be in a more readable and accessible format and on the My Aged Care website. Australians shouldn't have to search for information they need to make informed decisions about their care or the care of their relatives. Now, this is especially true as the world battles a deadly pandemic. But instead, the government has withheld and hidden information about COVID-19 in aged care facilities this very government is responsible for. It's just not good enough that, facilities relating to, that failures relating to outbreak preparedness have not been made public. Families, loved ones, they deserve transparency. Residents deserve transparency. Staff deserve transparency. They deserve to know if a nursing home or a home care provider is safe. They need to know so they can make those informed decisions. Now, Labor supports this bill because we support better access to more information for older Australians and their families and loved ones. Better access, more information can only be to the, their benefit and to the benefit of the public. So all Australians can have confidence that taxpayers' money is going to improve care. Now, the government's failure to improve transparency is one more in a long list of aged care failures by the Morrison government. And perhaps we shouldn't be surprised because this is a government led by a prime minister who, when he was treasurer, cut $1.7 billion from the aged care budget. Across this chamber, we see a minister for aged care who has shown he is not up to the job. He has lost the confidence of the Australian people and the parliament after being censured. One would think, after letting 685 Australians die on his watch, that the Prime Minister would have also lost confidence in the aged care minister. But what we've learned from this parliamentary term 
is that there is no end to the incompetence you can show as a minister in the Morrison government and still keep your job. Ministerial accountability does not exist under the Morrison government, not for the Leppington Triangle, not for the robo-debt, which saw people take their own lives, not for using forged documents to attack a Lord Mayor, and not for incompetence and indifference for protecting Australians in residential aged care from COVID-19. And let's not forget that for over two years, more than 32,000 older Australians entered residential aged care prematurely because they could not get the home care that they needed. Over the past two years, more than 100,000 older Australians have consistently waited on the Morrison government's never-ending wait list for their approved home care package. This is our parents. This is our grandparents neglected in their own homes, forced to enter an aged residential aged care system, which is demonstrably broken. Neglect. One word of shame that should hang around this government when it comes to aged care. Older Australians waiting for high-level aged care packages are waiting for almost three years, three years, to get the care that they need that they have been approved to receive. More than 30,000 older Australians died over three years waiting for their home care package. 30,000 people died waiting for their home care package. Another sign of neglect from this Morrison government. Waiting times for aged care grew by almost 300 per cent under the Liberals, with older Australians across the country forced into lengthy queues just to get care. Now, the government announced 23,000 home care packages in the budget, better than nothing but a lot less than what is needed. And only 2,000 of, 2, of these packages are for level four, the highest level of care. Right now, there are more than 15,000 people waiting for their approved level four package. 15,873 people waiting for a level four aged care package. And what does this government do? Tosses 2,000 out there like it's the Hunger Games and says, there you go. Just be happy we're doing something. Well, this government has done nothing on the hundreds of recommendations from more than a dozen reviews, reports and inquiries. The Morrison government has failed to implement, fully implement, even one aged care recommendation from a landmark report to stop elder abuse in aged care released back in 2017. More than 110,000 calls for help went unanswered on the My Aged Care Call Centre over the last three years. The Morrison government delivered just 38 emergency food packages to older Australians isolating during the COVID-19 lockdowns. After it announced it would deliver 36,000, that's a big difference between 36,000 and 38, just 38. I could probably read every name out loud of one who got them in the time I have remaining. It's the same old pattern we see over and over from this government. Big announcement, little or no delivery. All photo up, no follow up. In August this year, the leader of the Australian Labor Party set out the eight steps the Morrison government could take right now to address the issues in aged care. They included minimum staffing levels in residential aged care, reduce the home care package waiting list so more people can stay in their homes for longer, ensure transparency and accountability of funding to support high quality care, implement uh, measurement and public reporting as recommended by the Royal Commission this week, ensure every residential aged care facility has adequate PPE, better training for staff, including on infection control, a better surge workforce strategy, and provide additional resources so the Aged Care Royal Commission can inquire specifically into COVID-19 across the sector while not impacting or delaying handing down the final report. Now, we know that Australians are angry, they are upset, and they want aged care fixed. How can we so neglect the older generation of this country? The ones that fought in world wars, the ones who stand up for their communities, the ones who've raised children, built businesses, the ones who in their final years of life, when they are sick, when they are vulnerable, they should not be left in their beds hungry, as the Aged Care uh, Royal Commission report neglect points out, with maggots and ants crawling through their wounds. This is 
the shame, the great shame of the, should be the great shame, should be the great shame of the Morrison government and should be the great shame for Australia that we have allowed this to happen. Well, we know that the people of Australia don't trust the current Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck, to fix these problems. We know that this Senate, we know that this Senate does not trust because we have censured that minister already. So be assured that the La Labor will continue to hold the Morrison government to account, both in Parliament and publicly, on the issues that thousands of Australians, hundreds of thousands of Australians, are concerned about. We will continue to support transparency and accountability in aged care funding and service provision. And we will support this bill. Older Australians, our parents, our grandparents, their families, their carers and the staff who work in residential aged care, they deserve so much better than Scott Morrison's neglect. Thank you. Senator Roberts. I move, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the debate be adjourned. Thank you. All those in favour? Against? Can I just uh, thank you, Senator Roberts, for your understanding and indulgence in what appeared to be a little bit of misunderstanding in relation to timing? Uh, but. Uh, I would remind the chamber that apparently the agreement was that it was 10 past 10 that the debate on the aged care was to be completed. Uh, so um, uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Clark. General business order of the day 51, banking amendment deposits bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I proudly ask for the Senate's support for the Banking Amendments Deposit Bill 2020. It's commonly called the No Bail-In Bill or the Anti-Bail-In Bill. Our purpose is to keep people's money safe and to keep the banking system safe. So let me first explain what is a bail-out and then a bail-in. Bail-outs have been used during financial crises when banks get into trouble and are a lifeline of money from taxpayers to banks to keep banks afloat. Governments act as a conduit from taxpayers to corporate banks, even when the banks got into trouble due to their own greed, recklessness or stupidity. In times of profit, it seems that banks are capitalists, and in crises, banks are socialists. International Monetary Fund and G20 rules now, though, prevent taxpayers' money being used to save a bank. Instead, requiring that rescue funds must come from shareholders and from depositors, a bail-in. And here's how it works. Literally, banks steal the money in retail deposit accounts and use that to save themselves. In exchange, depositors get shares in the bank. The shares are then suspended from trading because the bank's shares are worthless pieces of paper and will remain so for many years. Now, retail deposit accounts are the bank accounts of everyday Australians and small and medium-sized businesses. This is money taken from these accounts, which people need to pay bills, buy stock, pay the rent and pay staff. Gone. This is money a couple is saving to buy their first home. Gone. This is money retirees cashed out of superannuation and is needed to live on to buy food and clothing and pay bills. Gone. Gone overnight. And Reserve Bank figures show now that $1 trillion is available to be taken in a bail-in. That's what the Liberal, Nationals and Labor parties defend when opposing my bill. They defend stealing depositors' money. So next I'll share a letter from a constituent, Peter Thompson, last week. Quote, As a self-funded retiree, I shouldn't be lying awake at night worrying how to safeguard my deposits from bail-in by predatory and profligate banks. However, I am. I have Greek friends who lost most of their saving in the Greek bank bail-in. I don't trust APRA nor the Treasury to protect my interests and certainly don't trust any bank. We need a people's bank now. What can I do to protect my bank deposits? Withdraw cash, which by design is getting harder and harder to do, and take the risk of it, being, it will be stolen by more obvious thieves? One can't buy property or land with the Australian real estate market in radical downturn. I want my deposits in a bank. Your banking amendment deposits bill is a vote winner. It will give Australians, many of whom have no idea of what bail-in entails, an opportunity to understand and take action to prevent their savings and create confidence in the system." End of quote from Mr Thompson. 
And thank you very much, Peter. Creating confidence in the banking system is exactly why I have proposed this bill. And by the way, the public understands that the government's cash ban bill is designed to force everyday Australians to keep all their money in the banking system to make a bail-in much more effective. So Labor, Liberals and Nationals passed the cash ban bill through the House of Reps and are now terrified of the public and backbench backlash if it enters our Senate. The next point is that the public understands our real estate prices are the third highest in the world. The public understands that the government's COVID restrictions are destroying small and medium business and the ability of those business owners and their staff to service their mortgage, loans and credit card debt. In fact, there is a slate of hand going on here. A handful of large retail businesses, telcos and internet-based companies are doing better than ever, while hundreds of thousands of small and medium businesses are doing much, much worse. The effect on the economy of the go government's COVID restrictions is much worse than the headline figures. And yet state governments recently doubled down with more lockdowns, more restrictions, more destruction of wealth and more unemployment amongst small and medium businesses. So the public are responding by removing cash from the banking system at an alarming rate. Twenty billion dollars in notes have gone missing in calendar 2020. Cash is being stashed under beds, taken out of banks, out of the system and stashed under beds. Now my bill is an opportunity to restore confidence in the banking sector. It's an opportunity to attract deposits from other countries where bank deposits are less secure than ours. We could be a safe haven for legal investments in our banking sector, money that isn't coming for once from the taxpayer. Why shut that down and make banks even more reliant on the government for funding? What a missed opportunity that will be for our banks and for their customers. The Liberal, National and Labor parties now have a chance, though, to stand up for everyday Australians, to protect bank deposits from being bailed in. The response from these tired old parties? Denial. We're told that this bill is not necessary. We're told that the law does not allow for a bail-in. And I ask all Australians to listen more closely. Listen for their proof. Listen. There is none. No legal opinion. Nothing but bland assurances from self-interested public servants, hoping that constant repetition will fool the public. Here's my argument. The Crisis Resolution Powers and Other Measures Act 2018 that was passed in the dead of night with just seven senators present uses weasel words to hide the reality. The wording does allow for the banking regulator, APRA, to instruct the banks to bail in retail deposit accounts. The wording does allow for the banking regulator, APRA, to instruct the banks to bail in retail deposit accounts. The protections that the tired old parties rely on for the supposed opposite case are contained not in the Crisis Resolution Powers Act, but in the Banking Act. That's what they rely on. Their argument is a nonsense because the emergency provisions powers in the Crisis Resolution Powers Act override the everyday protections in the Banking Act. Override them. That's why the government has an Emergency Powers Act, to provide extra powers in an emergency. Now, this is not just my opinion, it's the International Monetary Fund's opinion. Quote the IMF. The new catch-all catch directions powers in the 2018 Financial Sector Legislation Amendment, Crisis Resolution Powers and Other Measures Bill provide APRA with the flexibility to make directions to the banks that are not contemplated by the other kinds of general directions listed in the Banking Act. That's it. It goes on. APRA's direction powers are a key element in the resolution process for a distressed bank. APRA could order a bank to recapitalise using the funds of unsecured creditors. End of quote. The IMF goes on to define unsecured creditors as shareholders and retail depositors. Liberal MP Tim Wilson, chair of the House Standing Committee on Economics, has admitted the Crisis Resolution Powers Act does allow for bail-in. Liberal Senator Amanda Stoker, in a letter to a constituent, admitted that legislation allows for a bail-in. 
Yet their party bosses say the complete opposite. Now, why would they do that? Well, the answer is yet again because of our international obligations. The G20 and the IMF have dictated that taxpayers' money can't be used to rescue a bank. The tired old parties know that letting unelected bureaucrats in New York and Brussels and Geneva tell Australians what to do in a crisis does not pass the pub test. So the tired old parties hide the facts and contradict reality using weasel words. It's instructional to note that New Zealand's response to the same IMF and G20 instruction is to do the opposite of what our government has done. The Kiwis dutifully wrote their bail-in laws and made them honest and transparent. If a bank fails, the bank closes, pays off its debts using deposit of funds and then reopens the next day. Depositors can access what remains of their money, if there is any. Now, I'm not suggesting that the New Zealand model is better. More honest, yes. Better, no. There's a simple solution for bank failures. When a bank fails, the government could issue bonds. Currently, we're offering just 1 per cent interest on bonds, so it's not a costly option. We then use that money to buy shares in the failing bank. That injects enough capital for the bank to survive. Then vest those shares with a future fund who pay that small interest payment on the bonds. In a few years, those shares will be worth money again and the future fund can sell them back into the market in an orderly fashion. In this simple One Nation Bank Survival Plan, taxpayers' money would not be used to save the bank, so our IMF and G20 masters should be pleased. Nobody in our process loses money. Depositors keep their cash. Banks keep trading. Mum and dad shareholders retain the value of their shares over the medium term. So what is the Labor and LNP track record on corporate bailouts? Both gave foreign car companies billions and then watched them shut up shop as soon as the money tap was turned off. If we'd been asking for shares for that money, we would now own the car companies. We would still have a car manufacturing sector. We would still have all those wonderful breadwinner jobs for workers. Prime Minister Gillard gave ABC Childcare $120 million, not in exchange for shares. It was another gift from taxpayers. If we'd asked for shares in ABC Childcare in return for the bailout, those shares would be worth $250 million today, double what Julia Gillard has Prime Minister gave them. Our response to a bank failure should not be go and steal it from customers. Our response should be to use capitalism to fix crony capitalism. Now, Labor is having a lot to say about their financial claims scheme guarantee. The financial claims scheme guarantee will advance up to $20 billion per bank to protect deposits if a bank fails. So let's take a closer look at the financial claims scheme guarantee. The vast majority of the $1 trillion in retail deposit accounts is held by the big four banks. $20 billion times four, though, is only $80 billion. The financial claims scheme guarantee will save less than 10 per cent of bank deposits the financial claim scheme guarantee is not active and is not funded. There's no money sitting there ready to go. Not one cent. Should a bank fail, the Treasurer must issue a notice to activate the scheme. Yet the Labor scheme uses taxpayer money to bail out banks, so the Treasurer will not issue the notice because the notice would breach IMF orders. In the unlikely event of the financial claim scheme guarantee being activated, there's a second problem that Labor never discusses. Once the financial claim scheme guarantee is activated, is activated, APRA must liquidate the bank to get taxpayers' money back. How much does anyone think will be available to retail depositors if the bank is liquidated? And how long will taxpayers have to wait to get their money back from the liquidator? The financial claim scheme guarantee is worse than a con job. It will make things worse. Earlier. I said that once a bank fails, whether that failure is public or known only to the regulator, the Financial Claim Scheme Guarantee Scheme can be activated if the Treasurer so chooses. The whole point of a bail-in is to present, prevent a bank failing. This means the bail-in can only come first and will come first. Then if the bail-in doesn't work, the Financial Claim Scheme Guarantee triggers 10 per cent of bank deposits are saved and the bank is liquidated. This is what the Liberals, Nationals and Labor are relying on to falsely tell everyday Australians our money is safe. Yet the reality is it's not safe. Following the dictates of unelected globalist masters, yet again, is more important to them than looking out for the interests of everyday Australians. The government has advanced a criticism of my bill. 
that the definition of retail deposit account introduces a different definition that is contained elsewhere in the Banking Act. This argument fails because the only place the phrase retail deposit account appears in the Banking Act is in my amendment. We did that deliberately so as to not interfere with the rest of the Act. Criticism dismissed. But questions about the government's competence and level, level of integrity asked. In concluding, Madam Acting Deputy President, at no time has the government, the Treasurer or APRA actually said they will not order a bail-in. These government agencies duck the question and say, APRA doesn't have the power. Well, Madam Acting Deputy President, my bill clears that up. My bill adds one clause to the Banking Act that simply says APRA does not have the power to order a bail-in. No other powers are affected. None. Passing my bill ensures everyone will read it the same way. So, fellow senators, let Australians know that our money is safe in a bank. Let Australians know that there's no need to stuff cash under the bed. Even the Australian Banking Association, in its submission, said if there is any confusion about what the law actually says, then consider passing my bill. What a great idea. Let's pass this bill to keep people's money safe. Let's pass this bill to keep people's confidence in the banking system. But above all, let's pass this bill to keep money, people's money safe. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President, I too rise to speak on the Banking Amendment Deposits Bill 2020, uh, the private senator's bill introduced by the One Nation Party. And I think at the outset, I'll start with the area where we can agree, and that is that our banking system is vital to a strongly functioning economy, and confidence in our banking system is vitally important. But I think the history uh, of the last, last few decades, certainly, uh, going back well before my memory, uh, is that we do have a strong, well-functioning banking system in Australia. In fact, I would contend that the Australian banking system over a sustained period of time has been the envy of much of the world in terms of its stability uh, and in terms of it providing a service to the Australian people. And uh, I would like to personally see much more competition in our banking sector, uh, but I think that overall, over the last, certainly within my lifetime, uh, we've seen a banking system that has been very safe and very secure and has underpinned a very strongly performing Australian economy. And I think that in the economic shock brought on by the current pandemic situation, uh, a, a significant fundamental economic shock that has reverberated right around the world. I mean, we've seen many jurisdictions uh, with significant uh, recession, significant declines in GDP, some uh, in the double digits. And we've seen not just the Australian banking system, but also the, the international banking system stand up remarkably well. Now, this, this was the, the pandemic was, in a sense, a, a left field uh, event. It, it wasn't caused by an underlying structural problem. Uh, within the financial system as, for example, the 2008, uh, 2009 uh, global financial crisis uh, certainly was. Uh, and so you do have different drivers. But uh, we've seen in the face of a significant economic shock in the last 12 months a very strong, reliable uh, and uh, a, a very well-trusted banking system. Uh, Senator Roberts, Australians, through you, Chair, uh, Senator Roberts, uh, Australians do choose to keep, some Australians do choose to keep a store of value in cash. I think linking that to a fundamental distrust of our banking system is just uh, a simply a, a misunderstanding of why uh, those Australians choose to do that. Certainly, uh, certainly uh, it's a gross simplification of the reason why some Australians choose to keep a store of value in cash. Uh, the central premise of this premise of this bill is that there is an underlying ambiguity introduced into the Banking Act by the Financial Sector Legislation Amendment, Crisis Resolution Powers and Other Measures Act 
2018 that in this, in this theory, in this uh, understanding of the crisis powers bill, that uh, could allow the conversion and write-off of normal deposit accounts in the, event, in the event of a banking failure. This is what people mean when they talk about bail-in. Uh, in part, this is based on Section 11 CAA of the Crisis Resolution Act, which added a number of definitions relating to the conversion and write-off provisions. Uh, including the following. Conversions and write-off provisions mean the provisions of the prudential standards that relate to the conversion or writing off of a additional tier one and tier two capital or b any other instrument. Now this any other instruments phrase uh, it is contended by those who wish to argue uh, it, uh, that, that this creates a bail-in opportunity. Uh, it's argued that this is open-ended and allows for this idea of bail-in. Uh, however, uh, the Senate Economics Committee, uh, Legislation Committee, in looking at this bill, took extensive evidence from members of the general public who did express the views that Senator Roberts has expressed here today. Uh, but we also took evidence from um, experts, including the RBA, Treasury and APRA. And I know Senator Roberts um, you know, took some time to dismiss those views, but we do have a trusted banking system. We do have a number of independent operators within the system, uh, independent regulators. And I think we do need to consider their words very strongly when we are talking about making changes to legislation in this area. And that evidence is very clear that there is no ambiguity in this space in need of rectification. Uh, under current laws and regulations, it is not possible for APRA to require banks to bail in deposit accounts. The Reserve Bank, APRA and Treasury all agree that the Banking Act does not imply that losses could be imposed on deposit holders or give APRA any additional powers that could be used to the detriment of retail depositors. Depositors, in fact, are safeguarded under a range of protections. There is the financial claims scheme, which the Treasurer may activate the scheme in the event that there is a bank failure, in the very unlikely event there is a bank failure. Upon activation, APRA provides depositors with access to their deposits within seven days up to a $250,000 cap. This covers 99% of deposit accounts in full and around 80% of household deposits by value. We also have the depositor preference system, which applies to deposits above the financial claim scheme cap and means that in the event of, again, a very unlikely event, event of a bank failure, the claims of depositors rank above all equity holders and creditors uh, after the government has been reimbursed for any amounts paid out under the financial claims scheme. There are also, of course, numerous layers of prudential regulation and interventions APRA can make to resolve financial institutions in distress, the recapitalisation, statutory management and transfer powers. Now, I do wish to go uh, uh, into a bit more detail on this issue of any other instrument uh, as set out uh, in the, uh, the, the Crisis Resolution Powers Bill. Uh, as a matter of law, the reference to any other instrument in that bill, uh, in that Act, in paragraph B of the definition of the conversion and write-off provisions, cannot be interpreted to include bank deposits for the following reasons. It refers to provisions of prudential standards relating to the conversion or writing off. APRA's prudential standards do not require such provisions to be included in bank deposits. The prudential framework cannot be altered to include bank deposits because APRA is constrained by the objects of the Banking Act and any such attempt would be found to be invalid. Principles of statutory interpretation would require a court to view the general words to be limited to the, by the specific reference to additional tier one and tier two capital, and only instruments of a similar nature would fall within the general definition. And deposits, uh, retail deposits, are fundamentally different to additional tier one and tier two capital. Uh, I just wish to quote from, from a letter uh, from APRA again on this issue, again um, for those members of the public who are listening to this debate. 
to demonstrate um, the level of confidence that they express in their position and the position of the government on this issue. Uh, and I quote, it might be helpful to clarify a recent public misconception about the interaction between APRA's twin objectives to protect depositors, uh, to, de to protect depositors and financial system stability. Um, APRA's financial system stability objective has been characterised as an alternative to depositor protection that could be used to implement measures contrary to depositor protection, such as bail-in of deposits. This characterisation is incorrect. As the Banking Act 1959 makes clear, APRA's twin objectives are complementary. This is evident when considering depositor bail-in. A bail-in of deposits would offend both APRA's depositor protection objectives and its financial stability objective. A bail-in of deposits would not only cause depositors at the bailed-in institution to lose a portion of their deposit funds, it would reduce the confidence of depositors across the banking system, thereby reducing financial system stability. It would also starve authorised deposit-taking institutions of the stable deposit funding on which they rely to provide credit to the economy. This is why APRA has described depositor protection as a paramount objective. It lies at the heart of both our statutory objectives under the Banking Act. As such, APRA has never sought nor supports a bail-in of deposits power. So that's a very clear statement of principle uh, from the regulator, and I think uh, makes it very clear that there is no conflict within this, the Banking Act. In fact, the, the twin purposes of the bank, Banking Act are complementary. Um, APRA would never act in this way because it would cause the depositors at the bailed-in institution to lose a portion of their deposit funds. And on the other hand, it would also reduce financial system stability because it would undermine confidence in the sector and it would starve those same institutions of the deposit funding they use to provide uh, credit within the economy. Now, Australia has not legislated for the bail-in of deposit accounts because it is contrary to APRA's purpose and objectives and the objectives of the Financial Stability Board bail-in reforms have been achieved without needing to do so. Instead of legislating for deposit account bail-in, APRA requires authorised deposit-taking institutions to maintain higher levels of equity than most peer jurisdictions and hold additional loss-absorbing capacity which uses contractual conversion provisions in financial instruments that will convert into equity at a specific trigger point if an entity gets into financial difficulty. These are known as the additional Tier 1 and Tier 2 capital, which can be bailed in or converted. Uh, now, an additional matter uh, is that terms and conditions of deposit accounts cannot be changed to allow bail-in. Uh, approved deposit-taking institutions are prevented from unilaterally changing terms and conditions for customer, de customer deposits to facilitate a conversion or write-off because it would be inconsistent with unfair contract terms legislation under the ASIC Act. So we see there that for a variety of reasons, this legislation uh, is unnecessary, seeks to solve a problem that does not exist. And, and Senator Roberts, as he finished up there, well, then if, it's, um, you know, if, there's, if there's nothing to fix, then why not, change the why not pass the legislation? Well, we shouldn't in this place pass legislation to fix a problem that does not exist. So I think the very clear words uh, that I've quoted today from APRA, from the Treasury we heard, uh, in, in the uh, Senate Economics Legislation Committee uh, from uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia all indicate that this is a solution to a problem that does not need fixing and, in fact, does not exist. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this bill amends the Banking Act to ensure that bank deposits cannot be converted to shares by the holding bank, a process that has become known as a bail-in. It would further prevent Commonwealth laws from authorising bail-ins of deposit accounts. It's quite a technical bill. 
and it's unusual for technical amendments to banking legislation to become matters of public interest. Uh, and it's true that both this bill and the issue that it seeks to deal with are probably not on the radar of most ordinary Australians. But it's impossible to speak about this bill without noting the extraordinary interest in it by a section of the Australian community. Like most of my colleagues, my office has received a significant volume of calls about bail-ins from people who are highly motivated and engaged about this issue. We have sometimes heard from individuals four or five times over the course of the past few years. Regardless of the issue, it is always great to see community members engaging with the work of the parliament, whether it is signing a petition, calling an MP or making a submission to an inquiry. And I'd encourage anyone who has taken an interest in this issue to continue to engage with these and the other issues that come before this place. We benefit from an engaged and interested citizenry. But as I began by noting, it is unusual for a technical banking issue to receive this much attention. I think it is due in large part to the Morrison government's failure to reassure people about the safety of their retirement savings. The government's mishandling of its own communications to, about this and other banking-related matters has given Australians unnecessary concern about the safety of their savings. It's worth considering the history of this issue. So concerns about bail-ins came to prominence during the global financial crisis. The events in Greece deeply unsettled many people, and Australians wanted to know that their life savings would not be used to underwrite mistakes made by financial institutions. Australia's financial, Australia's financial system made it through the GFC largely unscathed, thanks in no small part to the efforts of the Rudd-Gillard government, efforts that were often not supported by those opposite. And there were no bail-ins in Australia. So why are we talking about it now, more than a decade later? The current set of concerns about bail-in seems to have come following the introduction of the Financial Sector Legislation Amendment, Crisis Resolution Power and Other Measures Bill 2017. And that legislation gave APRA the power to allow financial instruments known as hybrid securities. I think the government mishandled its own legislation and the debate about this legislation. It failed to properly engage with the concerns that many Australians had about the operation of that bill, and I think that was a mistake. People are, of course, justified in wanting to have confidence in the banking system and in the security of their deposits. The callers to my office about this issue are not wealthy people. Many are Australians with modest backgrounds who have worked hard and lived careful lives so they can enjoy some measure of economic security as they get older. They are entitled to expect that the government provide them with that confidence. And unfortunately, the government's own actions mean that many Australians do not trust them to do the right thing when it comes to the banking sector and to retirement income policy. People can be forgiven for being suspicious of the Morrison government's approach to the banking sector, given its history on the issue. The government voted against the establishment of a Banking Royal Commission, not just once, but a staggering 26 times. And this was while Mr Morrison was the Treasurer and nominally responsible for Australia's banking and financial system. There has still not been a compelling or credible explanation proffered by those opposite for their opposition to the establishment of this Royal Commission. And it is certainly not justifiable in light of what came out during the course of the Commission. People across the country told devastating stories about mistreatment by the banks, causing physical, psychological, social and economic harm. The evidence provided to the Commission was overwhelming, and Commissioner Hayne noted that members of the public submitted more than 10,000 complaints about financial services entities by using the Commission's web form. In addition, there were many thousands of telephone calls and emails to the Office of the Royal Commission. And it's understandable, then, that people may be suspicious of this government's bona fides on banking policy, given the lengths they went to in this parliament to prevent this Commission from being established. What have they done since the Royal Commission ended and handed down its report? After receiving the Banking Royal Commission's final report, the Prime Minister and Treasurer Frydenberg took six months to release an implementation timetable. One year after the report was on their desk, the government had only completed six, just six, of the 76 recommendations made by Commissioner Hayne. Labor was disappointed by the government's decision to further delay implementation of the Banking Royal Commission's recommendations. 
These are important reforms and they should have been prioritised by this government. Not only has the government dragged its feet in implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission, it has now broken a promise. Responsible lending laws are a key part of the protection for consumers in our financial system. They help ensure that people are not taken advantage of by predatory lenders and saddled with debt that they cannot possibly repay. Retaining responsible lending laws in their current form was the Royal Commission's first recommendation. The government agreed to this recommendation. And Commissioner Hain himself described them in his report as critical in ensuring good faith negotiations on loan products between banks and customers. The Morrison government has announced its intention to repeal responsible lending provisions. Now, let's be clear. There is no good evidence that repealing responsible lending provisions will help boost our economy. There is plenty of evidence that this will harm vulnerable consumers. Financial Counselling Australia are on the record as saying removing responsible lending obligations will free banks up to aggressively push credit onto their customers. And they're not alone in having that concern. Recently, more than 200 community groups and financial experts wrote to parliamentarians arguing against the repeal of responsible lending provisions. So now we have Mr Morrison opposing the Royal Commission as Treasurer delaying implementation of the recommendations as Prime Minister and now backflipping and removing key consumer protections, having been re-elected. You can understand why people might be suspicious of the Morrison government's banking policies. You can also be forgiven for being suspicious about the Morrison government's approach to retirement savings, given its history on the issue. Australia's retirement system is often described as having three pillars superannuation, the pension and independent savings. Well, what has this government done to each? The Coalition has a long track record of undermining Australia's superannuation system. The then backbencher, Mr Abbott, described compulsory superannuation as one of the biggest con jobs in Parliament back in September 1995, and the Coalition is still at war with the superannuation industry. Part of the government's response to the coronavirus-induced recession was to encourage workers to withdraw from their superannuation. This has come at a real cost to young workers. Workers aged 30 years old who withdrew $20,000 from their superannuation could be $69,000 worse off in retirement, and the consequences for younger Australians could be much, much greater. And for what? Analysis suggests that large amounts of this super were spent on discretionary spending. At the same time, the government has been suggesting that it may not proceed with the legislated increases to compulsory superannuation. So we have this government telling people to run down their super, while at the same time backing away from legislated increases to the super rate that would help restore and rebuild those balances for a secure retirement. Well, what about the second pillar? The second pillar of the retirement system, the pension. Well, in the 2014 budget, the coalition government announced changes to the pension, with the pension age to be raised to 70. There are also changes and cuts to supplements, and since then pensioners have had to fight uh, for the government to use fair deeming rates to account for the value of their other assets. So we've had this government reducing eligibility for the pension and proposing to cut the rates for those who remain on it. Given the government's assault on two of the pillars of Australia's retirement system, it's not really surprising that people might be suspicious of their intentions in relation to the third, independent savings. As I said earlier, there are countless Australians who have come from modest backgrounds and worked hard and lived careful lives so they can enjoy a measure of economic security as they get older. And they do deserve confidence that the banking and financial system will not take advantage of them. Unfortunately, the bill before us today is not the solution to these concerns. There are real and credible concerns that this bill may undermine existing banking regulations. Australian banks are supported by a strong system of prudential and other regulation that should avoid the need for any such measure outlined in this bill. APRA and Treasury have stated it is not possible under current legislation for banks to bail in deposit accounts. The legislative certainty on that question already exists. Every bank deposit in Australia is protected from bank failure by the Financial Claims Scheme, which was established by Labor in 2008. And this means that every deposit in a bank, credit union or building society 
is guaranteed up to a value of $250,000 per account holder. This scheme means that account holders are protected against bank failure, even in the worst case scenario. APRA regularly conducts stress testing of banks to ensure that they are ready for a potential crisis. Treasury has also expressed concerns that the bill introduces a definition of deposit account which is not then used consistently in potentially relevant places throughout the Banking Act. For instance, in the depositor priority provisions in section 13A.51.2.51. And this would introduce multiple definitions to capture a single concept in the Banking Act, which would risk introducing uncertainty regarding the interpretation of the Banking Act. In addition to this, the measures outlined in the bill have not been a feature of previous responses to financial crises in any major country. But the government does need to do a better job of responding to people's financial concerns. Our financial system depends on confidence. And the measure of interest in this bill shows that a portion of the Australian community do not have confidence that their savings will be protected. It's understandable that people are suspicious, given this government's track record on retirement policy and banking policy. And it's not enough to say that things are just fine. The government needs to show that it has ordinary Australians' financial futures as its core priority. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Now, uh, I rise to address this bill as well, and in doing so, I think it's always good to reflect upon what my good friend, Mr. Paul Keating, has said uh, when he has said that banking is the artery of the economy. And it is very important that we get banking and financial sector policy right, because ultimately the flow of capital and credit into Australian businesses is something which underpins our prosperity. Uh, of course, you can't have a, a fair society unless you have an economy upon which, which to build it. And over the long run of history, our con contribution to banking and financial sector policy on this side of the of chamber is absolutely assured. Uh, the Menzies government, of course, established the Reserve Bank. Uh, the, this banking act we're referring to today is an act of the Menzies government. And then, of course, in, in the years beyond the Menzies period, there were the financial sector inquiries, financial system inquiries, I should refer to them as, which led to a large degree of the modern banking and financial sector architecture in Australia. You start with the Wallace inquiry, sorry, you start with the Campbell inquiry, of course, commissioned by uh, John Howard and Malcolm Fraser. Uh, a lot of the recommendations, uh, to, be, to be fair, uh, were implemented by the Hawke government, and to their great credit, to their, to the, to their historical uh, credit. Uh, now, the entry of foreign banks and the like, I think, has ensured that there was more competition in the 80s. And then we fast forward into the 90s where there was the Wallace Inquiry. Wallace Inquiry, which was commissioned by Peter Costello and John Howard, looked at uh, the standing of the financial sector in the mid 90s and it recommended the creation of APRA and ASIC in the form of the Twin Peaks regulatory framework that you now see in Australia. Now, we had the financial crisis in 2008 09 and that effectively was a stress test for our banks and our financial sector. And I have to say, just as we have seen in this coronavirus recession, that Australia's institutions held up very well. Now, partly that is because of the Twin Peaks authority or the, the, the breakdown of responsibilities between a conduct regulator and a prudential regulator. But also it is that APRA was established as a standalone prudential regulator, a regulator which was uh, focused on risk, focused on governance. And as my colleague Senator Brockman mentioned, it, was a, it is a regulator which really has tw two key objectives. Now, one objective is to assure financial stability, and the other objective is to protect depositors and policyholders. 
And that really takes us to the core of this bill today and reminds us again of what APRA is there to do every day as the potential regulator. Now, APRA, of course, <coughs> administers the financial claim scheme. And we all recall the way that the financial claim scheme was legislated by the Rudd government. Um, it was, of course, for a time, the Rudd government's policy that there would be an unlimited bank guarantee, unlimited. And that caused enormous concern in financial markets and led to the freezing of non-bank investments virtually overnight because you had a panicked response from an inexperienced person that had provided or claimed to, to be providing the world's biggest deposit guarantee, unlimited. And then that was uh, scaled down to $1 million because, of course, the huge financial disruption that had caused to cash management trusts and cash-like investments was known. Ultimately, the financial claim scheme has been scaled to a quarter of a million dollars. Now that is a that is limited to an institution. And so the financial claim scheme is there in case there is a major dislocation and there is a failure or a partial failure of an ADI or a bank. Now there is of course a very important seal which can be used by ADIs uh, which allows them to assure Australians that their money is secure. And I don't doubt the sincerity of Senator Roberts and others that have proposed this legislation today or this bill today, uh, that there is a genuine concern in the Australian community about whether or not people's money is safe. I understand that. I, I, I understand that. And one thing that we, we can do, I think, better in the future is ensure that people are aware that we have a financial claim scheme, uh, that it is there for people to it is there to protect people's money, and the the seal which can be used by by banks probably should be more widely used. Now this is not something which is compulsory at the moment. A bank doesn't have to use a seal, uh, but of course it is it is voluntary. But I think uh, if people were able to see that their bank had the Commonwealth coat of arms with the seal on it, that they would have perhaps more confidence that their deposits are there for them uh, should there be a major dislocation and a failure. Uh, as I say, I mean, the financial crisis was a stress test of our institutions. None of our major financial institutions fa failed. Uh, and yes, there was a bank, yes, there was a retail deposit guarantee, as I say, shambolically announced by the Rudd government, but ultimately landed at $250,000. There was also a wholesale funding guarantee which provided more money, I guess, for banks that were struggling to secure credit on the wholesale funding markets. But I mean, the financial crisis tested these institutions and they, they, they stood up pretty well. And during the COVID crisis, we've seen a similar pattern repeating. So on one side, you've got depositor protection, which is part of APRA's mandate, and that comes to, comes to life through the deposit guarantee, the financial claim scheme, I should say. On the other side, you've got financial stability. And what we see is APRA deploying capital adequacy requirements. And APRA said at, in March this year, over the past decade, the Australian banking system has built up substantial capital buffers the highest quality form of capital, common equity tier one, reached $235 billion at the end of 2019. As a result, banks are typically maintaining capital levels well above minimum capital requirements. And so for the four majors, APRA have said that you've got a common equity tier ratio of more than 10.5% of risk-weighted assets. So that is, a, on global standards, quite a, quite a high level of capital. So on one side you've got the claim scheme, on the other side you've got very strong capital adequacy requirements for banks. 
Now, that, of course, I should reflect on APRA. I mean, I think APRA has been a good banking regulator. I think the fact that it's presided over multiple crises now in the financial sector without a banking calamity uh, in the form of there being a run on the banks or there being a major capital event uh, is a good thing. There was, of course, a, a Royal Commission into the banks a couple of years ago, and that, that profiled for anyone to see the the foul and disgusting behaviour, particularly in the wealth management sector, uh, where you saw repeatedly super funds putting their interests or the interests of shareholders ahead of the interests of the members. Now, a large part of the government's plan to adopt the Hain Royal Commission recommendations really does go to tidying up a lot of the cowboy behaviour that you see in our wealth management sector. I think someone's on their feet. Oh. Beg your pardon, that, Senator Gallagher. have got to do something, I think. Bragg started off with the statement that his good friend Paul Keating and has now gone on oh. to uh, mire the superannuation industry with untruths. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. They are debating points. Please misleading the seat. Senate. P please resume your seat. Please continue, Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. And so, um, yes, APRA has done a, a good job on banking stability. But I don't think APRA has done a good job in superannuation. Uh, it is disgusting the, the scale and degree of the waste of money that you see in the superannuation industry. I mean, APRA has, has proven at, at successive Senate estimates that it won't enforce the laws that this parliament gives it to enforce. So there is a law called a sole purpose test, which means that the super funds are only supposed to spend money on their members' retirement outcomes. But yet they're setting up boondoggle propaganda outfits like the New Daily. They're putting Greg Conway's head on TV, spending millions and millions of dollars advertising during football grand finals and the like. And all of this is vanity, vanity and power. And they, their job is to actually be there for their members. Their job is not there to run an agenda for the Labor Party or the trade unions or the banks or any other interest. The job of the super trustees is to work for the workers, the workers of Australia that put their money into these funds and that have been, been treated very poorly for 30 years. So, yes, APRA has done a good job on banking, but APRA has done a terrible job when it comes to enforcing the superannuation laws. And it's very important that this place, this chamber, when it considers the budget reforms our government is pursuing, uh, that we do give APRA more power because the fiduciary duty they already have to protect members' savings they're not using. So we are now going to give them a best financial interest test so that the, the super fund members know that their money is not going to be wasted on stupid things like newspapers, which are used to attack political opponents or opponents of the super industry, or endless vain advertising, as we've seen with Greg Conway putting his own face on TVs, not to advertise a product, but to advertise politics and a brand. I mean, who can think of any other lobby group that has spent $40 million advertising a lobby group as we've seen in the past few months? It really is disgusting and it shows that the, the largesse of the super industry can, uh, comes about because it is compulsory, because for 30 years they've opened the door and the money has just fallen in and it's not good enough. So I look forward to APRA becoming a much better protector of members' savings once this parliament gives it better powers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Uh, Senator Hanson. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the question be put. Thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that uh, the Banking Amendment Deposits Bill of 2020 is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Hanson as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order, there being 12 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. As it's now just past 12.20, the Senate will proceed to the consideration of government business, and I call the clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, appropriation bill number one, 2020-2021, and two related bills. Order, I'll just give senators who aren't uh, participating in this matter to leave the chamber quietly before I um, call Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher. Oh, thank you, Madam thank Deputy you. President. I rise to make a contribution on the 2020-21 appropriation bills being considered by the Senate today. Put simply, the budget contained in these bills is emblematic of the coalition government's abject failure of both economic vision and its fiscal management over its entire time in office. Years of liberal economic mismanagement and inaction on reform meant that Australian households, our economy and the federal budget confronted the very serious challenges and uncertainties of the fire season and the COVID-19 pandemic from a position of weakness, not strength. The facts here cannot be disputed. Even before the virus and the worst of the fires hit, under the Liberals' watch, the Australian, government, the Australian families were struggling and the broader economy was floundering. The national accounts, prior to the unprecedented events of 2020, exposed the full extent of the Liberals' failure. Quarterly growth had slowed to 0.5 per cent in the December quarter, down from 0.6 per cent in the previous quarter. Annual growth was well below trend at 2.2 per cent and was already a full percentage point below what it was before Morrison, Mr Morrison and Mr Frydenberg took over. The private economy did not grow at all in the quarter and had stalled for the entirety of the preceding year. 
Growth in annual consumption had declined to its slowest pace since the global financial crisis. Total private business investment was in reverse, having now declined for three consecutive quarters and was down 1.4 per cent over the year. As a percentage of nominal GDP, it is around the lowest level since the early 1990s recession. And wages growth had been stagnant for some time. Quarterly growth in average compensation per employee had slowed even further in the December 19 quarter, despite Australians already experiencing the slowest wage growth ever recorded. The nation's finances had not fared any better under three Liberal Prime Ministers and three Treasurers. It cannot go unremarked that upon that Mr Morrison, in the other place, was the Treasurer for three of these years and, for, and Prime Minister in the lead-up to the pandemic arriving on our shores. For the last seven years, the coalition government had promised to deliver uh, surplus budgets and to pay down debt. In reality, this government has broken its promises to the Australian people every single year. Instead, they doubled debt and delivered six budget deficits even before the pandemic hit. This is in the context in which the Morrison government's 2020-21 budget must be considered. So, Turning now to the budget presented in these appropriation bills, the government has delivered a budget that, despite containing record levels of spending and which charts a course to more than a trillion dollars of debt, it fails in its most pressing duty. It fails to create jobs for Australians and fails to build for their future. It does contain a lot of headline-grabbing names, as we have become used to during this pandemic, like job maker and job trainer, but the problem is that not many jobs are being created. In fact, the latest labour force figures out of the ABS told quite the opposite story, the story that Mr Morrison and Mr Frydenberg didn't want you to hear. The story was that 25,000 more people actually lost their jobs in October, taking the unemployment rate to 7%. Put simply, this is a budget that focuses on, on announcements for the Prime Minister, but in reality leaves way too many Australians behind. As I just noted, not only will this budget deliver in excess of $1 trillion of public debt and $98 billion but in spending, but it keeps the amount of people without jobs too high for too long. It contains record levels of expenditure, but leaves so many Australians behind without the support they need to make ends meet without certainty and without any hope. Perversely, it prioritises the funnelling of billions of dollars of taxpayers' money into funds specially set up for the coalition government to rot and pork barrel at the expense of hard-working Australians. And it ignores uh, the enormous social and economic opportunities of addressing key policy areas such as childcare, aged care, in desperate need of reform and, of course, social housing, a great way to drive jobs and provide a lasting social benefit for so many Australians who are doing it tough. This, this year's budget demonstrates a staggering lack of ambition on behalf of the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. If we look at the numbers contained in these bills and against the backdrop of the memorable lines from this lot lecturing year after year of debt and deficit disaster and a budget emergency and who promised a surplus every year and to pay down debt and get debt under control. What this budget shows is that we'll have a deficit of $213.7 billion this year, the largest dollar value deficit ever, almost half a trillion dollars worth of cumulative deficits over the forward estimates, deficits for as far as the eye can see, with the deficit never getting below $50 billion in any year over the median term, that is, up to 2030-31. We see debt rising to a trillion dollars, net debt this year at $703.2 billion, growing to $966.2 billion by the end of the forward estimates, after this government inherited net debt in the order of about $180 billion when they came to office. Gross debt this year will uh, reach $872 billion, growing to $1.1 trillion by the end of the forward estimates and peaking at $1.7 trillion over the median term. There was also $98 billion in new spending in this budget, all of it structurally built into the budget, not offset, but contributing to spending as a proportion of the size of the economy being higher in every year of the forward estimates, in the highest in nearly 40 years. 
The staggering figures in this bill don't stop on the fiscal side of things. The economic numbers are deeply concerning, reading too. Record low wages growth set to continue, stagnating below 2 per cent till at least 2023-24. High and worsening unemployment heading into Christmas this year, peaking at 8 per cent in December 2020, falling to 6.5 at the end per cent at the end of 21-22, but not falling below 6 per cent until the end of 23-24. It's at this point that the budget has signalled it will begin its job of budget re repair. Time will tell what this really means, but I do think it's uh, interesting that the government uh, is, has decided, it seems, that uh, six per cent unemployment rate is at the point is, is or comfortably below it, and we tried to get to this in estimates, is the point where uh, significant budget savings will be, be made uh, to return um, the budget into order, that will still leave uh, hundreds of thousands of people sitting on the unemployment queues. In addition to these figures, the Reserve Bank has recently said in its statement of monetary policy that GDP won't reach its pre-pandemic level until at least 2021. Wages growth will be low for a considerable period and employment won't return to its pre-pandemic levels until 2022. When you consider the budget and the wider economy in these terms, the picture is definitely a sobering one. And quite often we have these economic discussions in terms of numbers uh, and using numbers to tell the story. But the story for so many Australians at the moment is one of worry, is one of hardship, is one of a very, very difficult year and concern that next year is going to be just as hard, if not harder. It is the human story behind these numbers that really should focus the minds of the government, because it is the people who are relying on JobKeeper, it is the people who are relying on JobSeeker, it is the two million Australians who are relying on the coronavirus supplement to help them get through. It is the young people leaving university and one or um, school um, wondering how they are going to start their careers, the impact of um, high levels of youth unemployment. It is for older workers who have lost their jobs, the thought that they won't be able to get into um, new employment or new employment opportunities won't be for them. It's the worry of people who have been living off the, um, you know, on the pension as they raise children. Um, it's the ones whose rent is more than they can afford, who are at risk of of losing their house, who can't afford the mortgage. Um, it's all of these stories that should focus the minds of us in this place and that we should all commit uh, to caring about and tailoring solutions available to the national government to make sure that their needs are supported. You would think that with all of this economic data, with the story that's um, provided through the economic um, forecasts, with the the uh, policy response from the government, we would see more of an effort being taken to battle some of these serious system um, failures that we have, particularly in aged care. Um, we would use this opportunity, where we are spending billions of dollars to try and leave a lasting legacy for those who will have to pay down this debt. Um, it is about making sure women are able to return to the workforce, that they're not prevented by um, you know, policy settings which disencourage them uh, to work or make it impossible for them to take on an extra shift or an extra day. And when we look at what the Department of Social Services are saying, they've updated um, at a recent committee, I think at estimates, that they are expecting 1.8 million Australians to be relying on um, uh, unemployment support by the end of the year, uh, and um, that this is happening at the time that the government has decided to uh, reduce uh, financial support to this group of people and indeed end financial support uh, for the extension of the coronavirus supplement in March uh, 2021, at a time when we have millions of Australians relying on those payments. Um, Labor has been clear from the beginning in terms of the economic response. We, we, want, uh, we, are, not we are not criticising the government for, for their spending money where it is needed, but we are, have been critical 
about the quality of the spending. Um, we have been critical of the government setting up these funds. Uh, there's over, um, there's, depending on how you count it, there's between five and seven billion dollars worth of funds established for ministers to allocate um, expenditure from. Um, many of these funds over in history have conveniently um, preferenced um, coalition seats, either targeted or marginal, and we are concerned about money being funnelled that way um, without proper scrutiny, with um, ministerial pens approving large amounts of, of taxpayers' funds to go to particular projects for particular uh, parts of Australia at a time when every dollar spent is a borrowed dollar. So we will continue to focus on the quality of the spend, uh, making sure that every dollar that is borrowed is being used to support Australians, whether it's to create jobs, protect jobs, support families to put food on the table and pay bills. That is the focus uh, we want the government to, um, to respond to. That's the focus we want them to have, because it's Australians that deserve their priority attention, not their political outcomes. Uh, this budget has finally put some flesh on the bones of the job maker plan. Um, this was announced, as people might not recall, but it was announced months ahead of the October budget, but no one seemed to knew, know what it was meant to do or how it was meant to do it or who was in charge of it. It took about four months um, for uh, the detail to be provided, and $74 billion of the measures um, around uh, out of the government's expenditure in this budget focus uh, on the job maker plan whether it be through the hiring credit or some of the other initiatives to support uh, to try and increase business investment um, infrastructure spending the manufacturing uh, strategy uh, so there is a lot of um, I think time will tell whether this emphasis on through JobMaker actually delivers the outcomes that we need to see. We know that they've been dodgy on the numbers in the past, and we, uh, I see the Prime Minister on the weekend again saying that Home Builder had, had supported a million jobs in the construction industry, where we know that the Treasury has a very different view of the jobs numbers that you can attach uh, to the Home Builder program. Uh, the job maker hiring credit, again, the government used the figure in their budget of a, of a million new jobs in the budget. 450,000 of them were supposedly created through the job maker hiring credit. When um, proper scrutiny was brought to this number, the Treasury admitted that uh, in terms of additionality, they thought the job maker hiring credit would create uh, approximately 45,000 uh, new jobs. So that's just 10 per cent of what the government has detailed in their, in their budget papers. So from the opposition's point of view, we will be closely watching this. We will closely be watching the quality of the spend, the claims by the government about the jobs numbers that these programs funded by taxpayers actually deliver. Uh, and we will be making sure that the government is not withdrawing support too early from too many Australians who are relying on it. If we think of the you know, million and a half of Australians needing JobKeeper or receiving JobKeeper, the one and a half million Australians uh, on JobSeeker, the two million Australians who are getting the coronavirus supplement, I think that sends a pretty strong message that there are millions of people in Australia relying on this government doing the right thing by them and not withdrawing um, money too soon. I also have a second Thank reading you. amendment, which I circulate in my name. Thank you, uh, Senator Gallagher. I'm assuming you've moved that. Um, we will go to Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the government appropriation bills at a time when our economy and the working people of Australia face a crisis of a scale not seen since the Great Depression. The once-in-a-century pandemic has very quickly become a once-in-a-century employment catastrophe. Nearly one million unemployed and another two million underemployed. Australian households in the hundreds of thousands have no one, have no one in work or not enough work to pay even the basics of rent, mortgage, food and bills. The government expects that tens of thousands more will lose their jobs before Christmas, and thousands more businesses are still at risk of going under. It's, deeply anxious, it's a deeply anxious time, and for Australia, for many in 2020, will be a deep scar. 
The scarring began with the 2019-20 bushfires and will end with a COVID Christmas. Hopefully spent with Christmas spent hopefully with families and friends, but nevertheless with deep uncertainty for many as to whether they'll have a job or a business in 2021. There is now some hope, however, on the horizon. State borders are opening and vaccines are looking promising. But the reality is that this recovery will not be painless, and for many Australians it will be a recession economy for years to come if we don't act. The truth is that this government had been dragged to put in a wage subsidy at all. Labor and trade union, the trade union movement were urging them to look at the wage subsidies in the UK and Europe and elsewhere, and made the case for keeping people connected to their jobs through the crisis was the number one priority. Remember in March when they introduced the job seeker supplement but no wage subsidy and the mass layoffs began? It was, un well, it was not until the Prime Minister and the Treasurer saw those Centrelink queues that they began to move. With the hardline ideologues in the Coalition caucus pushing against government expenditure on JobKeeper and JobSeeker, the government ended up with a JobKeeper package that left out more, left out more than a million casuals, gig workers, workers in the arts, universities and aviation. All these Australians work hard and pay their taxes. Many have families to support. Many are not eligible for job seeker either. They were abandoned by this government. Their jobs were considered not worthy of keeping. So as our borders reopen and business start to consider hiring again, the question now becomes, what sort of recovery are we going to have? Because this is at the heart of what these appropriation bills are all about. How effective will this government's spending be to revive our economy, not just in the short term, but so we can have strong, secure jobs for the future and the support and policy settings for industries that will be creating these jobs? Will the recovery be a short-term sugar rush of money thrown at some businesses to get them to employ people on a casual or temporary basis? only to churn them for new workers? Will it be a high-profile announcement from the Prime Minister designed to look at if unemployment and sluggish economic demand is being tackled with little strategy and even less follow-up? Or will it be a government who faces up to the deep structural problems with employment and opportunity in this economy, problems that we have already seen before the pandemic hit? Problems that are likely to be cemented by this pandemic. I'm, of course, talking about endemic insecure work, growing underemployment, the crisis in skills training and record low wages growth brought on by the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government's policy of wage suppression. This, Deputy President, is where the appropriations bill comes in. The Australian government has an historic opportunity in this once in a century crisis to refashion and rebuild the skills, infrastructure, energy policy and social safety net that all of us need to succeed in the next 100 years. So how is the Prime Minister and his government deciding to spend our money? Will people be left behind? Will money be spent on rorts or recovery? The nearly one trillion in debt that they have racked up should be expected to get us a long way to tackling the root causes of what was a very sluggish, underperforming economy before COVID. Well, the signs aren't good. Firstly, are they clearly pulling JobKeeper and JobSeeker supplement out of the economy well too soon? The, the 1.5 million Australians still reliant on JobKeeper, the cuts to this subsidy come to at the worst possible time. The Treasurer overnight has been spinning the reduction in people on JobKeeper as a positive story. The numbers are welcome, but given the border restrictions easing and the tighter eligibility, that is not a big issue. surprise. The real question we should be asking is why commit to spending hundreds of millions on a wage subsidy if you wrench that money out of the economy before there are viable businesses and jobs to replace it? Why, when we know that low-income people spend pretty much every dollar they get, would you take away the job seeker supplement 
and both injure the bottom line of local business when they are desperate for customers and cruelly drop tens of thousands of families back below the poverty line. Secondly, the government's own estimates have employment staying below pre-COVID levels for at least four years. And what is the government's jobs plan? Well, there isn't one. Of course, one of the centrepieces of their spending is the $4 billion so-called job maker hiring credit. But on closer examination, this scheme proved to be the huge support to the economy that was first promised, certainly not to be the huge support. This was a scheme designed to replace JobKeeper when it ends in March. But while JobKeeper was flawed primarily because it left so many workers out, this new scheme will leave even more restraints behind. This morning on ABC TV, one of Australia's most loved stars, Bernard Fanning from Powderfinger, was interviewed about the band's new album and he had an important shout out for the Pro Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, and the treatment by his government of our arts industry. He said of the government that there, needs, there have been a lot of announcements but little action. When it comes to supporting arts industry, this isn't the first time he has spoken out. He has for months been saying that the highly trained professionals in arts and entertainment may be lost for the industry forever. They have been, in his words, forced completely to change their careers because there is no, no work. If they don't come back, there may not be enough behind the scenes people to support tours when they get back up and running. That means devastation to the industry. My colleague in the, play, the other place, Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations and Arts, has been relentless in his support for arts industry. The industry, along with aviation, was hit first and hardest. Aviation and the arts will also be industries that will, be, that will have restrictions removed on them last. Aviation workers who used, work, used to work for Qantas but after a sale allowed by this government became employees of Donata, had to watch while other workers in the industry got JobKeeper, but the ownership structure of their company saw the government deny them a connection to their jobs. Many of these workers, many of these workers live in the Shire, in the Prime Minister's own electorate, but still they're shut out. The tin ear of the Prime Minister. Meanwhile, more than a million casuals and gig workers were also shut out, creating a double blow for their families, for the local business that rely on their spending. University workers were punished for ideological reasons, forced to reply increasingly on income from overseas students due to government funding cuts. When this revenue dried up, the government denied the sector JobKeeper and they are literally letting universities bleed out staff and courses at a time when Australians have no jobs and many want to get a tertiary education. And now we have JobMaker, which is also defined by who in, who in Australia's workforce it leaves out. The Prime Minister, with his usual fanfare, claimed JobMaker would support 450,000 jobs. Sounds good. Except you always have to read the fine line with this mob. In this case, a Senate estimates hearing saw bureaucrats admit that only 45,000 of those jobs would actually be new jobs. Only one-tenth of what was claimed would be created. 45,000 jobs is not much of a dent in one million unemployed. Meanwhile, when we saw who was actually eligible for this new $1 to $200 per week subsidy, the alarm bells started ringing. It became clear that rather than job maker, what they had created was job taker, job churner, job destroyer. In fact, if you wanted to create an incentive for businesses to replace their existing staff with younger workers who would get a short-term job and then be churned for another short-term worker, then this is the scheme you would design. Not only were your existing staff on JobKeeper not be eligible for this subsidy when JobKeeper winds up in March. To be eligible for JobMaker, you have to be aged 18 to 35, and the full subsidy only goes to the age 30. 
So a trillion dollars of spending by this government in the October budget, but nothing for workers over 35. That's 928,000 people who are now on unemployment benefits, but who could not benefit from the scheme, no matter if they are experienced, qualified or if the employer wants to hire them. Even if you're under 35, the subsidy is only for a year. So it's very unlikely that this scheme will create long-term, secure jobs for young people in the recession. In actual fact, it's aimed at people with as little as 20 hours a week. They have already gutted apprenticeships, cut billions from TAFE, hiked university fees, taken your penalty rates, told you that in the middle of a pandemic, if you are without work and cannot get JobKeeper, you will have to raid your own superannuation retirement nest egg just to pay your bills. Nothing in these appropriation bills show any real desire to tackle our job crisis. This is our money, and it's a right that in a recession that the government uses the budget to step in when the private sector cannot support jobs. But the public money should be used for long-term investment in infrastructure, education and skills, not a short-term political fix which suspiciously looks like a pre-election pump of the economy. This government's recent record on spending does not inspire confidence. Last month it was revealed that the federal government spent $30 million on land near Sydney Airport at Levington only for it to be valued at $3 million. Of course, that's being investigated by the AFP now for fraud. The government also hopes the COVID-19 will provide cover for the $100 million sports fraud scandal. We know that how this standard operating procedure of the Liberal National Party. Just last week, New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian was questioned about the ever-growing scandal of her office's involvement in a $140 million scheme that gave 95 per cent of sports and community grants to Liberal marginal and targeted seats. She flat out admitted that pork barrelling was common practice and it is OK, because it was not illegal. When the federal government sports rorts was uncovered by the Australian National Audit Office earlier this year, the Prime Minister acted the way we have come to expect when he is caught spending public money to further his own political interests. He announced a sham investigation, a self-investigation by his former Chief of Staff and now Head of the Prime Minister's Department. And of course, as I mentioned before in the aviation industry, and I just see an announcement today where money was spent to keep people connected with their job. But this government doesn't connect them with their jobs. What they've allowed is yet not only 6,900 workers to be thrown out of Qantas, but also they've now just announced they won't take a bid from the 2,500 workers that have been replaced by lower paid workers. It has the same rig as JobMaker. All talk, no action, and people get it in the neck. To see this government not hold the Qantas to account, particularly right on the verge of where so many of these workers preside in the Prime Minister's electorate. So here we have it. Hundreds of thousands of people needlessly left behind, spending on rorts, not recovery, a government that doesn't hold those they give hundreds of millions of dollars to account to keep people connected with their jobs. Appropriations in this government seem to be indistinguishable from misappropriations. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. And I believe you're moving the second reading amendment. Yeah, I'm moving uh, in uh, Senator Katie Gallagher's name on behalf of the opposition. Thank you, uh, Senator Sheldon. It's so moved. Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Appropriation Bill No. 1, 2020, 2021, Appropriation Bill No. 2, 2020 and 2021, Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 2020, 2021. These bills propose appropriations that broadly cover five months of funding for the 2021 financial year as funding for 
2021 and in the 2020 budget. Bill number one would appropriate $36.8 billion. Bill number two would appropriate just under $14.9 billion. And the Parliamentary Department's bill would appropriate $141.7 million. While there is large advance to the Finance Minister's provisions than usual in these bills, the Labor Party recognised the extenuating circumstances presented by COVID-19. We do not oppose the bills as they are important to facilitate Australia's navigating our way out of this crisis. This bill is being handed down in unprecedented times. The bushfires, which devastated so many regions, were the largest in recorded history and had already presented unprecedented disruptions to our lives and to the economy. These have since been overshadowed by a once-in-a-generation pandemic. As COVID-19 hit our shores, it quickly exposed structural weaknesses within our economy. The Morrison recession is the deepest and darkest recession in over 100 years, and our recovery will be protracted for too long. Australia is now heading very quickly to a national debt record of $1 trillion under this Morrison government. According to research undertaken by the Grattan Institute, our recovery should be occurring much quicker as, unlike previous recession, this one was brought on by government restrictions and not financial crashes or conflict. That is why the recession is dubbed the Morrison recession. And now that the government is turning things back on, the, the economy has undergone too much um, over the past seven years of mismanagement to respond to the significant fiscal stimulus the government has announced. Our recovery is projected to be sluggish and reflective of the slow job market and lack of business investment, which already plagued our economy well before COVID-19 hit our shores. The Liberals have been in power for seven years now, and they have established a legacy of subdued economic growth, soaring power prices, a lull in apprenticeships and traineeships, and increasing the price of university degrees. And now our trade relationship with China seems have hit rock bottom, thanks to the incompetence of the Prime Minister and the Trade Minister, Senator Birmingham. The fact that 82 ships carrying coal are sitting in the South China Seas, unable to dock into Chinese ports, is a significant diplomatic and international trade disaster. And it's not just coal. Tasmanian produce is not getting to China because this government does not understand the word diplomacy. And now, because of those opposite, our wine industry has been caught in the firing line, which has the potential to decimate Australian wine making companies. Late last week, China announced a 212% tariff on wine entering China. That's right, Australian winemakers will now be forced to pay China a 200% tax for the privilege of selling our wine. These tensions must ease, or Australia's economy will continue to deteriorate under this government. And it isn't just wine, as I stated before. So many industries are being affected, including our beef industry, barley, seafood, sugar, timber. My home state of Tasmania relies heavily on exporting our world's best products to China. And so Tasmania can't afford this government's continuing to stuff up our relationship with China, because that's what they're doing. This economic neglect has been exposed in this moment of crisis, and unfortunately for many Australians, they will have to deal with the blunt uh, nature of this political ineptness as well. From a national economic perspective, the government has now begun to withdraw support from the economy and households will begin to feel the sting of this recession. The International Monetary Fund has warned that support is being withdrawn too soon and will result in unemployment remaining too high for too long. But the Morrison government is fixed on their plan regardless of what happens because, as we know, they're not very good at taking any well-meaning and support. The stimulus is made up of measures which will not necessarily produce jobs. The income tax cuts will more likely result in money being saved and not spent. 
According to the government, the tax cuts will cost $16.9 billion in the next financial year alone and create 50,000 jobs. But if this money was invested in other sectors such as university education, childcare, healthcare, aged care and creative arts, modelling from the Australian Institute predicts that it could generate up to 210,000 jobs, a significant amount more than the government has uh, indicated. This has been mentioned to those opposite, but do you think they will listen? Of course not. They only listen to their rich mates. Those opposite are not a fan of independent research, or one could say facts. The Liberals' road and transport infrastructure projects also create less jobs per dollar spent than on other industries. The Treasurer is content with unemployment remaining high and thousands of jobs being lost, but this comes as no consolation to the millions of Australians who will now face undue hardship because of a lack of leadership by those sitting opposite. Australia is at the crossroads. We are at a pivotal point in our recovery. We can rebuild our nation and ensure a more resilient and robust economy into the future. But all this budget is doing is handing down a one-year short-sighted response with no guarantee of any meaningful reform. As Anthony Albanese outlined in his budget and reply speech, the Labor Party has a plan and a vision for Australia that work, works in building and uh, supporting the rebuilding of our economy, and that will work well beyond the next 12 months. One that creates jobs, enhances our manufacturing self-sufficiency, considers the disproportionate impact of women and, most importantly, makes sure that it doesn't leave anyone behind. The $4 billion Job Maker Initiative completely excludes older workers. The Labor Party has been campaigning for years to address our high levels of youth unemployment and underemployment. This group of young workers have been suffering from low wages and difficult labour market since the GFC. But all this policy does is ensure that the 928,000 people aged over 35 on unemployment benefits are deliberately excluded from hiring subsidies. This policy divides Australians and is creating tensions within our community when we can least afford it. This subsidy will predominantly target low-skilled industries, which were the hardest hit throughout this recession. However, it will likely entrench the structural issues which younger people were already facing prior to the pandemic. As older people are being excluded from this wage subsidy, the Labor Party fears that this will result in older workers, and in particular older women, facing a higher likelihood of homelessness and join the group of long-term unemployed. I urge the government to rethink this decision as we head into Christmas. I want those opposite to think about how this policy and their policies generally are hurting Australians. I urge those opposite not to pit Australian against one another, but at the moment that's exactly what their policies are doing. Policy must be based in evidence. When evidence-based policy is implemented, it often succeeds. Labor is doing the important policy work necessary for success. We are ready to govern. Ahead of the next election, Labor will bring forward a comprehension plan a comprehensive plan for the repair and construction of social housing. Data shows that Australia has a social housing shortfall of about 433,000 properties and up to 116,000 people are homeless on any given night. This crisis has made it ever more clear how essential, safe and affording, affordable housing is. We have a housing crisis in Australia and there needs to be investment in this essential service. Public housing more than pays for itself. For every $1 million of residential building construction output, it has a magnifying, uh, multiplying effect sorry, of $2.9 million throughout the industry and broader economy. This stimulation must boost the post 
crisis, economic recovery and reduce homelessness. Repairs could start almost immediately, providing work for local plumbers, chippies, sparkies, plasterers and painters, as well as companies that manufacture building supplies and materials. Access to appropriate support with secure long-term housing provides the stability required to break the cycle of homelessness. This housing first principle is known to improve prospects. It has yet to be adopted by the Morrison government, and construction jobs are always welcome in an economy that requires it. Under the childcare policy proposed by Anthony Albanese in the budget reply, it would mean that working mothers would be able to afford childcare for their kids. It's as simple as that. Women would not be let down by Labor's plan to kickstart the economy and get Australians back to work. Modelling from the Grattan Institute has indicated that this reform would work. It would boost workforce participation and families would be better off as more parents are encouraged to work more hours. As we are currently experiencing a service-led recession, it is imperative that we boost the discretionary spending in the economy, and this reform would do just that. Childcare fees in Australia are some of the highest in the world. Australia can and should be a country that makes things. We currently have one of the lowest manufacturing self-sufficiencies in the developed world. A strong local manufacturing sector can deliver world-class incorporating the best technology and provide the good, secure jobs our workers need and deserve. We need to see more trains, buses and boats built in Australia by local workers and ensure every dollar of federal funding spent on these projects boosts their local jobs and industry. In my home state of Tasmania, many companies have the know-how, skills, professionalism to get the job done right there in Tasmania. I have spoken many times about companies such as Definium Technologies and Incat, two world-leading companies that deserve the backing of state and federal governments to ensure local manufacturing continue to happen in Australia. Why won't those opposite jump on board? They talk a lot about Team Australia, but when it comes to actually backing local manufacturing, they are all hat and no cattle. It's time to start backing locals to locally manufacture. No excuses anymore. Anthony Albanese's defence industry development strategy will leverage our $270 billion investment pipeline and develop sovereign industrial and research capacity. We cannot enact this reform without skilled and appropriately qualified workforce. Therefore, an Australian skills guarantee will give apprentices and trainees an opportunity to work on major Commonwealth projects by ensuring 10 per cent of workers on federal funded projects are apprentices. The Liberals have a plan to boost apprenticeships by 100,000, but this doesn't make up for the loss we have experienced in the past seven years, nor does it account for the predictable drop in enrolments as a result of COVID-19. This budget put us in a trillion dollar debt. That is a remarkable amount of money, but it doesn't offer any guarantee of ensuring strong economic future for Australia. We are certainly in unprecedented times, and as many countries begin to experience a second and third wave, I'm thankful for our swift response to COVID-19, which has meant that we have performed relatively well, and thanks to our state and territory leaders. However, we need strong leadership and a long-term vision for Australia. This country is screaming out for leadership at the federal level. They can't rely on Scott Morrison and his team to deliver that certainty. They cannot rely on the Morrison government to lead us out of the economic circumstances that we are in. They have delivered a trillion dollar debt. They can talk about being good managers, but we know we were heading for disaster before COVID-19 hit. We knew that there was a hit to the national economy, and they have done nothing in this budget to actually steer us out of these troubled waters. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I think um, the last time that I was in this position, while you were in that position, that uh, I was a little hot under the collar and um, you invited me to withdraw a remark, and I think I remember declining to withdraw it. 
Um, on reflection, I just say that I'm sort of listening and learning every day, and that I regret putting you in a difficult position uh, uh, on that afternoon. So I thought I'd start out. Uh, thought I'd start out that way in a slightly conciliatory tone, and end that there. Um, the the it's been almost two months since the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, announced the 2019-2020 budget. Uh, it looked pretty weak on the day. Uh, and the last two months uh, haven't strengthened the perceptions of the community about the government's capacity to manage its way to economic recovery. Uh, and two months later, the budget still looks like the cheap, weak document that it was on the day that it was announced. It's pretty hard to imagine a circumstance, really, where you can navigate up towards a $213 billion deficit this financial year and have most people in the community unable to say what the budget has actually done. $480 billion worth of cumulative deficits over the forward estimates. Deficits projected for the next decade. And net debt to peak at $966 billion, 43.8 per cent of GDP in 2023-2024. And the Labor critique of this budget is not about the debt itself. I remember being on my feet in this place at the beginning of this year, passionately arguing that the Australian government should deliver a wage subsidy to support jobs and businesses through this recession. And I say I argued it passionately because I could see in the faces of those opposite that they, their stoic refusal at the time to do that. Uh, their decrying of anybody who made an argument that the Australian government should be stepping in to support businesses and to support wages and to support the jobless through this crisis, uh, that that would lead to a terrible outcome for the Australian economy. Now, I remember that very well and I remember the government's welcome backflip a week later. Our critique is not of the debt itself. Our criticism is that very little has been achieved with it. Our criticism is that it's inexplicable, really, that you could shovel this much money out the door and have nothing to show for it. The largest deficit delivered by the previous Labor government was $54.5 billion in 2009 2010 a budget deficit that was the result of effective stimulus during the GFC period. What did that deliver? Well, it delivered Australia being the only country in the OECD that did not fall into recession. Now, that's a pretty bland assertion on its face. But on this side, growing up in a country town, spending most of my working life in and around the manufacturing industry, I know what a recession delivers in terms of long-term unemployment, social dislocation and misery. But that $54 billion deficit was the result of so much opportunistic hand-wringing and complaining and bleating and moaning and groaning and propagandising. I'll never forget the budget deficit bus that some of the characters opposite used to ride around in through regional Queensland and regional New South Wales and bothering people in every little country town in Victoria. Uh, you, you could not deliver a budget debt truck big enough to put the numbers on it for the kind of deficit that the characters opposite have delivered. It would need to be in 12 point in order to get all of the digits uh, onto an ordinary bus, onto an ordinary truck. Um, people are entitled to ask, if 
For this trillion dollars, what is delivered in terms of lasting infrastructure, lasting social reform, lasting economic reform? The answer is not very much. This was supposed to be a budget that created jobs. By the government's own estimates, it will take four years for unemployment to return to pre-crisis levels. That's four years where some people who are unemployed today will still be unemployed, presumably in our outer suburbs, presumably in our regional towns. There's no plan for childcare, no proper plan for aged care. How you could get to a point where there's a trillion dollars in debt and not have done a, lifted a finger in the face of the neglect report that the government received about aged care is beyond me. No plan for energy. Government entirely isolated on energy policy. Now the New South Wales government has had to step in. The New South Wales Liberal government has had to step in and do what the Commonwealth government should always have done uh, and lead the way. Every state and territory with a plan on energy policy, this lot constrained by outdated, mostly pretty dopey ideology around energy policy, unable to act, unable to act in the national interest. Trillion dollars gone, no outcome on energy policy. No plan for social housing. It's taken the Victorian government to announce spending around $5 billion on much needed social and public housing. Now what did I think it was Mr Wilson, uh, the member for Goldstein, a place where there's probably not much need for social housing? Actually, it was Mr. It was Mr. Falinski from uh, the member for McKellar who said it, if I recall correctly. He said he'd prefer it that people just went out and bought their own homes. Well, what an extraordinarily narcissistic, out of touch sort of proposition. You know, there are a thousand people in McKellar on public housing waiting lists. Perhaps you should go and meet them. And there's no plan for the future of JobKeeper recipients. Instead, we've just got a grab bag of announcements and marketing programs. It didn't take long, not, not a cent out the door of the Emergency Response Fund, as bushfires start to rage around the country last week. Nothing out the door in the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund, but it didn't take long to get the marketing machine going for this budget. The ads for the budget up on billboards within days. Focus group tested, ready to roll. In supermarkets and shopping centres, uh, ethnic media, right across our newspapers, advertisements ready to go. The economic recovery plan ads on TV. The tagline, our comeback. I asked in estimates how much the government planned to spend publicly congratulating itself on its budget. The answer, nobody knows. You can only know the full cost of a campaign once it has started, I was told. And so we'll have to wait for this government uh, in future estimates to come back and tell us how much the our, com our comeback campaign really cost. What we do know from estimates is that it's involved millions of dollars going to Liberal Party mates to conduct thinly disguised political research for the benefit of the Prime Minister and his political party, millions of dollars to their focus grouping research mates uh, in an unprecedented venal attempt uh, to uh, make sure that funds that should properly be spent by party organisations, by political parties doing their research, have instead been expended by the Australian taxpayer in the interests of the Prime Minister and his political party. It's a budget of blank cheques. Blank cheques to government ministers, blank cheques for the private sector, especially the extraordinary write-off provisions, blank cheques to the advertising industry and a complete failure of imagination to deliver spending and projects that will benefit Australian taxpayers. 
How did we get so little? You want an answer to that question? Have a look at the JobMaker program. Poor planning, no accountability, complete willful ideological blindness, leaving hundreds of thousands of vulnerable Australians behind. A $40 billion wage subsidy program that you could not design to be less effective. It seems to be willfully designed to be ineffective, to be incapable of delivering. The program itself is almost as large as the second Rudd stimulus package, twice as big as the Building the Education Revolution program. On budget night, you see the punchline coming here from miles off. On budget night, the government promised 450,000 jobs. I mean, you know that things aren't credible. As soon as they're uttered, as soon as they come out of their mouths, you know that it's not credible, not achievable, marketing spin, announcement with no delivery. 450,000 jobs. It didn't take long for that to fall apart. In budget estimates, Treasury officials, no doubt used to enduring this sort of nonsense from their political masters, they had to explain why it wasn't true. They said 450,000 is an estimate of the take-up of the program given the current outlook. It's not the same as 450,000 jobs being created. So the claim is a distortion. In costing this, they go on to say, we've made a conservative assumption that about 10 per cent of employment in these firms is genuinely additional, that it wouldn't have happened were it not for the hiring credit. So the government announced that it was creating 450,000 jobs. The actual figure is 10 per cent of that—45,000 jobs. In reality, a statistical blip, not 450,000 jobs. $90,000 per actual job created. According to Treasury and indeed the Grattan Institute, the average full-time wage is $81,000. Average wage for all workers is about $62,000. Median wage is about $55,000. The median tax file income, $45,000. Average teacher earns about $70,000. The government could have hired 45,000 nurses through this expenditure and would have spent less money and created the same number of jobs. Research out this week has shown that New South Wales students have fallen three to four months behind in key areas such as reading and numeracy over the course of the pandemic. Effects have been worse with the poorest 24 per cent of families, and particularly those in rural Australia. Meanwhile, the same pandemic has left many casual teachers unemployed. The Grattan Institute proposed a six-month tutoring blitz to help one million disadvantaged school students recover learning lost during the COVID-19 lockdown. There's no announcement of that scale, no capacity to deliver the kind of reform programs that the country needs, extraordinary decision to spend $40 billion in a way that most perversely excludes almost a million unemployed workers. See, the program leaves people over the age of 35 out, stone cold out in the labour market. There are 928,000 Australians on unemployment benefits over the age of 35. That's 57 per cent of people on unemployment benefits. The Morrison government has those 982,000 people over the age of 35 now competing with Australians under the age of 35 who will be subsidised. Well, if you're in a country town, if you're in the outer suburbs, if you're over the age of 35 and you can't find a job, it's pretty clear where the finger of blame should point, squarely at the Morrison government, without the capacity to imagine or to deliver reasonable Thank you, reform. Senator Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, today, as we debate the appropriations 
uh, bills before us. Uh, we've seen uh, in the course of this budget a lot of big numbers, lots of spending promises. Unfortunately, this budget from the Morrison government also had particularly uh, difficult for the country at this time, a lot of hollow promises and missed opportunities. We've seen net debt reach $703 billion. It's an extraordinary level and it's set to grow to over $966 billion, eye-watering numbers at the end of the forward estimates. This takes us to a trillion dollars of debt. Gross debt, currently over 800 billion, forecast to get well over a trillion over the forward estimates, peaking at 1.7 trillion over the decade. So as we debate this budget bill today, we know we remain in very uncertain times. We know, in addition, that this has been exacerbated by the government's response to the coronavirus pandemic, a response that has simply been too slow, too reactive and too uncoordinated. It's failed to make the tweaks that could have reined in some of that eye-watering amount of debt and failed to target uh, measures more specifically to drill down into targeted parts of our economy. So these issues have been evident in every step of the way in the government's response. There can be no doubt, of course, that the government had to stimulate the economy. Parliament had to act to save Australian jobs and keep the economy ticking over. I'd have to say this would have been a task that would have been made much easier if you hadn't taken your eye off the ball in terms of economic management before the pandemic even arrived on the shores of our country country. It's important to recognise that in the initial response by the Prime Minister to the initial suggestion of a wage subsidy, a wage subsidy that I might add is that, that has been the cornerstone to preventing economic collapse, the Prime Minister said no. He said no to that wage subsidy. He said there was no need for a wage subsidy. And then we found, of course, that the government closed parliament and that it was to be closed for five months. They postponed the budget. And of course, it was then, as the country moved into necessary lockdowns, that we saw extremely long queues in our Centrelink offices as thousands and thousands of Australians lost their jobs. Parliament was, of course, reconvened and the government finally accepted the proposition that a wage subsidy was critical to saving our economy, to save thousands upon thousands of businesses and to support millions of jobs. I have to say I wasn't surprised at the government's slow response on these issues. After all, they very strongly opposed state border closures. They were slow to support lockdowns that have prevented the spread of the virus and have essentially been at the heart of our economic resilience. There's nothing more telling in this respect than their support for Clive Palmer in his fight against WA's border closures. For four, four months ago, we had Prime Minister Morrison saying that trying to eliminate the virus was not the right strategy. And yet today we find that the states with the most economic resilience are the ones that have been able to virtually eliminate it, bar uh, its existence within hotel quarantine, as we quite rightly and properly invite people uh, back on our shores as they struggle to get home. Happily, our state premiers did not listen. They did not listen to the Commonwealth railing against state border closures. And as we know, Western Australia closed their borders on April 5. They've stayed closed and are just starting to tentatively reopen now. 
So as we reflect on this in the context of this federal budget, I highlight the critical role that Western Australia has played in keeping the national economy growing. Going. Uh, as we know, it's not growing now, but Western Australia certainly played a big role in keeping it going. Iron ex ore exports are at a record high, and as we know, our major trading competitor in iron ore has not been so lucky. They under-recognised the significance of the impact that COVID-19 would have on its society and its economy. It's experiencing an escalating levels of death and impacts on its health system and their economy. And inevitably, that has had a very large impact on Brazil's iron ore exports. So even with WA's iron ore exports propping up and supporting our national economy, the Prime Minister and many of his West Australian Liberal colleagues sided with Clive Palmer in a blatant attack on WA's safe and strong border closures, putting at risk the health and economic well-being of West Australians and, in turn, the nation. So today we find Australia is in a much stronger position than that of other countries around the world. Nations that fail to shut borders and put in place lockdowns to suppress the virus are in social and economic crisis today. We in the Labor Party certainly recognise that lockdowns would have been impossible without both JobKeeper and a big lift in job seeker payments. People would have simply have had to go to work to make ends meet, and with that would have come uh, the inevitable contagion uh, from uh, in terms of people being un unable to adhere to the requirements of a lockdown. So as we, I drill down into the budget measures further in this speech, let's remember that in this year it is the Australian people that have done the economic heavy lifting here. They've done the heavy lifting in adhering to uh, restrictions on coronavirus. And indeed, our nation and its citizens will have a lot of heavy lifting to do in the future to repair the economic damage that has been done uh, to our country in the context of, uh, in the long term, needing to pay down that escalating debt. The Australian people have made great sacrifices to keep Australia in a safe and strong position. And in that note, Commonwealth budgets should be documents that outline positive strategic direction for the country. They should be about people, not dollars. For the leaders in our parliament, it should be about budgets providing an opportunity to give a strong vision for the country, a vision for Australians, a vision for Australia. But this budget was indeed a big missed opportunity. It represents, yes, pulling a bunch of macroeconomic levers to keep the economy uh, from collapsing and to support uh, people's livelihoods and incomes. But it doesn't do, it doesn't do nearly enough to cre create jobs. I can see this very clearly in the context of my own portfolio areas. Uh, within the job active uh, networks, where uh, the government has been wholly uh, unprepared and unorganised in working out how to triage th hundreds of thousands of unemployed people into the job active networks and reform the services that they provide to provide people meaningful support uh, as the economy restructures. We expect in our country unemployment to remain high for just far too long. Another 160,000 Australians are expected to be unemployed by Christmas. 
a trillion dollars of government debt, and yet still many, many Australians left behind. We've seen in the government's policy announcements, we have seen how 298,000 people over the age of 35 are left behind uh, by their deliberate exclusion from the JobMaker hiring subsidies. We have seen no plan for childcare and the role that improved equity in childcare could provide for our economic recovery. No plan for a fix to our aged care sector. The extra home care places in this year's budget, as we know, are but a drop in the ocean compared to the waiting lists today. And we also know that the crisis in our aged care system in respect to COVID-19 was made much worse by this government's neglect of the sector for too long. The low wages in the sector uh, have certainly meant it's contributed to circumstances of the virus being transmitted. No plan for the future of job seeker recipients. 1.4 million people have a very uncertain future as to whether they will go back to the old rate of of $40 a day. And as we know, the government seems uh, to be on a plan to delivering just that. There's no plan for energy security and certainty coming from this government, something that has long beleaguered our country uh, and impeded its economic development and progress because of that policy uncertainty. It is most definitely not an uncertainty that we can take forward with us into the future as we try to uh, work as a nation to emerge out of the economic impacts of COVID-19. And let's not forget how this government has kicked the boot into future university students and young Australians. You, when you absolutely took the scissors to our university sector via your so-called funding reforms. It's particularly galling that at a time when you said you wanted to support young people and their mental health, at a time when universities were encouraged to make early offers to students, that they have then accepted places at universities based on as without knowing about the astronomical fee hikes that they would face, that somehow it was, that was okay to do that to the young people of today. This government has absolutely failed to understand that our nation needs to be a smarter nation and a stronger nation on the other side of economic recovery. You failed to recognise that the aspiration of young Australians to seek better opportunities through education should be absolutely core to this recovery. Uh, in closing my remarks today, I really want to give a positive uh, nod to our Labor leader, Mr Anthony Albanese. He outlined in his budget reply a really positive vision for Australia a vision that acknowledged the significant hardships that many Australians are facing, recognised their aspiration to emerge stronger from this economic recession and outlined the critical role that an Australian government can and should play in economic recovery. It's a plan that I'm proud of uh, and it was a plan that held true to the values of the Australian Labor Party. So as I reflect on the missed opportunities uh, of uh, the, this year's federal budget, I look forward into the future to the Labor Party's role in continuing to support the economic well-being Thank and you, social well-being of all Australians. Thank you, Senator Pratt.
Um, Senator Billick, you have the call. Can you hear us clearly? I can. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, can so, we just test the sound a little bit longer? Um, <coughs> I'm not sure it came through entirely clearly. Give it another go. I'll just see if I can. How's that? That's improved. Very good. It's improved? Okay. Thank you. So there's no bold expression of what vision and priorities a government has for Australia than a budget. But when you look at this year's budget, it reveals a government that stands for nothing. The Morrison government is bereft of ideas. It has no plans for the future. It's got no plan for early childhood education and care. No plan to fix Australia's broken aged care system and ensure quality care for older Australians. No plan to create jobs and support job seekers through the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. I could mention a myriad of other failings by this government, but I do have limited time today, so I'll focus on these areas, as well as the Morrison's government's ongoing ideological attacks on the ABC. This government cannot be trusted to steer Australia through the COVID-19 pandemic or out of the Morrison recession. This is a budget which leaves Australia in $1 trillion of debt for the first time in our nation's history, but with nothing to show for it. The hypocrisy of those opposite on fiscal management has been laid bare. Years ago, they declared that Australia was in the midst of a debt and deficit disaster. If you mention debt, and deficit now, they run for cover. You don't really you don't see them for dust. Debt has more than tripled since they came to office, and the back in the black mugs that celebrated their artificial surface have vanished from the Liberals' merchandise store. This is also a budget that delivers no plan for the recovery from the Morrison recession, Australia's first recession in 30 years. Of course, the government would like to entirely blame this recession on the COVID-19 pandemic but they are nowhere near blameless for the dismal state of the economy. Australia went into the pandemic in a position of weakness, not strength. Before the pandemic hit, the Liberals and Nationals had already doubled government debt since coming to power. Australian workers were already experiencing wage growth at record lows. Households were already worse off than they were in 2013. Before the pandemic hit, business investment was down Consumer confidence was down and labour productivity was declining. So on almost any measure, Australia's economy was weak under the management of this government before COVID-19 was even heard of. There's no arguing that the pandemic has been a significant economic challenge, but this doesn't give the government a free pass for their economic failings. Even in the midst of the COVID-19 outbreak, this government has failed to get its economic management right. Despite the treasurer, Treasurer's pronouncement that, and I quote, Australians know that their government has their back, end of quote, millions of Australians have fallen through the gap in economic support, especially their JobKeeper scheme. This includes workers in charities, universities, the arts sector and many casual employees. Madam Acting Deputy President, these gaps combined with the rise in insecure work, have exacerbated the economic impact of the pandemic on Australians and undermined the health measures needed to keep us all safe. It's worth remembering too that the government only introduced a wage subsidy because of political pressure. It was us, it was Labor that initially called for a wage subsidy and at the time the government ruled it out only, once again, to backflip a few weeks later. The one measure that the government has introduced to support jobs in the economic recovery, the job maker hiring credit, is not the saving grace they claim it to be. And we heard those opposite proudly boasting that their scheme would create 450,000 jobs. But then in estimates, Treasury officials confirmed that it would only create 45,000 jobs. One tenth. One tenth of the figure the government had initially claimed. And when the job maker legislation was going through Parliament, they were trying to put in place protections that would stop employers from sacking workers and replacing them with cheaper, subsidised workers. But then, in a grubby deal, One Nation teamed up with the government to remove this safeguard. 
even though they had voted with Labor and the crossbench to maintain this protection the day before. Not only does this threaten the job security of every worker aged over 35, it also excludes over 900,000 people on unemployment benefits aged over 35 from the hiring subsidy. And to illustrate this point, Labor produced 16 examples of job ads where employers were specifically advertising for employees that met the scheme's criteria, including a requirement that applicants are aged under 35. Now, we've warned the government the job maker doesn't go far enough in helping soften the blows from COVID-19 and that a lot more needs to be done. And if the government is serious about creating jobs, they would do well to look at Labor's proposals outlined by the Leader of the Opposition in his budget reply. Labor's Rewiring the Nation initiative will invest $20 billion to rebuild and modernise the energy grid. The blueprint for this has already been completed by the Australian energy market operator and signed off by all governments. This will provide thousands of new construction jobs, particularly in regional Australia. And we've also proposed a national rail manufacturing plan to have more trains built in Australia, boosting local jobs and industry. Our defence industry development strategy will leverage $270 billion in investment, develop sovereign industrial and research capabilities and build skills and expertise within the Australian workforce. And we've also announced an Australian skills guarantee ensuring one in 10 jobs on major Commonwealth projects are given to apprentices, trainees or cadets. We called on the government to deliver a plan to repair social housing, something we would do if we were in government right now. And around 25% of Australia's social housing stock is in emergent need of repair and maintenance, and this plan would create jobs for local tradies. Now, if the Morrison government wants to lift labour productivity and create jobs, they also need to address the ability of families to balance work and family responsibility. As a former early childhood educator, I understand and I value the quality of early childhood education and care, not just for helping parents to participate in the workforce, but also because of the incredible contribution it makes to early childhood learning and development. We know that those opposite don't appreciate the value of childcare. And this is why various government front benches have described, have described subsidised early childhood education and care as, and I quote, a money pit, communism. And one particularly backward senator in this place called it the hand of government reaching in and taking away our children's youth. This attitude goes some way to explaining why the government introduced a childcare fee system that left one in four families worse off and why Australians pay some of the highest childcare fees in the world. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the government were very proud to trumpet their temporary free childcare policy, but it was never properly funded and this put many, uh, many providers at risk of closure and closed the door on a number of um, childcare places for many families. And if that isn't bad enough, the government broke their promise to early childhood educators and ended their eligibility for JobKeeper payment before any other profession. Now, by contrast to those opposite, we understand the value of subsidised quality early childhood education. We understand the big difference it will make to helping millions of Australians enter the workforce, particularly those who want to take up new job opportunities and increase their hours as Australia recovers from the recession. We know that childcare helps women in particular with workforce participation, which is important given women have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And that's why a Labor government would scrap the childcare subsidy cap, a cap which sees some women losing money by taking on additional hours of work. And Labor will also increase the maximum childcare subsidy to 90%, which will cut costs for 97% of all families in the system. Now, while budgets are an important mechanism for creating jobs and driving economic prosperity, they're also a means by which governments look after their most vulnerable citizens. Older Australians deserve a secure and dignified retirement. 
Of all the failures of this government, there are few so monumental and so tragic as the disastrous failures in aged care. In September, it was revealed that 50,000 Australians in residential aged care were abused each year. I've got to say, when I heard that, I just felt physically ill. The Aged Care Royal Commission heard that one in five aged care residents was receiving substandard care. Complaints about aged care doubled in one year to $8,000, yet the Morrison government has failed to properly resource the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission to handle those complaints. And more than 110,000 calls to my aged care hotline went unanswered over the past three years. 102,000 Australians are on the waiting list for home care packages. 30,000 Australians went into residential aged care prematurely over the past two years because they couldn't get their home care package soon enough. And another 30,000 died over the past three years while waiting for their approved home care package. This year's budget provides funding for another 23,000 home care packages, which is not nearly enough to address even the backlog. Only 2,000 of these are level four packages, the ones which provide for the highest level of care. And the number of people waiting for level four packages is close to 16,000 or around eight times that number. One of the most tragic outcomes of the government's failure in aged care is that three quarters of COVID-19 deaths have occurred in that sector. To date, there have been 685 COVID-19 deaths in aged care. And the Aged Care Royal Commission has directly attributed this to the Morrison's government failure to plan, to plan properly for a COVID-19 outbreak in aged care. And they've also pointed out that this tragedy could have been prevented had the government acted upon previous aged care reviews and addressed persistent problems in the sector. There were about a dozen reports into aged care containing about 150 recommendations that the government's done nothing on, they haven't acted on. A final failing of this year's budget I would like to mention is that it locks in existing cuts to the ABC. Now, calling this a failure is too kind to this government, given their approach to the ABC is more of a deliberate ideological attack. Those opposite, we know, have never liked or supported Australia's independent public broadcaster. And if there's one thing they hate, it's being subjected to independent public scrutiny. And that's why they continue to attack Australia's public broadcaster, undermine its independence and cut its funding. We know that they would privatise the ABC if they had the chance, but they can't because Australians love and value their ABC and wouldn't have a bar of it. Survey after survey has shown us overwhelmingly the support for and the trust in the ABC even by coalition voters. So instead, instead of doing away with the published broadcaster, public broadcaster Hollis Bolas, the Libs and the Nats chip away at the ABC bit by bit. Prime Minister has had the hide to deny that there have been cuts to the ABC, but previous year's budget papers have specifically referred to saving. The managing director, David Anderson, confirmed the cuts when addressing a Senate hearings estimates in March. He said, and I quote, the ABC will have to absorb cumulative budget cuts that amount to $105.9 million per annum by the time we reach the 2022 financial year. And I just have to add, in New Zealand, they added money to the public broadcaster through COVID because they understood that most people would listen to or, or, or watch their public broadcasters. And I just don't understand how in Australia, the uh, Morrison governments and previous governments can be so pig-headed about funding cuts to the ABC. Since the horror Abbott government of 2014, the ABC has suffered cumulative cuts of $783 million, despite Mr Abbott promising no cuts to the ABC the day, the day before the 2013 election. Press Council founder Ronald McDonald said in an opinion piece that this year's budget delivers a further $67 million in cuts on top of the $87 million delivered by the government's three-year funding freeze. On the 29th of June, the ABC's media watch outlined the full impact of the cuts so far. 
They explained that shows like Four Corners, Media Watch, Australian Story and Foreign Correspondent would have to cut the number of episodes made and would have less money for travel to produce episodes. 74 jobs will be lost from ABC News and a further 53 jobs from the entertainment and specialist team impacting dramas, kids' programs and shows such Thank as Growing Media Magazine. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, I will now give the call to Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to join my colleagues in speaking to this bill. Uh, a number of Labor colleagues have already done so, and like them, I indicated at the outset that Labor will be supporting these bills, uh, but not without reservation and not without making some comments about this year's budget and, uh, most importantly, what it does not do. Uh, as my colleague Senator Billick has just outlined in her contribution, even before the COVID pandemic hit our shores, the Australian economy was performing below par. Uh, if you speak to any Australian worker, they would be able to tell you that their wages have not been growing in recent years, and the data backs that up. The data backs up Australian workers' experience, which is that wages under this government have grown at a lower rate than we have ever seen in this history. Uh, and I know I've seen many graphs which indicate that while some in the economy are doing well, particularly in corporate Australia, that those benefits have not been shared equally with the working men and women who actually drive and achieve those profits. We have seen in recent years uh, significant growth in corporate profits, which are being shared with shareholders in the form of dividends being shared with executives in the form of bonuses, uh, but not being shared with the working men and women whose daily work is what actually produces those profits. And it's about time this government took some action to make sure that the economic benefits that some in this country have received in recent years are being more fairly shared. One of the reasons for that is that we continue to see far too much insecure work in this country. This is something that we've been talking about at length for a long, long time over here, and we continue to see this government fail to take any action to ensure that Australians' work is more secure, that they have a more even bargaining position when they are trying to achieve wage rises. Uh, and it's no surprise, therefore, that wages continue uh, to be not growing in this country in the way that they should be. And of course, that situation is only being exacerbated now that we have the pandemic having hit, uh, wreaking havoc across the economy. And again, it's working Australians who are bearing the brunt of the recession that this government is, has overseen. It's working Australians who are losing their jobs, whose wages are still not growing, and who remain in fear of hanging on to their jobs if indeed they have so far been able to retain their jobs. Even in the time today since I agreed to speak on this bill, we saw another announcement from another big Australian company indicating that more jobs are going to go. And of course, I'm talking about Qantas. I'm pretty disgusted, frankly, with the actions of the Qantas management, uh, who themselves receive salaries in the millions of dollars along with bonuses as well, but continue to strip jobs and outsource jobs from their own company. And it's another, it is outrageous, Senator Polly. Uh, and it's another example of what I was talking about earlier, which is that we are not seeing an even bargain between working people in this country and high-flying executives on their high-flying salaries. We've seen today again Qantas say that they will be outsourcing 2,000 more jobs uh, particularly amount amongst ground staff and baggage handlers. And that, of course, comes on top of the, the thousands of redundancies that Qantas has already announced. Now, no one is denying that Qantas, along with other aviation companies, anyone exposed to the tourism industry, is doing it tough right now. But why is it always working people who have to pay the price of this? And Qantas's Qantas motives can be seen quite clearly in the statements they have made today which indicate that the reason they have done, made this decision to outsource 2,000 more jobs is to cut costs, which can only mean that those workers end up being paid less. 
And again, we have this government stand by, allow corporate Australia to take these kinds of actions at the expense of working people, and this is going to make the recession worse. Just as the government's own decisions to exclude over a million workers from receiving the JobKeeper payment uh, have made the recession worse, just as the government's decision to reduce the JobKeeper payments and reduce the JobSeeker payments are making this recession worse by taking money out of the economy at the wrong time, at too early a time, just as those decisions from the government are going to make this, decision, this recession worse, the government's inaction when we continue to see big corporate players in this country lay off thousands of workers or come up with tricky contracting arrangements which will cut people's pay, that will make the recession worse. Now, the reason for that is that if these workers from Qantas are outsourced, and it does appear that that's going to occur, um, then they will be paid less. They will have less money in their pockets to spend in local businesses, which means that those businesses will themselves have to lay off more people. And again, that is going to make things worse. It's obviously going to be bad for those individual workers now, but it will actually mean less money flowing through the economy and more people lose their jobs. So I don't know how often we have to raise these issues with the government before they are prepared to take action, before they are prepared to stop withdrawing financial support in the form of cutting JobKeeper, cutting JobSeeker, letting Corporate Australia lay off thousands of people or cut their pay, because these things are going to make things worse. And you've been able to see over the course of the day various ministers from the Treasurer down starting to crow about what they think the national accounts figures might have in store for the country this week. You can see them already starting to prepare to tell us that everything's turned the corner, that everything's getting back on its feet. Well, if that's not a sign of how out of touch this government is, I don't know what is. Because if you talk to any Australian, they will tell you uh, that they are in fear of losing their job if they haven't lost it already. They are in fear of being able to meet their mortgage payments. I mean, only last week I was at my kids' sport talking with parents there who have been stood down for months who are very worried about what this government has got in store come March uh, in the form of JobKeeper payments and JobSeeker payments. So if we see any attempt from this government this week to crow about the economy turning the corner because of some data that we might get from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, that will be another sign that this government has completely lost touch with ordinary Australians who are doing it really tough right now because of the decisions that this government is making. We already see the most recent unemployment data shows us there are 7 per cent unemployed. You will be in continuation. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister tell the Senate who was the social services minister in 2016 when the robo-debt scheme was first introduced? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, I don't have the precise dates of various ministerial arrangements committed to memory. However, however, I am willing to uh, to assume, particularly given I assume this is meant to be a clever setup of the next question, uh, that Mr. Morrison would have been the minister at the time. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. And can minister advise who is the treasurer? that bragged that robo-debt was proof of the social welfare system being, quote, better managed, end quote. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, once again, uh, um, uh, Mr. President, unsurprisingly, I don't have the quotations of every single individual committed to, mo to memory, but I am again willing to assume, in terms of clever Labor Party tactics, uh, that Senator Wong already knows the answer uh, to that. Uh, that Senator Wong is, uh, is assuming the answer is Mr Morrison, that Senator Wong is assuming that the quest answer to the question is Mr Morrison. In fact, she already knows that that is probably the answer uh, to the question. Now, Senator Wong and everybody I would expect in this place would believe that debts ought to be recovered. Uh, now, obviously, there have been issues in relation to this matter. There have been issues in relation to this matter. The government has worked through those issues, including repayments in relation to it. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise who was the Prime Minister in 2020 when $1.2 billion was used to settle the claims of victims of this government's illegal robo-debt scheme? 
Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, as I just said, repayments have been made in relation to this program. A process has gone through. Repayments have been made. In no way should that take away from the fact that where, where claims are made order and repayments ought to be recovered, then governments ought to find ways to undertake and recover those funds. That's an important principle order. that ought not be lost, notwithstanding the challenges in relation to this program and the fact order that those repayments have had to be made. Order. 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 Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Order. Will the Minister, Order, Senator Keneally. Will Senator the Minister provide a response to the Senate on the Twitter post issued today by the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Brockman for his question. Uh, senators will have seen that the uh, Prime Minister has uh, this afternoon made a public statement in relation to uh, this social media post by the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing. Let me be clear that the Australian government has uh, called in the Chinese ambassador and sought an apology from the ambassador in relation to this tweet. It is an appalling, disgusting and outrageous piece of social media. It is a tweet which illustrates uh, the absolute scourge of disinformation and misinformation at, in social media, and it cannot be justified on any basis. As well as the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade conveying that message to the ambassador here, we will be conveying that message directly in Beijing through our ambassador. We have also asked Twitter to remove the tweet yeah, as yeah, an yeah. example of disinformation. I echo the Prime Minister's expression of pride in all Australians who serve in uniform and who have served in uniform. They do not deserve to be treated in this manner. It is the most egregious example of this sort of harmful conduct that I have seen in my time in the parliament, in my time in a ministerial portfolio uh, and, in fact, in anybody's uh, uh, viewing of social media in any context, Mr President. We have very clearly rejected uh, the premise upon which the tweet uh, or disinformation in this tweet is based. This government has invited the review of the Inspector General of the ADF. We are dealing with these issues openly, transparently and in a way in which you would expect in a liberal democracy like Australia. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Will the Minister explain why this tweet constitutes disinformation? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Brockman. The Australian government does not resile at all from our responsibilities and our obligations regarding our involvement in Afghanistan. It is not that another country is commenting on our conduct in Afghanistan. Australia is a robust liberal democracy, more than capable of dealing with commentary of that nature. We are accountable for our actions, and that is why we called for and held the inquiry at the highest levels. We are taking unprecedented and difficult steps to hold those responsible to account, a small minority of Australian Defence Force personnel that are the subject of these serious, credible reports. Our response has been welcomed by the government of Afghanistan from the President to his ministry and others within the Afghan system. This image, however, is an absolute affront to common decency and to our entire defence force. It is grossly offensive and it should be removed. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Will the minister update the Senate on how Australia is working with international partners to combat disinformation? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And the relationship amongst responsible international partners uh, around the world to combat disinformation, particularly during the period of the COVID-19 pandemic, is a very important one. Just this week, we will be co-sponsoring co an event at the United Nations in New York on misinformation, which partners such as Latvia. Latvia led a joint statement in June, which we signed with 131 other countries, which warned that COVID-19 had, and I quote, created conditions that enabled the spread of disinformation 
fake news and doctored videos, and in this case I would say photographs, to foment violence, to divide communities. We committed in that statement to fighting the so-called infodemic. I can assure you, Mr President, and others in this chamber that Australia will resist and counter efforts of disinformation. We will do so through facts and transparency underpinned by liberal democratic values that we will continue to promote at home and abroad. Senator Wong. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. Leave I, th granted. I thank the Senate and in the circumstance thought it would be useful to express support for the comments made by Senator Payne. Can I make clear on behalf of the opposition we condemn the action uh, taken by the Chinese government in the strongest terms. It is gratuitous, it is inflammatory and it is deeply offensive. And we say this is not the action, these are, this is not the behaviour of a responsible, mature international power. These tactics will be met with unified condemnation in the Australian community, and they will be judged harshly by the international community. The men and women of the Australian Defence Force serve with honour. They deserve our respect, the respect of our allies, friends and partners around the world. The allegations in the Brereton report have horrified Australia. What sets us apart is the dignified, transparent and accountable manner of our response. And that is what happens within the Australian democracy. I thank the Senator. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. In 2015, then Social Services Minister Scott Morrison targeted vulnerable Australians through his illegal robo-debt scheme in an attempt to achieve $4.7 billion in savings to bolster the, bottom, uh, the budget bottom line. Why? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Gallagher for her question. Um, clearly, um, the decision of many governments previous um, to Make sure that Australians make sure that Australians um, who have received money Order. from the taxpayer Order. for which that they were not entitled. There is an expectation by the Australian public that the governments will seek to recover Order. that debt. Um, and one of the measures which was put in place um, by the previous government and, and subsequently um, was, was, was undertaken um, by the government of which I am now a member Senator was to Watt. use a form of, uh, of uh, determination called income averaging. We subsequently know, we subsequently know and acknowledge that that me method by which we determined debts was deemed not to be valid. Senator and Keneally. we acknowledge that it was not it was determined not to Senator be valid. Keneally. And and I believe Senator that the Prime Minister has actually apologised to those people who Senator have been impacted by that form of uh, of uh, debt collection. However, as soon as we became aware that that method Order. of debt collection was not valid, we immediately Order. ceased collecting funds by that Senator means and put in place a very, very quick uh, responsive program to order by on which we would occasions. pay back Australians who had received debt notices as a result of using income averaging as the means by which to determine that debt. So um, to stand order. before you today, I mean we are not the only government to have used Senator income O'Neill. averaging as a means to, which we're to, to determine debt. Um, and in fact, um, I mean I, I can actually order. give you a number of quotes of uh, of people that still remain in this parliament that are members of your party who have made comments in relation to it. Um, you know, it's an example. In fact, I might wait to give the examples for the next question, so I've got more time. Order. Before I call you, Senator Gallagher, I'm going to insist that when I call a senator to order, they at least count to ten before they completely disobey the standing orders again. It's the first day of the last fortnight. It's going to be a very long one if people continue to behave like this, and it's going to make it hard for me to rule on points of order when I can't hear an answer. So I ask for a little bit of self-restraint on this first day. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The government was warned 76 times over a number of years by the AAT that its robo-debt notices were not legally enforceable. Why did Mr Morrison and the government ignore these warnings? Order. Senator Rustin. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, um, Senator Gallagher. Well, first of all, the government does value the role um, that the AAT does in providing independent merits reviews. 
offer a wide range of administrative traditions, but noting in each case that they are unique and they return on the absolute Order. facts of that case. Um, and there have been decisions Order. of the AAT that have upheld those decisions, and there have been decisions of the AAT that have not been upheld. And to suggest that every Senator single Anil. case that goes before the AAT is the same as the last one fails to understand Order. the process that exists at the AAT. So I would draw the attention to the senator who asked the question that, as I said in my answer to my previous question, as soon as this government became aware that using income averaging was not a valid means by which to collect a debt, Order, they senator ceased Anil. that program and immediately commenced a program of repaying that money to people who Order. had received. I'll call Senator Gallagher when I can hear her. Senator Gallagher, a final Thank supplementary you, question. Thank you, Mr President. Yes. As Social Services Minister, Treasurer and then Prime Minister, Mr Morrison has continued to persist with this illegal scheme. Why did he just ignore not only the warnings but the painful consequences for so many Australians? Senator Gallagher. Oh, sorry, sorry, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, um, I would put on the record that the Prime Minister has expressed um, his regret to those people that have been impacted by um, this particular um, activity, which, um, which we have acknowledged um, has been deemed as not being a valid means by which to, co to collect debts. I mean, we don't want shy away from the fact that it has been found that this is not a valid means by which to, to generate a debt. Um, you know, there is no argument, and we have apologised for the re and, and re shown regret for the consequences of doing that. But let us remind everybody in this chamber that this method of determining debts is not something that we came up with. In fact, it was under your watch. And I will, um, I will quote the then Minister for Human and services back in your government, Tanya Plebersek, uh, from the other place, who said, if people fail to come to an Order. arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. We support Mrs. Ms. Plebersek's view on this 100%. Order, Senator Rustin. Time has expired. Order on my left, Senator McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister outline for the Senate how the Morrison government's record economic support has kept Australians in jobs and connected to their employers, helping to drive our comeback and build a stronger Australia after the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for his question. Uh, Mr President, there is no doubt that the economy is still recovering from COVID-19, and as the Prime Minister has said, there is still a long road ahead. And in fact, when you look at some sectors such as tourism and aviation, they are still facing significant challenges. Uh, but when you look at JobKeeper and the purpose of the JobKeeper payment, it has and continues to keep so many businesses in business and so many Australians in jobs. In fact, the RBA has said JobKeeper saved at least 700,000 jobs, and if it weren't for the JobKeeper payment, the unemployment rate in Australia would have been five percentage points higher. That's right, Mr. President, five percentage points higher. With the recovery now underway, what we're now seeing, though, is that fewer businesses are actually in need of JobKeeper. That said, of course, Senator Job Keeper Watt. continues to support the sectors of the economy that do need Senator it the Watt. most. Mr. President, following a retest of business eligibility for the second phase of JobKeeper, for the two JobKeeper fortnights in October, around half a million entities have had applications processed, covering more than 1.5 million employees or eligible business participants. The preliminary data indicates that around 450,000 fewer businesses and around 2 million fewer employees qualified for JobKeeper in October as opposed to September. These preliminary October JobKeeper figures suggest an improvement on the 2020-2021 budget assumption of 2.2 million recipients for the December quarter. 
with around 700,000 fewer employees or eligible business participants covered by the payment in October due to their employer no longer needing Order. the Senator payment. Cash. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In addition to the job saving support of JobKeeper, how has the government's economic support measures assisted businesses with their cash flow, kept Australians in training, and supported Australians with the cost of living? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Our number one priority as a government is, of course, to protect the health of Australians to protect their jobs and to protect their livelihoods. And we've put in place and delivered the policies that are supporting this. For example, in addition to the $70 billion JobKeeper payments to date, our supporting apprentices and uh, trainees wage subsidy has now delivered over $723 million to keep over 103,000 apprentices and trainees in training. And that's where we need them, Mr President. We need them on the job, in training, and that's what we are doing. We also, as you know, though, have the cash flow boost. That has delivered over $32 billion to more than 800,000 employing small and medium businesses, giving them that vital cash flow when they need it at most. And of course, the SME Guarantee Scheme has delivered now more than 21,000 underwritten loans to small and medium businesses. We are putting in place the policies Order. to Senator keep businesses Cash. in business Time for and the Australians in jobs. Senator McLaughlin, a supplement, final supplementary question. With encouraging signs that the virus is now being contained across Australia, how will the government's economic recovery plan support Australians back into jobs and businesses to invest and grow and deliver a new generation of economic success? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as you'd be aware, COVID-19 has been an economic and health crisis unprecedented in the last century. In Australia, we took early and comprehensive measures, of course, to stabilise our economy in the face of lockdowns and the enormous health uncertainty that we were faced with earlier this year. The JobKeeper program, which is actually Australia's largest wage subsidy program, has been critical to keeping so many Australians in jobs and building the foundation of what is now our economic recovery. Encouragingly, with the economic recovery now underway, we are seeing fewer businesses in need of JobKeeper. Over the last five months in October, with the uh, labour force figures coming out, we've now seen around 650,000 jobs return to the labour market. And this includes almost 344,000 jobs for women and around 226,600 jobs for young Australians. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, uh, representing the Prime Minister. A new raft of temperature records were broken over this weekend with an intense and prolonged heat wave in spring. The Bureau of Meteorology has previously advised that your 2030 targets have Australia on track for upwards of four degrees of warming. So even if you meet and beat your targets, Australia will experience heat waves growing in frequency and intensity every single year, destroying crops, killing more coral, shutting down workplaces and claiming lives. Will the government lift its 2030 target in order to meet what the science requires? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Waters for her question. Um, initially, let me just make the observation, which is always important in terms of considering climate policy, uh, that uh, a single weeks or a single weekends or a single weather event uh, shouldn't, of course, be conflated immediately as a matter of climate change, which is not dismissing at all the longer-term trends and issues uh, that are reported and forecast by different agencies. In relation to emissions reduction in Australia, I think it is important to remember the relative success Australia has had in reducing our domestic emissions here in Australia when compared with other countries around the world. I, I, hear Senator Watts, I hear Senator Watts' comments. Australia's emissions are down 16.6 per cent since 2005. Down 16.6 per cent since 2005. Across comparable countries, across OECD nations, they've fallen by around 9 per cent. They've fallen by around 9 per cent. So we are running at nearly twice the rate of reduction compared with comparable countries. Indeed, other countries, allies and friends like Canada and New Zealand, who are often cited by the Greens or others on these matters, have barely shifted the dial 
in relation to their emissions, whilst Australia has seen a reduction of some 16.6 per cent. So Australia has delivered, is delivering and will continue to deliver when it comes to emissions reductions. Our country will beat our Kyoto-era targets by some 459 million tonnes in relation to abatement targets. That is a huge overachievement relative to the commitments we have made, and our ambition is well and truly not only to meet our Paris commitments, but to repeat our trajectory of meeting and beating as we did with Kyoto 1 and Kyoto 2. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Well, noting your reference to that 16.6 per cent figure, the quarterly emissions report released today shows that when you take out land use, which no other country uses in their figures, Australia's pollution is still higher than 2005 levels. The government's very proud of its figures today, but a pandemic is not a climate plan. Given gas is the main driver of pollution and risks our precious groundwater and farmland, will you dump your failed gas-led recovery? Senator Waters. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, gas plays a very important role in Australia's economy and in other economies in terms of enabling the transition from some fuels such as coal, which the Greens used to come in here and routinely talk about, to other fuels. Gas indeed has been a very important driver, not only in transitioning our economy and enabling stability and reliability in an energy system more reliant on renewable energy that comes with less reliability and needs to have dispatchable energy that can be scaled up when necessary, and gas plays a key role in that. The gas has increasingly played a role in relation to our other major trading partners being able to shift their emissions intensity in their economies as well. Gas plays a role in relation to Japan's emissions profile, to Korea's emissions profile. All of these key trading partners see gas as a crucial part of their own transition Order, Senator too. Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Eight out of every ten major businesses in Australia have today said that your 2030 target is inadequate and needs to be lifted. These are your people. Will the government attend President-elect Biden's promised climate summit to be held within 100 days of his swearing in and lift Australia's ambition, or will you push those businesses to instead invest outside Australia? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr. President. Well, we might wait for invitations before we decide what we're going to attend or not uh, in relation to, uh, to President-elect Biden, but, uh, but we do very much welcome the fact that the President-elect uh, has indicated uh, a strong commitment to invest in technology that fuels and powers change in relation to climate change. The President-elect's commitment in relation uh, to technology investment is consistent with our own commitment, with our own commitment of a $1.9 billion technology investment package in low emissions technologies. We see enormous complementarities between what President-elect Biden and our government are seeking to pursue in relation to how you achieve transformation in emissions, how you get improved outcomes in that regard. These are the crucial things that we will work and cooperate uh, with the Biden administration on, uh, and indeed we look forward to that engagement, particularly the complementarity with our largest investment partner and the ability in pursuing those Order, technologies Senator to Birmingham. cooperate Time for the at a private level as well expired. as the government. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. There are nearly 1 million Australians unemployed, 1.4 million underemployed and 2.8 million relying on government support, and unemployment is on the rise. How many of the 25,000 Australians who recently joined the unemployment queues were forced there because of the Morrison government's withdrawal of support? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr. President, our government, through this crisis period of the pandemic, has sought to respond not only to the health crisis and to achieve what are global leading results in terms of protecting Australians from the health risks of COVID-19, but we have also responded in unprecedented ways in terms of support for the Australian economy. And just as, just as the health results are amongst 
the best in the world in terms of the resilience that Australia has shown, so too are our economic results amongst the best in the world. That is not to say that there aren't Australians doing it very tough. There clearly are. And today we note the announcement by Qantas in relation to job losses that will be sustained at Qantas and changes that company is making to try to ensure its resilience into the future. Now, I, I hear the interjections from those opposite, Mr President, who seem to pretend that in a world where global aviation has been battered to its core, there is some easy solution in relation to, uh, to these matters. There's not, Mr President. You can't live in the fantasy world of those opposite. The reality is that we have put in place, through the JobKeeper mechanism, the single largest intervention in the Australian economy by a government in our peacetime history ever. And in doing so, we have helped to sustain and save many thousands of jobs. We've helped to sustain and save many thousands of businesses. But we said at the outset it was never going to be possible to save every single business or every single job, given the nature of the crisis that we face. But we are continuing Order. to invest, having created JobKeeper, extended JobKeeper, and of course now pursuing through our budget a range of policy measures designed to drive jobs growth in the economy, to help with the recovery and to Order. get people Senator back Birmingham, to work as quickly as possible. The answer has expired. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you. Last week, the Deputy Governor of the RBA warned the government to, and I quote, be careful of removing the stimulus too early. What is the economic impact of the Morrison government's decision to withdraw job seeker and job keeper in March? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we outlined at the beginning of the pandemic and our economic response that what we sought to apply were measures that were temporary, were targeted and were proportionate. They have been the principles that have guided the government's response through this crisis, with some $507 billion in financial support uh, for the Australian economy, representing some 25.6 per cent of GDP. That record level of support has provided a lifeline to so many individuals. But in terms of the temporary, targeted, proportionate nature, we have also been taking careful steps and decisions in relation to JobKeeper. Those careful steps and decisions have seen, and JobKeeper, those careful steps and decisions have seen JobKeeper go through a number of steps and iterations that do see eligibility. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. In the eight seconds the minister has left, I wonder if he could be directly relevant to the question, which was the economic impact of a decision to withdraw JobKeeper and JobSeeker in March. We've had a lot of process a lot of rhetoric, but there was a question which Australians are deeply interested in. Um, that question, Senator Wong, I've allowed you to remind the Minister of the question which followed a quotation regarding stimulus broadly from the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank. My notes reflect. I'm listening carefully to the Minister, but in my view, if he is talking about that policy, you can debate the answer after question time, but he is being directly relevant to the question because of the use of that quotation. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, as we've said at every step of this crisis, we will continue to monitor the impacts at each step of the decision making and we will make decisions accordingly. That's why we created Order. JobKeeper. It's Senator why we Birmingham, extended time it. for the answers expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In addition to the Reserve Bank, the OECD has also warned the Morrison government to avoid withdrawing vital support from the economy too early. How many Australians will lose their jobs? as a result of the Morrison government ignoring these warnings. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we have seen in the last five months some 650,000 jobs across the Australian economy recreated. This has, been, this has been a result of the type of measures that our government's put in place to give the economic stability and lifeline that Australia needed. The senator referenced the OECD in their different analysis in her question. Well, Mr President, if you want to look at the global comparisons, you see that economic growth in Australia did indeed in the June quarter contract by 7 per cent. However, if you look across comparable nations, we saw that in Germany it contracted by closer to 10 per cent. 
in Canada by closer to 11.5 per cent, by the US by more than 9 per cent, and by the UK by more than 20 per cent. Uh, and I hear Senator Gallagher say, well, that's comforting for the Australians who've lost their jobs. As I said in the primary question, we acknowledge this is difficult for many people, but this is a global pandemic we are responding to, Order. and our Senator government is applying unprecedented support to get Australians through it. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is for Minister for Finance, Trade, Tourism and Investment, Minister Birmingham. Australia has no market other than China for 30 per cent of Australia's exports and no alternative source for 20 per cent of Australia's imports. We have put too many eggs in the China basket with 40 per cent of all export dollars earned in China, and now we are subject to import bans on a range of Australian commodities, including Australian coal, barley, wine and lobsters. These restrictions are designed to hurt our economy until we make change to a raft of policies according to documents leaked by the Chinese Embassy in Canberra to news outlets. Australian businesses are suffering. When will the government admit its mistake and change course? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson for her question. These are very difficult times for many Australian businesses uh, who have uh, trade relations with China, uh, and the Australian government has expressed uh, deep concern at the fact that China, through a series of actions, uh, particularly through the course of this year, but some of them dating back uh, over a couple of years, has taken adverse action against Australia and Australian exporters. We absolutely oppose the actions that China has taken. We have sought very clearly uh, to engage China both in terms of the detail of the actions they have taken, but also to urge them to the table. As indeed the Prime Minister, Senator Payne, and with bipartisan support Senator Wong have indicated today, uh, we are also grievously offended by the actions of the Chinese Foreign Ministry in relation to the image and words they have posted on Twitter today. But our government has not just fostered open trading relations with China. We have equally fostered them uh, through a range of agreements struck with Japan, with the Republic of Korea, with Canada, with Mexico, with Peru, with Vietnam, with Indonesia. We have opened the door for trading relations for Australian businesses right around the world, and we pursue similar trade agreements with the European Union, the United Kingdom, and deeper trade relations with India and a range of other countries and markets. Ours is a market economy in which Australian businesses and companies make decisions about with whom they trade and where they trade, where they sell their goods to and from whom they buy what they choose to do. And under, those, uh, under those agreements and under the terms of our economy, we encourage businesses to get out there because what it's achieved is 33 consecutive months where Australia has exported more than we've imported as a nation. That's good news for Order. Australia. It's Senator been good Birmingham, news for businesses, for the and we want that to has continue. expired. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. This morning, Minister, you refused to acknowledge that China was engaged in economic coercion against the people of Australia. Was this because you are afraid to stand up and tell the people of Australia the truth, or are you afraid of standing up to China? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I think you have heard in this chamber today from the words, indeed, of Senator Payne, uh, Senator Wong, myself, the Prime Minister earlier today, most importantly, uh, that the government is well and truly happy to stand up to China in those, uh, in those terms. Uh, and I have, for a long period of time, been expressing our concerns, firstly, about the individual actions that China has been taking, and more recently, about the cumulative effect of those actions. But it is important to note, Mr President, the statistic, as I said before, that month after month after month, Australian exporters and Australian businesses have been getting out to the world and selling more to the world and exporting more to the world than we have been importing. And they've been doing that under the network of trade agreements that our government and, indeed, previous governments have <coughs> negotiated. It is important, Mr President, that our businesses are able to continue to do that because one in five Australian jobs depends on trade, and we want to help support those jobs to continue to grow Order, in the Senator future Birmingham, across a range of markets. The answer expired. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you. China is boycotting our product with 80 ships lined up their shores with coal, full of coal. One Nation, many Australians believe that Chinese 
products should be boycotted over the Christmas period. Will the government lend their support to the boycott push or keep letting Australia push Australia around? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I think there are a range of implications that China faces from a number of its actions that it's been taking of late. The fact that China has created such a higher risk environment for businesses trading and working with them doesn't just reflect poorly on China in the eyes of Australians. It is a point being noted around the world and indeed China's actions around the world, not just towards Australia but towards other nations in terms of trade sanctions and other sanctions are being noted and reflecting poorly upon China. And that reflection will be seen in the eyes of both governments here and around the world and, no doubt, Senator Hanson, in the eyes of consumers who will make their choices about the products that they buy and the countries that they buy them from. Consumers, no doubt, will be mindful of the types of actions we've seen today in terms of those terrible, appalling, shocking images and that, I'm sure, will reverberate in their minds as they make those purchasing decisions. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the government is building a more secure Australia and preserving our regionally superior Collins-class submarine capability? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. Uh, and also for his support for our defence forces in Western Australia and for welcoming HMS Arunta home. Thank you. Australia rem submarines remain one of the most important capabilities in our defence force. The Collins-class submarines are only halfway through their life and they are now very, very capable. Capable of shaping, capable of deterring and also capable of responding to Australia's complex and very rapidly changing strategic environments. To preserve our Collins-class submarine, the Morrison government is very carefully considering the management of our entire submarine fleet over the next 50 years. We are ensuring that the Collins-class continues to remain regionally superior and well served and in service well into the 2030s. And we will continue to ensure that they exceed international benchmarks again for decades to come. This is achieved through planned upgrades and technological uh, upgrades done both in Western Australia and South Australia, implemented during full cycle, mid cycle and intermediate cycle docking. With Australian industry, we will grow our submarine capability ahead of the act attack class submarines transition uh, in the 2030s and out into the 2040s. Good management of this fleet has not always been the case. Never forget when we came into government in 2013, we inherited low submarine availability and Navy often struggled to get a single boat operational into, out to sea. There was no plan to upgrade and extend the life of our Collins-class submarines. No decision had been made on the future submarine sustainment and there was no naval shipbuilding and sustainment plan. But this government has turned the shipbuilding and sustainment industry into a truly national sovereign capability. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate what shipbuilding benefits uh, the coalition government has delivered to Western Australia since 2013? Senator Reynolds. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Mr President. Under this government's plan, naval shipbuilding Naval shipbuilding has gone from zero to booming in seven years. We are committed to building 45 vessels at Henderson worth around $16 billion. Already about $3 billion of contracts have been signed with WA shipbuilders. A $1.5 billion transformation of defence infrastructure at Henderson and at HMAS Stirling is well underway. And we are investing more than $300 million in new maritime tracking ranges off the coast of Perth. Hundreds, hundreds, in fact thousands, of new multi-generational jobs are being created across these programs throughout the supply chain in Western Australia. And I can assure all West Australians that all shipbuilding and sustainment decisions will be made for the right reasons at the right time in the national interest, and all Australians would expect nothing less. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank the Minister for that update. 
Good news for Western Australia. Can the minister advise the Senate what shipbuilding benefits the coalition government has delivered to South Australia since 2013? Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, thank you very much again, Mr President. Uh, under this government's plan, the coalition's government commitment to shipbuilding in South Australia has once and for all ended Labor's valley of death. Our record investment is building 23 of the world's most advanced naval platforms uh, at the new digital shipyards in Osborne. We have delivered the Hobart-class destroyers and have laid the foundations for continuous shipbuilding in Australia for many, many generations to come. This astonishing achievement in just seven short years has created thousands of jobs created new business opportunities in South Australia and has helped reinvigorate Australia's industrial landscape. These are jobs that our great-grandchildren and the workers in South Australia, their great-great-grandchildren, will still be working in these industries in South Australia. The people of South Australia can have confidence that they are at the forefront of this government's plan to ensure Australia has Order. the maritime Senator Reynolds, capabilities time we for need. The answer has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Former Minister for Finance Matthias Cormann has been jetting across Europe in an RAAF plane to the tune of $4,300 an hour to interview for his next job. What does the minister say to the nearly 37,000 Australians stranded overseas who are watching a former minister of the Morrison government fly around at taxpayer expense while they remain stranded overseas and are likely to miss Christmas with their families? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, let me firstly deal with returning Australians and then I'll ret return to the issue of Mr Cormann and the OECD. Mr President, in relation to returning Australians, it is well known, well known that the prime constraint in relation to getting more people into Australia are the quarantine facilities Order. and their availability within Order. Australia. Our government, our government, thanks, our government thanks the states and territories for working with us in relation to increasing the numbers of quarantine places. Senator we Keneally. thank the fact that, working with the states and territories, we have been able to grow the number of returning Australians on a regular basis. And we welcome the fact that, when Victoria is able to again increase or welcome returning Australians and house them in hotel quarantine, then we will be in a position to see a further growth from around 5,600 currently processed to around 5,700. This is Order about on my see, those opposite, Mr. President. Those opposite seem to somehow think Senator Walls. they seem to somehow think that hotel quarantine Order. is an easy, safe thing, and that we can just pile more and more and more Order. and more and more in, and then there's no consequence to it. And there's no consequence to it. Well, I think the people of Victoria have seen there's a consequence to it. The people of South Australia have seen there's a consequence to it. So there are absolutely real issues when it comes to how we safely return Australians to Australia. Order In no way do we wash our left. hands of it, Senator Wong. On In no order. way do we wash our hands. We absolutely are working closely with Senator the states Wong. and territories. We've put ADF troops on the line Senator to work Wong. with them. We've grown the number of places. We're getting more Australians home. We are doing that as quickly as is possible while keeping Australia safe from COVID at the same time. I'm going to Senator Keneally. Senator Keneally, please resume your seat for a moment. On num Senator Wong, on numerous occasions there, I was calling senators to order. This will become a very miserable two weeks if people don't have some basic decency so that I may hear answers for inevitable points of order. You're quite right, Senator Wong. Um, Senator Birmingham does have a very strong voice. I still had trouble hearing him. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Mr. President, Mr. Morrison defended the $4,300 an hour on a private plane, saying, and I quote, if Matthias was flying around on a commercial plane, he would have gotten COVID. The risk of that was extremely high. 
Can the minister explain to the nearly 37,000 stranded Australians why Mr Morrison believes it's acceptable for them to fly commercially at hugely inflated prices and face the extremely high risk of contracting COVID-19, but it's not okay for a former member of his government? Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, not only do those opposite seem to think that there's some magic solution to be able to increase the available of safe entry points Order. into Australia, not only do they ignore the fact that there are charter Order. flights and supported commercial Senator arrangements Keneally. that our government has put in place, but they also bring the most small-minded little Australia attitude to our candidacy for the OECD. I mean, having come out and supported the candidacy initially, they now seem to want us to run a campaign in a half-baked way intended to somehow lose. Now, Australia having decided to field a candidate Order. for this position, to field a candidate for this position is intended to campaign in a way to win, Mr. President. That's what's important. To actually make sure that having put Australia out there to win, we get on and do so. And so, Mr. President, we are supporting this candidacy. We're doing so because it will help Australia in the long term to influence the result. Order, Senator Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Last week. Stranded Australians appearing before the Senate COVID-19 Select Committee referred to the Morrison government's decision to fly Matthias Cormann in an RAAF plane as, and I quote, appalling and an old mates club. Are they wrong? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, we have absolute sympathy for the plight of many Australians overseas. And it is, why, it is why we have worked to increase those quarantine places, put in place more supported flights and, indeed, provide targeted assistance in a range of different ways. But in relation to support for candidacies, we think this is a thing that Australian governments consistently should provide. Indeed, if we look back, I can see that Gareth Evans was provided with some $250,000 of support in 1999 dollar terms, $250,000 of support for his Order. candidacy, for his candidacy by the order. Howard government Senator Birmingham, to I'm, UNESCO. Senator Birmingham, I've got Senator Keneally on a point of order. Senator Keneally, order uh, a is point relevance. of order. My point of order is relevance. In no time did I mention 1995 or Gareth Evans. There are 37,000 stranded order. Australians. Senator that number Keneally, has doubled, please resume your seat. Resume your seat. Quite frankly, if you want to keep showing this amount of disrespect to the chair on the first day of the last fortnight, it's going to be a very slow question time as I constantly interrupt questions and answers. I do ask, while it is a very vibrant chamber, for people to at least heed me and pay a little bit of respect to the chair when I'm calling people to order. Now, on the point of order, Senator Keneally. Um, your question contained a number of pejorative phrases uh, in terms of quoting people. Um, when questions contain pejorative phrases, I am listening carefully, but in comparison, for example, to the first question asked today, which was, which was very specific, there was no latitude for the minister to stray. But when questions contain politically loaded phrases, I don't think it is um, out of order for a minister to be able to um, respond in kind. That said, this was a quotation, not an assertion on your behalf. I accept that. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. He has 15 seconds remaining to address the question. Mr President, we absolutely are giving all the support we can to get returning Australians home safely, whilst not jeopardising the safety of people in Australia or our economy in terms of the number of places that are available to get people back Order, safely Senator and Senator Birmingham, securely. time for the answer has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is ensuring survivors of institutional child sexual abuse are able to receive redress? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Askew, for that very important question. And it is particularly timely um, since the government um, 
myself, together with the, uh, the Assistant Minister Sazelja, uh, announced on Friday that we would be introducing legislation uh, and regulatory reform to strip institutions who fail to under accept their responsibility to join the redress scheme of their charitable status. Uh, this was a commitment that the Prime Minister made earlier this year uh, to survivors, and it is one that we are absolutely determined that we will fulfil. So, uh, once the, the legislation and the regulations have gone through this place, no charitable or religious organisation or institution will be able to benefit from taxation concessions while victims of, uh, and survivors of child sexual abuse continue to be denied the redress that they so rightly deserve. To date, 129 charities have been identified as being named in applications in the scheme who have not yet joined the scheme. Whilst I acknowledge that many of those organisations are currently in the process of onboarding, uh, we already know that there was one charitable organisation that was named in the July statement this year who has absolutely refused to accept their responsibility um, for the abuse that was, um, was uh, uh, undertaken. Uh, in their institution. The Prime Minister has been absolutely clear in his statement that anybody who is named in the Royal Commission or who has an application lodged against them must do everything in their power to join the redress scheme so that we are in a position to be able to provide the redress to survivors that they so justly deserve. And I'd like to take this opportunity to remind the 80 charitable institutions who currently are in the process of onboarding, who gave a commitment that they would onboard by the 31st of December 2020, uh, that they have until the 31st of December, and if they do not join in that time, they will be named and shamed, and full sanctions will be taken against them. Senator, ask your supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how do the changes assist the government in signing institutions up to the redress scheme? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Um, look, we know this is a particularly complex area, um, and I'm very pleased to be able to say that we've actually taken a two-pronged approach to ensure that we are able to get access to survivors and make sure that no survivor is left behind. Firstly, we'll be amending the Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission regulatory framework to require all charities to, have, uh, to participate in the scheme if a claim has made, been made against them or is likely to be made against them. Um, should that charity fail to take reasonable steps, that will mean that they do not meet their requirements and will be subject to the full suite of existing compliance powers, which includes deregistration as a charity. This would mean that they will no longer be able to get access to the favourable taxation concessions like income tax, fringe benefits tax and direct recipient status. It I hope will make those uh, charities think twice. And further, we will also be making sure that basic religious charities are put into the same bucket Order. as other charities. Senator Rustin, Senator ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you. How does this important change add to other measures the government has implemented to ensure institutions do not shirk their moral obligations? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, we already have been able to make 4,200 payments, um, but we understand that more needs to be done, and that's why we are putting these very strong sanctions in place. Because if the, just the thought of being named and shamed isn't enough, then hopefully the financial penalty that this will do will make sure that people understand their responsibility and that this government is absolutely serious. Um, we have made it uh, absolutely clear that we expect any institution that was named in the Royal Commission uh, to join and any institution that has been named in an application from a survivor. We want them to join the scheme and we want to make sure that we have every power to compel them to do so. Um, we have also made it very clear that any institution who fails to join the scheme who is receiving government funding will no longer be eligible to be able to receive that funding. And I may remain absolutely committed to name and shame every single institution that does not accept their responsibility to survivors of child sexual abuse and give them the redress they deserve. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm the government received 14 official reports of robo-debt victims threatening self-harm on 7 January 2017, 13 July 2017, 1 August 2017, 8 August 2017, 28 August 2017, 30 August 2017, 6 October 2017, 23 October 2017, 
26 October 2017, 6 November 2017, 7 August 2018, 24 September 2018, 6 November 2018 and 11 December 2018. The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McCarthy for her question. Senator McCarthy, I do not have the information that you've required with me today. However, I will take the specific um, answers to the detailed uh, question that you asked in, uh, in relation to the, each and every one of those individual incidents of which you have just um, quoted. But um, I would also make the point that this is a very delicate and sensitive area um, and that we need to be mindful that we handle any issue when it comes to um, actions uh, that and we need to and I suppose I would warn everyone Order. opposite that um, this talking about this particular issue Senator requires Anil. great sensitivity and I'd caution anyone to be making unfounded conclusions to continue to perpetuate the upset and trauma that is inflicted on the loved ones. Order. Senator, McCar Order. Senator McCarthy is on her feet. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Has the minister asked the department for a report on how many Australians died by suicide as a result of the government's illegal robo-debt scheme? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, as I said, we need to be very careful and very sensitive, and anybody um, who uh, dies by suicide is, is a tragedy, and I, I want to say that up front. But, Senator McCarthy, I, I reject the premise of your question in saying that, because uh, I, I believe it is absolutely incorrect for you to interpret um, Centrelink customer death statistics as, as suicides. These are all individual people, individual cases, and all deserve the respect to not just be spoken about as a statistic. We know, we know, Senator McCarthy, um, that um, Order. as of oh, Order. That, that there are a number of people um, who are deceased customers who esta whose estates are entitled uh, to a refund under the income compliance program. And those people will receive their refunds, as will everybody else in the income order. compliance Senator program. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, the question was asked with the sensitivity that this minister is urging. And what Senator McCarthy asked, and I, the point of order is direct relevance, is whether a report, uh, whether the minister had sought a report uh, about those who might have died by suicide as a consequence of being pursued under the illegal scheme. So we haven't asked about refunds. We've asked whether or not there has been a report asked for around the effects of the scheme. On the point of order, I've allowed you to restate the question there, Senator Wong. Um, while the minister was talking about this sensitive matter in substance, I do consider her to be directly relevant. You've restated the question. She has four seconds remaining to answer, or have you concluded? Oh, Senator Rustin has concluded the answer. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Minister, why did the government persist with the Prime Minister's robo-debt scheme when it knew it was illegal and there were reports of self-harm and suicide? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, and, and as I said to uh, a previous question that was asked from me um, by those on the other side, um, that when it became, we became aware that the income compliance program, which used income averaging as the sole determining factor for determining a debt, we ceased that program. We ceased that program and we commenced immediately putting in place a program to repay those debts. Um, we have nearly completed that program um, and we are just working through the final stages to make sure that anybody who had debt was, uh, was raised as a result of income averaging is now in the process of receiving that refund. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers given to, by Senators Birmingham and Rustin to the questions asked by Senators Wong, Gallagher and McCarthy. And, uh, 
In a feat of contortionism I don't think I've quite ever witnessed in this place, Senator Birmingham was unable to answer any of the three questions asked by Senator Wong with the truth. So let's just get it on the record. Senator Wong did ask, can the minister tell the Senate who was the social service minister in 2016 when the robo-debt scheme was first introduced? And for those who want to know the truth, the answer is Mr Scott Morrison. The second question that was asked of uh, Senator Birmingham by uh, the leader of uh, the opposition here in the Senate, Senator Wong, was who was the treasurer in 2016 and bragged that robo-debt was proof of the social welfare system being better managed. And the answer to that question is Mr Scott Morrison. Finally, Senator Wong asked Mr. Mr. Uh, Minister Birmingham, can the minister advise who was the prime minister in 2020 when $1.2 billion was used to settle the claims of victims of the government's illegal robo-debt scheme? And again, the trifecta, the answer was Mr Scott Morrison. And Australians should never forget that the prime minister was the man who cooked up the robo-debt scheme. He was the treasurer who bragged about using robo-debt to reduce Australia's debt, preying on very vulnerable people in the most egregious way. And he is the Prime Minister right at this moment when the biggest payout for a failing of a government is making history. $1.2 billion was assigned by the courts to give compensation for people who were caught up in the scheme of Mr Morrison's design of his implementation and now a very, very belated clean-up. I want to deal with the constant mistruth that we keep hearing from Senator Rustin with regard to this robo-debt scheme being a common practice and the absolute uh, untruth that she tells when she said that this was a practice established by the Labor Party. I want to make it very, very clear that the Labor Party did check to see if there was a signal of a mismatch between what was on the record in the Department of Social Services and in the ATO. And if there was a mismatch, the public servants then absolutely did the work to confirm the facts. The reality is there were 20,000 per year. 20,000 Australians per year who were investigated using that scheme. But the minute Mr Morrison got his hands on it, let me tell you how many illegal debts were being delivered to Australian people per week. 20,000 Australian people served a debt from their own government, an illegally constructed debt. That lie that is constantly being told that it was once the same under a Labor government must end. It is nowhere near the truth. Mr Morrison is responsible for the construction of the robo-debt debacle. He is the Treasurer who banked the savings at the expense of the Australian people, and he is the Prime Minister who, is, who must be held responsible for the impact on the great Australian nation. Senator McCarthy asked Senator Rustin a very sensitive question. And Senator, McCarthy's, uh, Senator Rustin's response was to lower her voice and talk about suicide and self-harm as a sensitive and delicate matter. Well, it is indeed. It's a very sensitive matter, and it matters very much to people who've lost loved ones because they couldn't stand the pressure of the debt and the debt notices and the debt collectors that were sent upon them by their own government. And the government has continued to deny that people self-harmed and in desperation took their lives because of Mr Morrison, because he cooked up the scheme, because he delivered it as treasurer and because he backed it in as prime minister on at least 76 occasions when the AAT knew that they were doing the wrong thing and told the government. This is a government that must hang its head Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Your people time should has kick them out on this. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, 
uh, and thank you for this opportunity to contribute um, to this important issue. Uh, I think the, the, the conclusion there to Senator O'Neill's uh, speech uh, indicates the objectives of the other side here. Senator O'Neill was most passionate when she was uh, accusing the Prime Minister of certain ills, not, uh, not uh, when she was seeking to uh, uh, defend or pursue the interests of, of average Australians. Clearly, the objective here uh, of the opposition is not to help people uh, but to hurt the Prime Minister. That is what they, the approach they have taken here. In fact, in her very first contribution, Senator O'Neill accused uh, the government and, and others, the Prime Minister and others, of being untruthful. Uh, and then uh, she herself went on to make clearly untruthful statements uh, uh, at the very time she was accusing others of being untruthful. She, she, Senator O'Neill mentioned that, um, uh, that, in her view, Minister Birmingham did not provide truthful responses to the answers given today, well, to the questions given today. Sorry, one of the um, questions that she claimed there was no response to was who was the social services minister in 2016. Well, despite a simple Google search being able to provide the answer to that, uh, Minister Birmingham did mention uh, Mr Scott Morrison in answer to that question. I distinctly, despite the heckling from the other side, it was hard to often hear half of what uh, was being said uh, uh, by ministers this afternoon. Uh, I did distinctly hear uh, Minister Birmingham, the Leader of the Government of the Senate, say that Yes, Mr Morrison was the Social Services Minister in 2016. That was a very useful uh, part of question time this afternoon. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, the, unlike the opposition, the, the government's focus now is on, on helping those uh, uh, that have been put in this situation. The, the Prime Minister has apologised for the hurt and harm that uh, uh, has been caused uh, by the issues with this uh, program. And, the focus now of the government is on ensuring that people receive the relief as soon as possible. Uh, uh, we know and have been transparent about the fact that around 525,000 debts have been wholly or partially uh, raised using income averaging. The total amounts of the, the refunds being provided uh, because of these debts are uh, set at around $741 million. They, they involve or, or around 430,000 Australians will have their debts zeroed through this process um, uh, and approximately 378,000 of those uh, will receive a refund. The, the balance hadn't actually uh, made a repayment, so there will be no direct refund, of course, but the debt will be wiped. <coughs> um, as of the 27th of November, 406, just over 406,000 people have had their refunds completed. With a total of $707 million paid. So, by, well, not mentioned here in my notes, by my math, that, that leaves around 23 to 24,000 people uh, still uh, to process their debts. But uh, the vast majority, about 95,000, oh, sorry, 95 per cent of people and 95 per cent of refunds by value have now been uh, processed. And that's going to continue to remain the, the, uh, the focus of the government, including through the uh, the settlement that has been reached uh, in the class action with Gordon Legal. Uh, uh, and that should be the focus of any government because uh, if the opposition were true uh, to their claims to, to care about the impacts of these issues on people, uh, uh, what we should be now is, f is focused on that relief, focused on providing uh, that uh, assistance to people in this circumstance. It is still very important, of course, that we continue to maintain the integrity of our welfare system. Uh, uh, the Australian government spends $180 billion a year uh, on welfare, and uh, support for such welfare programs uh, is reliant on making sure uh, that that money is spent on those who truly need it. Uh, there are, of course, those who do seek to defraud uh, the Commonwealth, uh, 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 and it is important that there are compliance activities. Uh, to stamp out such fraud, penalise such fraud when and, uh, it does occur. And, and all governments uh, for decades have pursued uh, such anti-fraud programs. And I'm confident that all governments in the future, including if there is to be a Labor government in the future, will continue to do so because we support our welfare system, we support its integrity and will continue to operate in the best way we can. Thank you, Senator Canavan.
I'm oh, Senator Billy, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. So I speak today about the minister's completely underwhelming response to the questions about robo debt today. And we all know robo debt's been an unparalleled disaster. It was illegal and it was executed atrociously. Hundreds of thousands of Australians had to go through unnecessary stress and heartache of disproving their liability for debts that they didn't even owe. And while governments have previously matched ATO data with Centrelink data, this government automated it and took, it, took out the human oversight element, um, moving from 20,000 cases a year to 20,000 cases a week. I'm a member of the Community Affairs References Committee and we've handed down the third interim report on the Centrelink's compliance program, or robo-debts, uh, as it's known. And we heard evidence and read submission from witnesses whose lives were completely devastated by this program. Now, let's remember the government's intent was to rip hundreds of millions of dollars out of the pockets of people that have been on extremely low income. They wanted to do everything they could to scrape together cash for their fantasy surplus, no matter how dubious the methods were. And instead, they've now been ordered to drop the debts, repay discredited debts which were already paid, and pay millions in compensation and legal fees, resulting in costing taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars in government legal and administrative costs. Robo-debt was illegal. It was against the law. There is no if, buts or maybe. It wasn't just legally insufficient, as a government official tried telling me in, in, in a hearing into robo-debt. It was plain illegal. And the government's explanations today just aren't good enough. People were treated as cheats and debtors by their government. In fact, 430,000 people were treated like this. Yeah, 430,000 people um, who paid the government when they didn't owe them a cent. This is money that they usually use to pay for rent, electricity, food and other daily basic living expenses. And these people went through enormous stress and suffering. People died. People committed suicide. Lives were ruined by this program. And now, today, in question time, the government are warning us about speaking about it out of a sense of respect. Well, it's a shame they didn't have that same sense of respect when they were harassing people. And we all know whose brainchild robo debt was, and then who the treasurer was who announced it, and who the prime minister is, who didn't stop the implementation of his own botched policy. Yep, Mr Morrison for all three positions. And that probably explains why we can't find out what the government knew and when they knew it. Personally, I think there's a fair bit of protecting your own backside going on on that side of the chamber and maybe out of the Prime Minister's office. This should never have happened. It shouldn't have taken a class action on behalf of thousands of people to rectify the mistakes of this government. The government dragged its feet on the class actions for months and has spent years trying to defend the program, even though they were warned over 76 times over the years about their actions. So what I really don't understand is why the government had to get to the point of settlement instead of listening to victims' concerns. And I'll say it again, this must never be allowed to happen again. The government just settled on the cusp of the trial without admitting any liability, but obviously knowing they were wrong. And the Australian people really need and deserve to know who was responsible. We need to determine how it happened that ministers of the government either knew that the law was being broken and did nothing about it, or never bothered to find out that the law had been broken in the first place. And we need to discover how we got into the situation with senior public servants authorising a scheme which was illegal. Because if we don't do that, if we don't find out how this disaster occurred, how can we ensure that it won't happen again? So. We will continue to push, Labor will continue to push for a Royal Commission into robo-debt. It's the only appropriate outcome. And the government unjustly enriched itself with $720 million plus of people's money. And it did so at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars in administrative costs and legal fees, before having to hand all the funds they raised back and pay compensation. This process, this policy, this program, 
is incompetence at the highest level. And Australian taxpayers as robo uh, debt victims deserve an explanation for this. One. Thank you, Senator Billick. Your time has debt. expired. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mac, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, uh, and just in regards to Senator Billick's comments, uh, it was certainly not the intention of the government to take money out of people's pockets. The government pays out about $180 billion every year in social welfare payments. We have a responsibility to the taxpayer to ensure that those, those dollars are spent properly and to ensure they get to the people who need them. Now, you know, it's only a small percentage, but not everyone, uh, you know, th there is a need for compliance in the system to make sure that payments are made properly. And it's a bit hypocritical for those op opposite us, the Labor Party, who are responsible for over a thousand deaths at sea uh, that cost billions and billions of dollars uh, to uh, overcome that problem to start uh, accusing us of uh, being malicious or anything like that when their own time in government they were very, very inept at protecting uh, the lives of people. And indeed, many of the opposition front bench today, uh, who are on the front bench today, have actually come out and supported the idea of recovering over payments. And I will quote a couple of these people. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, tenure plebiscite, sorry, I'm not sure, is it member for Grainway? No, that's Sydney. Uh, she has come out and said, if people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. Uh, and we've also got uh, Senator, uh, uh, sorry, uh, member for Marybone, uh, Bill Shorten. The automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to, tax garnishee, to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers. And finally, there was uh, Chris Bowen, who's the member for—do we know? Um, I'm not sure. Senator Rennick, if yeah. you're not sure, just use Mr Chris Bowen? Or okay. Ms. Sorry, my apologies. It's appropriate um, as well. That's OK. Uh, it is important that the government explores different means of debt recovery to ensure that those who have received more money than they are entitled to repay their debt. Now, as uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ms. Plibersek and Mr. Bowen said, the government does have a responsibility to recover debts where people have been overpaid. And uh, as Mr. Shorten said, the automation of this process will free up resources. I also should say that, of course, the government recognises that the recovery of debt has to be done in a way that is lawful. And that is why the government has made uh, decisions uh, to make repayments. And, uh, and I should also note that on the 11th of June, the Prime Minister apologised in Parliament for any hurt and harm caused in the way the government has dealt with this issue. And um, uh, department officials uh, have also come out and echoed the set sentiments of the Prime Minister uh, at uh, recent inquiries. Um, there is no doubt errors were made in relation to the automation of the income compliance program, and these are being addressed, and we will make the repayments uh, to make sure that uh, just cause is served. However, you know, we, we shouldn't shy away from the importance of technology. As I said earlier, we pay over $180 billion uh, every year in social uh, welfare payments. Uh, there's over 1.2 million people uh, who receive income support. So, you know, if we want to, and, and you know, as the population grows, as payments get more complicated, uh, and I work in the tax side of things, and I must admit I've always found that easier than actually trying to understand all the different uh, social service payments. So I could understand if you're trying to do it manually, uh, over time these things get more and more complex. So, I think the fact that we are trying to automate the process uh, is something that should be applauded. And I ask you, would we go back uh, and turn off uh, internet banking, for example? Uh, I think we all enjoy the benefits of automation uh, in, re in, in return uh, uh, for uh, internet banking. Um, so, uh, you know, 
there's always, you know, un unfortunately, we've made mistakes this time, but we are working um, to improve that. And, and one of those things I would, th would like to see, and I've mentioned this before on many occasions, is the need for parallel runs when we do implement new systems. And I've discussed this many a time with other departments about the need to make Thank sure you, you double-check things. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. This government's robo-debt scheme is a travesty and a tragedy. The government knew the damage this illegal scheme was doing to the people, and the Prime Minister was forced to an into an apology and now a last-minute pre-trial admission conceding it owes robo-debt victims their money back plus compensation. This is likely to total more than $1 billion the government owes victims of the robo-debt scheme. The settlement for approximately 400,000 class action members is both the most costly and involves the most people of any settlement by an Australian government. But it is some form of justice for victims who have been treated terribly by the Morrison government. And for years, the Morrison government has been in denial about robo-debt's fairness and legality even after the defective robo-debt system has wreaked a trail of carnage across the nation, resulting in anxiety, poverty and even suicides. This dodgy scheme is more than what Christian Porter now calls legally insufficient. It has cost countless Australians their livelihoods and, in some cases, their lives. It's only after the prospect of coalition ministers such as former Minister for Human Services Alan Tudge having to take the witness stand to answer questions on what they knew that the government has now agreed to fairly pay back victims. There are so many dirty hands involved in this dodgy scheme. Scott Morrison, then Social Services Minister and then Treasurer, was a key architect of RoboDebt. Christian Porter, who became Social Services Minister, was also involved in Mr Robert. This government, the minister and this Prime Minister will not even answer the most basic questions about how this illegal robo-debt scheme was designed and implemented. The minister has dodged and ducked, thrown up flimsy claims of public interest immunity time after time after time, and just plain refused to answer questions about robo-debt. And the Prime Minister needs to step up and answer the questions about how robo-debt came into being and when the government was first made aware that what they were doing was actually illegal. He needs to answer the question about exactly how much this botched scheme cost the country. And he needs to make it very clear what they knew and when about the devastating impact the robo-debt scheme was having on individuals and the reports that were received about threats of self-harm. What is it about robo-debt's origins that the government does not want anyone to know? Were they told it was illegal and ignored the advice, or did they not check its legality at all before unleashing it on an unsuspecting public? How much extra in taxpayers' money has the Morrison government wasted fighting this unwinnable case? Only a royal commission into robo-debt will give the public the answers they deserve, and only a royal commission will give the families of those who took their own lives after falling victim to robo-debt some answers. This government has not even bothered to find out how many people have threatened self-harm or how many victims of robo-debt have tragically taken their own lives. You cannot refund the debt, and the government must immediately allow such an independent inquiry into the robo-debt scandal. Sunlight on how these hidden decisions were made is vital. It's needed to ensure the Australian public is never again exposed to whatever has gone horribly wrong here. It is extremely offensive to the Australian public that no one in this government is taking any responsibility for this $1.2 billion scam on the Australian people. Every day that no minister is stood down over this theft from the public is another argument for a robo-debt royal commission 
as the only route to accountability. And in the meantime, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, must explain what the consequences will be for ministers for their involvement in the single greatest social security scandal in this nation's history and the subsequent cover-up. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator O'Neill to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. Um, and I rise to take note of the response given to my question to the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Now, I asked about the climate emergency that we're in, given that we've just seen last night the hottest November. We've just had the two hottest November days, and we've had record-breaking temperatures recorded across this country as a heat wave uh, is due to uh, move across this continent over the coming days. And I mentioned that the Bureau of Meteorology have advised us on the record in Senate estimates that, in fact, the targets that this government have set for 2030 would have Australia on track for a four-degree rise or upwards of temperatures. Now, I don't think perhaps people appreciate the extent of devastation that a four-degree rise would cause. The Paris Agreement commits us to a two degree and a, aspire to a one and a half degree, and yet this government's policies have us on track for more than double that. That's a recipe for not just economic destruction and an awful lot of human misery, but it's a recipe for mass crop failure. It's a recipe for the rest of the reef bleaching after half the coral cover has already died from mass bleaching events, of which we've now had three in the last five years. Um, it's a recipe that we should be avoiding at all costs. So I ask the minister, will the government be reconsidering its 2030 targets in the light of what the science says is necessary to keep us all safe and um, to, to retain a livable society uh, and natural world? And what I got with the talking points that uh, emissions data released today shows that Australia's uh, dropped its emissions by 16.6 per cent. Well, I asked the minister about that very point because, in fact, when you take out the land use emissions that Australia uses but no other country uses, our emissions are higher than they were in 2005. There is not, in fact, there has not been a reduction at all. So once again, we see this government using dodgy accounting tricks to disguise what is patently obvious to most Australians that this government has no climate plan. It is completely in bed with the coal, oil and gas sector. And we know the extent of donations that flows to the coffers of this government, sadly also to the opposition party. We're up to, I think, it's $9.2 million um, from the fossil fuel uh, sector. And look what that buys. It buys inaction on the climate crisis. And it buys that devastation that we could so readily avoid with a rapid transition to 100 per cent jobs-rich, affordable, clean energy. We could be manufacturing those components domestically, creating more jobs. We could be running that manufacturing on clean renewable energy. We could be exporting that renewable energy and that renewable energy technology to the world. This is a recipe for us addressing the climate crisis, creating jobs, helping to rebuild after a pandemic. Uh, and helping to do our bit globally, because um, we see many of our trading partners are actually setting much stronger targets than we are, and in fact, many of them have set dates to exit fossil fuels. But this government has got its head completely in the sand. We've got that climate summit coming up soon, um, just ahead of the Glasgow climate summit, where 2030 targets need to be spoken of, and this government has given no indication whatsoever that it will uh, listen to the science and increase its targets. We are likely to be amongst folk like Saudi Arabia and Russia when it comes to our climate ambition. Now, that's embarrassing. We already have the uh, highest per capita emissions profile in the world. We still have that dubious honour. Uh, and yet we have such potential to turn that around. And when I put that to the minister, I just got the talking points. I got this obsession with gas. Apparently, gas is a transition fuel. Well, nobody believes that. It's not, in fact, the case. It is almost as dirty a fuel as coal. It wrecks farmland. It endangers groundwater. It often happens without First Nations consent. 
It is not a good way forward when we have reliable, clean, renewable alternatives that create more jobs and don't wreck, up, don't wreck the land. Obviously, the renewable sector doesn't donate enough to this government or the opposition to get more support, but it's pretty tragic that that's what's got to happen in order for science-based, evidence-based policies uh, to eventuate. So we live in hope of the government lifting its climate targets ahead of 2030 so that we can actually address the climate emergency and come out of this economic and health pandemic stronger. Uh, and with a long-term future we can be proud of. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the following bills, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. Um, Firstly, the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Extension of Coronavirus Support Bill 2020 and the VET Student Payment Arrangements Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2020. And I also table reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have these statements incorporated in hand. Thank you. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 11th of November 2020 of the Honourable Dame Margaret Georgina Constance Guilfoyle, AC, DBE, as a Senator for the State of Victoria and a Senator from the State of Victoria from 1971 until 1987. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thank you, Mr President. I move that the Senate records its deep sorrow at the death on 11 November 2020 of the Honourable Dame Margaret Georgina Constance Guilfoyle, AC, DBE, former Senator for Victoria and former Minister for Finance and Minister for Social Security, and places on record its gratitude for her dedicated service to the parliament and the nation, and tenders its profound sympathy to her family in their bereavement. Mr President, earlier this month we lost a Liberal Party and an Australian icon. We lost another woman who in Australia had made an extraordinary and leading contribution to shape the modern Australia that we live in today. Dame Margaret Guilfoyle was the first woman in Cabinet with a ministerial portfolio in an Australian government, the first woman from this place, the Senate, to serve in Cabinet, and the first woman to hold a major economic portfolio within the Australian government. She was a trailblazer, a pioneer, and her legacy has helped to encourage future generations to follow in her footsteps. Dame Margaret was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, in 1926, as one of three children to Elizabeth and William McCartney. Two years later, her family packed up their belongings and migrated to Australia, settling in Melbourne. At age 10, Dame Margaret's father passed away, leaving her mother to raise three young children alone. She would later reflect in life that this experience helped shape her views that a woman must be capable of independence seek education and that they should have the same political, economic and social rights as men. Dame Margaret was educated at Fairfield State School and Westgarth Central Business College. By age 15, she was working as a secretary while studying accountancy at night at Taylor's Institute of Advanced Studies and the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. By age 20, in 1946, Dame Margaret was a qualified accountant and chartered secretary working at the Overseas Corporation Australia, a firm that specialised in promoting Australian exports. A few years later, on 20 November 1952, Dame Margaret married Stanley Guilfoyle, a fellow accountant with whom she had three children. The Guilfoyles were active members of the Liberal Party, joining the South Camberwell branch in the 1950s. Dame Margaret undertook various roles within the women's section of the party, where she formed close relationships with Dame Ivy Wedgwood, who served as her mentor, Dame Elizabeth Couchman and Edith Haynes. Upon her retirement in 1970, Dame Ivy, Victoria's first female senator, encouraged Dame Margaret to stand for pre-selection to replace her. Dame Margaret followed that advice and went on to defeat 20 candidates and secured the second spot on the Liberal Senate ticket. All of those opponents in that pre-selection race were men. 
Her Senate election bid was successful, and on 1 July 1971, Dame Margaret entered the Australian Parliament as a Victorian Liberal senator. In her first speech to the Parliament, during a budget debate, quite fittingly, Dame Margaret displayed her financial and economic skills, analysing infrastructure costs, touching on mining industry matters, as well as expressing opinions across matters of the environment, pollution and population, and funding for the arts. Dame Margaret was especially passionate about the arts and a strong advocate for the development of an Australian Children's Film Foundation, which would create content that would enrich the lives of Australian children for many years to come. The foundation was established a number of years later in 1982, and Dame Margaret would go on to serve as a director of the foundation for over a decade, from 1989 to 2003. Serving in opposition, Dame Margaret served in a number of roles, including opposition spokesperson on the media and on education. A few short years later, in 1975, with the dismissal of the Whitlam government and the appointment of Malcolm Fraser as caretaker prime minister, Dame Margaret was made Minister for Education. Through that 1975 election campaign, Dame Margaret handed down the coalition's education policies. And of note, Joan Kerner, the then head of the Australian Council of State School Organisations, would later praise Dame Margaret's policies and the, and the role in which they played in supporting sound education policy in Australia. After the coalition victory in December 1975, Dame Margaret moved to the position of Minister for Social Security, a portfolio she would hold for five years. A reshuffle in 1976 saw Dame Margaret promoted to Cabinet and, in doing so, becoming Australia's first female Cabinet Minister to serve with portfolio. During her time in Social Security, Dame Margaret is well recorded in the history books as having worked hard to shield her portfolio from various spending cuts, engaging in fierce battles with then-Treasurer Philip Lynch. Indeed, she herself described that, to quote, Perhaps the nicest headline I have ever had during my time as a minister was one in a Sydney paper that said, Minister unhelpful. Unhelpful in cutting the programs that coherently gave income security to millions of people and maybe unhelpful in trying to persuade other ministers that there were essential matters that needed to be built upon and not destroyed from time to time. The welfare of women was central to her and she reminded colleagues often that 83 per cent of the payments made through her then department were made to women. Dame Margaret also oversaw major reform of the National Child Endowment Scheme. Renamed Family Allowance, it was paid directly to mothers and provided greater benefits to lower income families. She also ran the Office of Child Care and presided over a major expansion of government support for preschool, child care and after school care. In 1980, Dame Margaret was appointed Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire, and later that year, following the election, she was moved into the finance portfolio. Having spent the last years defending her portfolio from cuts, she was tasked with the responsibility of looking for savings. As Minister for Finance, Dame Margaret was known for her strong financial expertise and sound understanding of economic matters. She was appointed to the, to the Razor Gang, as it, uh, as it colloquially was known, and indeed was given by the then Prime Minister an expanded role as Finance Minister in the scrutiny of budgets. Then advisor to Prime Minister Fraser and later Cabinet Minister in the Howard government, David Kemp, fellow Victorian, noted of Dame Margaret in her role as Finance Minister and in budget setting and as a Cabinet Minister that, and I quote, she had a tremendous gift of making a strong political point very simply. She would be able to convince the Cabinet what would fly and what wouldn't, what they could get away with and what they couldn't, and what debate would be really tough to them if they wanted to take it on. Dame Margaret was a strong believer in the importance of independence for women, a tenet strongly related to her own, to her own childhood experiences. Of note, Dame Margaret made clear that she had no desire to hold the status of women portfolio. She saw the example that she set for the women who would follow her and the difference that she could make 
in critical portfolios, that those actions would have the greatest impact on future generations of Australian women. Three years after being appointed Minister for Finance, the Fraser government was defeated at the 1983 election. And while Dame Margaret stayed on to serve as Shadow Minister for Taxation, when the coalition failed to win the 1984 election, she requested not to be included in the new Shadow Cabinet and moved to the backbench. In June 1987, Dame Margaret retired from the Senate. In her final speech to the parliament, she noted that when she first entered the chamber, there were only two female senators, herself and Dame Nancy Butfield, who represented my great home state of South Australia. Dame Margaret and the groundbreaking women who served before and with her championed the equal participation of women in this parliament. In her own words, equal participation of women in the parliament in the whole of community life can only lead us to a better understanding of humanity and to the fulfilment of the aspirations that we would have for a civilised society. In 2019, the Senate reached gender equality in terms of representation. In part, this was achieved because of trailblazing women like Dame Margaret, who noted that it was important not that she was the first woman to hold a number of roles, but that she was not to be the last to have the opportunity. It would be 30 years after Dame Margaret left the Ministry of Finance before another would step into that portfolio, the Leader of the Opposition in this place, Senator Wong. After her retirement from politics, Dame Margaret served in a number of roles, including Chair of the Judicial Remuneration Tribunal, Deputy Chair of the Mental Health Research Institute and the Infertility Treatment Authority, President of the Royal Melbourne Hospital Board of Management and a member of the National Inquiry into the Human Rights of People with Mental Illness. In 2005, Dame Margaret was appointed a Companion of the Order of Australia for significant contributions to public life in Australia in support of hospital and health administration, social justice and education to young people as a role model and to the Australian Parliament. Dame Margaret holds a special place in the history of our nation. She was known as a formidable and capable cabinet minister who was dedicated to improving the lives of everyday Australians. In the words of the late Susan Ryan, another pioneer and advocate for equality, who we also lost this year, if anyone's performance should have established that a woman's place was in the cabinet, it was Margaret Guilfoyle's. Today, Margaret's husband, Stan, her children, Georgina, Anne and Geoffrey, and grandchildren, Hugo, Jennifer, Oliver and Elizabeth, on behalf of the Australian government and the Australian Senate, we offer our deepest condolences. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise on behalf of the opposition to express our condolences following the passing of the Honourable Dame Margaret Georgina Constance Guilfoyle, ACDBE, former Senator and Minister, at the age of 94. And I begin by expressing our sympathy on behalf of the opposition to her family and friends and to join with the government in this condolence motion. Well, Dame Margaret Guilfoyle is one of the highest ranking women to have served in an Australian government. She entered and succeeded in politics at a time when there were few other women in parliament, let alone around the cabinet table. Participating not at the periphery but at the centre, she would be a minister for the life of the Fraser government, briefly in education, before moving to social security and then in finance. And she was the first woman to be Australia's finance minister. It took 27 years and five governments before my appointment brought the next. Dame Margaret earned a reputation as a highly capable administrator, setting a standard that was a benchmark for those who followed. Born in Belfast in 1926, Dame Margaret immigrated to Australia with her family two years later, when she was not a child of privilege. Settling in Melbourne, the death of her father when she was 10 was a lesson in resilience. Her mother had to bring up three children without the support of extended family, for which Dame Margaret became a formative experience and perhaps led her to recognise the value of education and career for women. Leaving a state school at 15, she combined work and study and ultimately qualified as an accountant and chartered secretary. Of course, at this time, post-World War II, there was a shortage in this profession which enabled, helped her to establish a career where women would otherwise have faced even greater a number of barriers. Later, she would be able to point to her capacity to manage a career and family as, her evident, as evidence of her ability to manage a, a, a family and political life. 
Along with her husband, Stanley Guilfoyle, with whom she had three children, she joined her local branch of the Liberal Party and was active in the women's section of the party in particular. And she benefited from the mentoring of several feisty senior women who themselves had played a significant role in the formation of the party and who had a reputation for not suffering any nonsense from their brethren. And she would be pre-selected to replace one of these, Dame Ivy Wedgwood, to which my colleague Senator Birmingham has referred the first woman to represent Victoria in the Senate from a field of 20 candidates. After her election and taking office in this place in July 1971, Dame Margaret quickly established herself by pursuing community opportunities that aligned with her professional expertise. She entered a chamber in which there was only one other woman, Dame Nancy Butfield from South Australia. And she recognised her role following the legacy of her predecessors from Victoria, but also as only the seventh woman to be a senator in being what she described as a voice for the women of Australia. Her first speech demonstrated the breadth of her interests. She addressed economic concerns, but perhaps more significantly articulated the changing nature of people's attitudes towards what was important in their lives, noting that whilst Australians had enjoyed greater, great material prosperity in the post-war years, she observed the nation was changing. She sensed more people were, rec were recognising that material progress alone did not necessarily lead to contentment and there was a restlessness and questioning of previously important standards and values. She argued selflessness needed to be brought to the preservation of our natural resources and that the arts were a necessary outlet to develop imagination, sensibility, perception and intelligence and enrichment for all the people. In 1974, she ended the Shadow Ministry as spokesperson on the media. And when Malcolm Fraser replaced Billy Snedden as leader of the opposition in March 1975, he appointed her as Shadow Minister for Education, in relation to which he had responsibility for preparing the opposition's policy in what was a politically tumultuous time, but as Senator Birmingham has outlined, an effort that had earned attention and respect. After the dismissal of the Whitlam government, Mr Fraser appointed Dame Margaret Education Minister in his caretaker government. She would be the third woman appointed to the ministry in Australia's history, but the first to be given a substantive portfolio in Cabinet, running a government department. The stay was brief, and after the election that followed, she would shift to Social Security, and then after a six-month hiatus from Cabinet, she returned in June 76 and remained for the next six and a half years. As Minister for Social Security, she had to balance the desire of the Conservative government to contain expenditure with the necessity of ensuring the welfare system was administered with humanity. And often some of her harshest critics, as is often the case, were her own colleagues. Some of the key initiatives she oversaw were the conversion of the family allowance from a tax rebate to cash payment directly to mothers. And in conjunction with Marie Coleman, who to this day in her late 80s remains a powerful and consistent advocate for Australian women, oversaw the establishment of the foundations of the modern childcare sector with an increased Commonwealth role in day and out of school hours care. Uh, when Mari was asked to offer some comment or some contribution to this speech, amongst the many, many superlatives she used was the word doughty. It means steadfastly courageous and resolute. It's a word that's gone out of circulation, perhaps because it talks about qualities which may have become a little too rare. Marie recalls <coughs> Dame Margaret's emphatic pronouncements that social security is not a cost, but a way to support the most vulnerable amongst us, to offer civilised support for those who need it. And it was an outlook that Mad Dame Margaret practised in life as well as policy. She would go out of her way to give people the dignity of being heard. And even if she could not offer a solution to someone's problem, she would offer what she could, even if it was only her empathy. Perhaps Dame Margaret's greatest contribution opportunity would come in 1980, when Mr Fraser appointed her as Minister for Finance, becoming, in her own words, Chief Accountant for the country. The Age heralded this appointment as an excellent choice, stating that Dame Margaret was not merely, merely of unquestioned competence, but also someone who had shown a determination to see that budget cutbacks were not made at the expense of the poor. Finance put her at the heart of government decision-making for the next three years, 
and she would be the Fraser government's gatekeeper, maintaining curbs on expenditure in line with cabinet policy and imposing fiscal discipline on ministers and departments. It is, as it's, at its core, an often thankless portfolio, as Senator Birmingham is no doubt discovering, but it is one that is essential. And it seemed ideal for someone who is variously described as meticulous, confident and unflappable. It also put a woman at the heart of economic decision-making. Dame Margaret recognised the role she played as one of the first few women to enter this place and then to hold significant office. But to her, the more significant matter was that she would ensure it was more acceptable in the future for positions of responsibility to be handled by women. In her valedictory remark several years later, she said, it was said that I was the first to hold a cabinet post and administer a department. That might be true, but it had to be very important that I was not the last. So as the second and to date the only other female finance minister of Australia, I recognise not only the honour of following in the footsteps of women like Dame Margaret and her contemporary, the late Senator Susan Ryan, but the importance of helping others carry that legacy on. And I hope we're not waiting too long for Senator Gallagher to become the third woman to serve as Australia's finance minister. Returning to opposition after the defeat of the Fraser government may have been the end of Dame Margaret's ministerial career, but she took her role seriously as a legislator and remarked on returning to the backbench that her object now was to ensure good governance. When she retired in 1987, Labor leader in the Senate, John Button spoke generously about his departing Victorian colleague, describing her as someone who brought great skills and intellectual stringency to her role as a minister and dignity and good humour to this chamber. In fact, Dame Margaret had also been a source of artistic inspiration for Senator Button, with his 1978 work Still Life in the Senate, of which she was the centrepiece, winning third prize in a competition organised by the Warrnambool Art Gallery. In this masterpiece, subtitled The View from Opposition Benches, Senator Button placed a photograph of a smiling Dame Margaret surrounded by her Liberal Party colleagues who were all hand-drawn as a particular type of animal. Acknowledging in a somewhat un understated way that he had an uncharitable view of most Fraser government senators, he said, Margaret Guilfoyle was always the most pleasant and answered opposition questions better than most ministers which from John Button was fine praise. <laughs> After Parliament, Dame Margaret took on a number of causes. She showed particular dedication to supporting mental health research, notably as a commissioner into the National Inquiry into Human Rights and Mental Illness, uh, announced by Human Rights Commissioner Brian Burdekin in 1990 and Deputy Chair of the Mental Health Research Institute. She was also a member of the National Health and Medical Research Council and a director of the Australian Children's Television Foundation. And the latter was entirely appropriate, given that in her first speech, Dame Margaret had spoken presciently of the importance of fostering the creation of films with national identity. And I'm sure others might speak about this more. She also led efforts within the Liberal Party to increase female representation within its ranks. Speaking at a conference to mark 100 years of women's suffrage in that wonderful state of South Australia in 1994, she emphasised that it was not sufficient to merely increase the number of women in parliament, but that women must be in the cabinet. Remarking that our system is one of cabinet government, she said, and I quote, unless there are women in cabinet, they won't have the effect on policy development and implementation that they would if they were part of the cabinet structure in which the decisions and policy direction are made. In light of this, it is still so disappointing that there, when this government first came to office, there was only one woman in the cabinet. My genuine hope is that the conservative side of politics could find it within themselves to honour her legacy, of which they should be so very proud, by some more, supporting more women to be here and promoting more women into senior roles. In their tribute to the Heralds in the Herald Sun, Dame Margaret Guilfoyle's family described her as someone who will be remembered for her humour, spark and intellect. They went on to say, and I quote, she achieved much in her public life based on her abiding beliefs in equity and fairness. We farewelled some women who have led the way for this parliament and this nation this year. And Dame Margaret led the way for a generation of women, particularly those in conservative politics. She was an icon for the Liberal Party. 
uh, and we on this side, uh, particularly uh, those of us, uh, you know, women, women on this side of the parliament, express you know, our recognition uh, for the role she played in changing this place. So we again express our condolences at her passing and we convey our sympathies to her family and friends. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I stand on behalf of the Nationals to offer our condolences and to support the heartfelt words spoken here in the Senate and in the other place today and extend our sympathies uh, to Dame Margaret's family and friends. She was an outstanding parliamentarian, a role model, not just because she was a woman, but because she was a tenacious senator, earning and commanding respect in what was then uh, very much a man's world of federal parliament. She was a political a groundbreaker, a pivotal figure who had a profound impact on Australia and Australians. She was an inspiration for generations, an immigrant, a working mother, an accountant who became, as Dame Margaret herself described, the chief accountant for the country, following her appointment as Australia's first female finance minister in 1980. Dame Margaret held four ministerial positions in the Fraser government, education, minister assisting the prime minister on childcare, minister for social security, uh, her cabinet position and Minister for Finance. When I recall Dame Margaret, I think of a person who wanted to be judged by her actions, not as someone motivated uh, solely by inequality. Um, she never let an opportunity go, though, to focus on furthering the cause of uh, female representation. And I know, um, as the first a woman sent to Canberra from the Victorian division of the country party, national party, um, she reached out to me. Uh, on getting pre-selected and made sure that I uh, had someone that had been there before um, that I could draw on for advice and uh, introduced me to a few of my Liberal Party colleagues uh, before I actually got here. As a senator and a minister, all sides of politics agree she was outstanding. She took committee roles that aligned with her own professional experience. And because of her accounting background, Dame Margaret put her experience to use as a member of the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Government Operations and also public accounts. It was former Prime Minister and a colleague of hers, John Howard, who said uh, that she had a very good grasp on the detail, which is something all senators need to be able uh, to be across. And that is just one thing uh, that is required, especially also uh, to be a successful finance minister. For all the headlines focusing on her gender uh, rather than her skill, it must have been a very frustrating period to be uh, a female cabinet minister back then. What deserves the spotlight was Dame Margaret's tenacity in prosecuting her arguments, uh, done with determination, nous and resolute commitment to the desired outcome. Her advocacy for improvements in childcare, expansion of maternity leave for all women, earned the respect uh, of all sides of politics. There's no doubt her own work and life experience influenced her politics. As Minister for Social Security, Dame Margaret drew on her own understanding of the human impact of her portfolio, and as Minister, she was responsible for the most significant reforms to child endowment since the Menzies government extended it to first-born children in 1949. Under Dame Margaret, tax rebates were removed for dependent children, and she increased the cash amount paid to parents under the renamed Family Allowance, which was paid directly to mothers. These changes provided a greater benefit for low-income families and addressed key concerns of opponents who argued child endowment uh, had not kept up with infl inflation. Dame Margaret did not come from a political family. She lost her father at age 10 and was the daughter of a teacher who raised three children without the support of an extended family. She had a long uh, association with the Liberal Party in Victoria before her election. Uh, she recalled her pre-selection challenge not against men but against the perception of the city-country balance of the Liberal Party representation. And in politics, Dame Margaret was meticulous, confident and unflappable. unflappable. For that, she was an inspirational role model. Former Labor Premier of Victoria, Joan Kerner, said in 2003, Dame Margaret forged the view that women could be judged equally on political rather than personal terms. And I mention Joan Kerner because it was Kerner who, as president of the Australian Council of State Schools Organisations, said that Dame Margaret was also the architect of the coalition's education policy. She spoke on a range of issues in parliament, from the environment uh, to her interest and support in the arts. Whether finance or higher education, Aboriginal health, 
uh, ASIO and intelligence agencies or drug use and abuse. Dame Margaret was a succinct and clear contributor. Uh, my colleague, Foreign Minister Senator Payne, perhaps described Dame Margaret as one who led by example. And for those of us who have the honour and privilege to serve in this place, that is as fitting a definition of something to inspire and motivate us all. Uh, Vale, Dame Margaret. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, President. I rise today to offer the Greens' condolences to the friends and family of Dame Margaret Guilfoyle. Though, of course, we are on opposite sides of the chamber on many issues, Dame Margaret's passion and commitment to promoting women in leadership roles undeniably blazed a trail for all those who have followed and who are to come. An Irish immigrant raised by a single mother after her father's death, Dame Margaret often said that her experiences confirmed, uh, as was cited before by Senator Birmingham, that at any time a woman must be capable of independence. She worked tirelessly to ensure that she achieved this and made space for other women to do the same. When she joined the Liberal Party, she was mentored and supported by other female members and encouraged to seek leadership roles. She then spent her career paying that forward. In the time she served in the Senate, the number of female senators rose from two to 19, and I am delighted that women now represent more than half the senators in this place. Enid Lyons was the first woman appointed to Cabinet. Annabel Rankin was the first woman to be given a ministerial portfolio. When she was appointed as Minister for Education in 1975, Dame Margaret became the first woman to build on those achievements and to be appointed to a cabinet-level ministerial portfolio. She went on to serve as Minister for Social Security and Minister for Finance. In her social security role, she gained a reputation for resisting calls for funding and spending cuts in the portfolio, recognising the importance of providing support to vulnerable members of the community. She oversaw a major reform of the National Child Support Scheme and led the new Office of Child Care within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Working with the director of that office, the inimitable Murray Coleman, who uh, has also been referenced already today, uh, Dame Margaret oversaw a significant expansion of federal government support for the childcare sector and funding for preschool, daycare, after-school care and youth refuges. Throughout her career, Dame Margaret fought against efforts to pigeonhole her by her gender and to limit her interest to family issues and so-called women's issues. Instead, she continued to fight on the wide range of social issues that impact all women—access to education and social services, financial security, human rights, mental health and discrimination. Consistent with her commitment to education and development, after leaving the Senate, Dame Margaret went on to get a Bachelor of Laws and work in private practice. She continued her commitment to public life as a member of the National Inquiry into the Human Rights of People with Mental Illness, the Mental Health Research Institute, the Infertility Treatment Authority and various not-for-profit boards. And she continued her mentoring and advocacy for women, working with Joan Kerner on a campaign to secure more nominations for women in Australia's honours system. This is a project that continues today, but much ground has been made. Like those who came before her, Dame Margaret's career forged a path that, little by little, made it easier for more and more women to see people like them in leadership roles, to know the importance of representation and to put themselves forward. There is still so much to be done to achieve diversity in this place and to get a parliament that actually looks like our community, but we here at the Greens thank Dame Margaret for the doors that she opened along that path. A woman's place is indeed in the House, the Senate and the Cabinet. Bale, Dame Margaret Guilfoyle. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, for the second time in as many months, we find ourselves rising to pay tribute to a trailblazer for women in parliament and women in government. Firstly, the Hon. Susan Ryan and now Dame Margaret Guilfoyle. There have been too many of these speeches this year. Mr President, I well recall the day last year when, for the first time in our nation's history, the Senate achieved equal numbers of men and women, with the arrival then of Senator Sarah Henderson. I think he's over there. This was an important milestone for our parliament and for the country. We reached it in large part because women like Dame Margaret paved a path for many of the rest of us to follow. When in 1970 Dame Margaret was elected to this place, she was only the seventh woman to serve in the Australian Senate. 
In her long career here, as uh, colleagues have said so well this afternoon, and I acknowledge those speeches with, uh, with gratitude, in her long career she achieved a lot of firsts. She was the first woman senator in cabinet, the first woman in cabinet with a ministerial portfolio, the first woman ever to hold a major economic portfolio. Not only did she, did, did, not only did she do all this, but she did it with such extraordinary efficiency that she left everyone in awe. And she won admiration from all sides, as we have seen here this afternoon. But it didn't come easily. In fact, at first, she was written off as a mother with political ambitions. When she was appointed to what was known as the Joint Prices Committee, Melbourne's Herald newspaper described her as, and I quote, a housewife with a big say on prices, unquote. The Sydney Morning Herald, upon her appointment as Shadow Minister for Education, described her as, quote, a mother with political ambitions, unquote. When her talent became apparent, she attracted other uh, descriptions, like the Iron Butterfly and comparisons to the Iron Lady of British politics, also a Margaret. But she never welcomed the title or the comparison. She said the image of a hard woman bothered her. She didn't believe a woman should have to sacrifice her compassion and her empathy to succeed. But at the same time, she was not interested in being typecast uh, as a woman with a woman's portfolio, in inverted commas. She clearly had her eyes on the bigger goal of leading and reforming social security. And she was appointed to that role just before Christmas of 1975, and over the next five years, used it as a platform to pursue her belief in women's equal participation. She said at the time, equal participation of women in the parliament, in the whole of community life, can only lead us to a better understanding of humanity and to the fulfilment of the aspirations that we would have for a civilised society. She started programs, as we've heard this afternoon, that made life better for women in Australia. By her own estimate, 83 per cent of her department's payments were made directly to women, including widows' pensions, aged pensions, family allowances and disability support payments. She also reformed the National Child Endowment Scheme and presided over a major expansion of government support for preschool, childcare and after-school care. When the landmark maternity leave bill was debated, she had argued for the extension of maternity leave to all women, not just Commonwealth employees. And no one knew better how important it was for women to have choice when it came to how they interpreted their role as a parent. Indeed, without pushing for flexibility in work-life balance in her own career, she would never have been in a position to create it for others. In 1980, Dame Mar Margaret was made the Minister for Finance and, as we've heard this afternoon, becoming what she called the chief accountant for the country. She always believed governments needed to govern for everyone. And in her more than two years as finance minister, she came to see that it was through the finance portfolio that a government's accountability on every issue, from the economy to national security, rested. And to paraphrase, she said, it was a very interesting time for me as finance minister, having that overall look at the accountability of government, to sit on every cabinet committee dealing with economic matters and with the security of the country because it is the accountability of government through the Department of Finance that is the responsibility of that minister. And I think it is very nice that Senator Wong is here this afternoon to make her contribution as Australia's second female finance minister. Upon her retirement, Dame Margaret reflected that her time in parliament had brought out the best in her. And she did it at a time when, frankly, few believed a woman, especially a woman with children, could or even should serve in this place. People often asked Dame Margaret what it was like being the first woman in her role. She always replied that it wasn't being the first that mattered. It was more important that she was not the last. And I know Senator Jane Hume uh, would uh, have reinforced that this afternoon. Uh, were she here? She mentioned that in her social media last week in uh, in uh, acknowledging Dame Margaret's leadership, particularly in Victoria. Seeing how far female representation came over her lifetime was something in which she also took great joy. She once said, 
since my time as a minister, I have seen women who have been Commonwealth ministers, premiers and chief ministers. And we know indeed we can add to that Governor General and Prime Minister. As a senator uh, and as Minister for Women, I feel immense gratitude for the trailblazing path laid down by Senator Guilfoyle. All of us owe her a great debt. She was a woman who made it to the top and then worked to lift us all. I met Dame Margaret from time to time over the years through the Liberal Party and through politics, and I was always struck by her quiet grace, her fierce intellect, uh, and her genuine interest in what those of us who had followed in her footsteps as senators in the parliament were doing here, and her fierce support, continuing to support the Liberal Party and the participation of women in the Liberal Party. In fact, just last week, Chris McDiven, former federal president of the Liberal Party and the initiator of the Liberal Women's Forum, uh, of which Dame Margaret was the patron, described her to me as a wonderfully warm, kind and supportive person. That will be the memory of many. I believe she'll be remembered not only as the first woman to do so many of the things that she did, but as one of the finest, most accomplished, diligent ministers in our nation's history. To her husband Stan, to her children, to her family, we offer our heartfelt condolences. Vale, Dame Margaret Guilford. Thank you, Senator Payne. Um, being a Victorian Liberal senator, I'm going to take this opportunity to speak on this matter as well. I first met Dame Margaret three decades ago, as everyone who's a member of the Victorian division would be aware of her status within our party. While we didn't know it on the time, it was actually the 45th anniversary of her first appointment as a minister in which she passed away on the 11th of November. Uh, and the Speaker and myself, also a member of the Victorian Division of the Liberal Party, were actually down at Old Parliament and sort of regretted that we, we, we did not know at the time. Um, it does cause one to reflect on the events of that day and the achievements that Dame Margaret undertook. When she entered office, as others have commented, she entered a Senate with a sole other woman and a House of Representatives with none. But she had no wish to be defined by the then limits placed on many women. She was defined by her determination, competence and expertise. She was elected to the Senate coming from the fierce tradition of Victorian Liberal women that has been mentioned before, such as Dame Ivy Wedgwood and Elizabeth Couchman, many of whom were denied the opportunities that she was presented with and took advantage of so forcefully. At her pre-selection, where she famously beat nearly two dozen other candidates, she was asked how she would manage three children as well as her responsibilities in this place, reflecting the attitudes, sadly, of the times. She responded pointedly but politely. I'm asking you to make a decision to give me responsibility to be a representative in the Senate, and I would ask that you accept that I have responsibility to make decisions regarding my family. She served in this place from 1971 to 1987 and saw a dramatic increase in the representative nature of this chamber when it comes to the representation of women. I won't recount all her achievements out biographical information other than to associate myself with the contributions made earlier today. She chose as her, matters, as her focus matters of finance, areas where she had both a passion and professional expertise. She was not going to have her career defined by notions others had for her role. She sat on Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Government Operations. She joined the Public Accounts Committee and she served on estimates committees just as they were beginning to make their mark, her election coinciding with their essential creation. As I mentioned, she became a minister in the Fraser Cabinet of 1975 and, as others have mentioned, went on to an extraordinary career as Minister for Social Security and Minister for Education. The Honourable David Kemp, himself later a minister but at that time a senior staff member for Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, described her as follows. She has a tremendous gift of making a strong political point very simply. She would be able to convince Cabinet what would fly and what wouldn't. She continued to serve uh, until she left this place in 1987 and, as others have commented, read law at ANU afterwards. But she continued to give generous and expert public service on tribunals, boards of inquiry and committees that benefited from the, Fraser, the values Malcolm Fraser ascribed to her in Cabinet. She could be totally relied upon and think for herself. Her Order of Australia recognised her significant contributions to public life in Australia in support of many areas of public activity, and particularly to young people as a role model and to the Australian Parliament. I recently spoke to a long-serving member of this chamber, 
uh, the Honourable Rod Kemp, who was also a senior staffer to Dame Margaret for five years. And he told me, Dame Margaret showed that politics could be conducted with dignity and decency, and that politics in sensitive portfolios could be conducted successfully without sordid deals and vested interests, which I think is reflected by the many contributions that have been made following Dame Margaret's passing. Margaret Fitzherbert, a former member of the Victorian Parliament and unofficial historian of the Liberal Party, about many of these matters summed her up. She was smart, charming, feminine and worked exceptionally hard. She was a living link to the strong, tough women who helped found the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party has lost a giant. I urge those with an interest in these matters to refer to Margaret's work on Dame Margaret and that generation of tough women. Maybe my party has some lessons that we need to relearn. In the passing of Susan Ryan and Margaret Guilfoyle, both sides of Australian politics and both sides of this Senate have lost women who both led by example and championed change, albeit in, in their own ways. The Senate today, while imperfect, better reflects Australian society for the work that they did. With regard to her contribution to public life in Australia, the Parliament of Australia, and a particular regard for her contribution on behalf of the Victorian Division of the Liberal Party, we are grateful for the service and example of Margaret Guilfoyle and extend our deepest sympathies to Stan, who many of us also know, and, he, and her family. Senator Henderson. Great. Thank you very much, Mr President. Dame Margaret Guilfoyle, ACDBE, will be remembered as one of Australia's most significant women. She was committed to her family and she was committed to her country. Dame Margaret was elected as a Senator for Victoria in 1970, commencing her term in July 1971. After serving as opposition spokesperson for education and the media, Dame Margaret served as a cabinet minister for much of the Fraser government, commencing in 1975. And as we have heard in this condolence motion, she was a true trailblazer. The first woman to be appointed an Australian government cabinet minister with portfolio, the first woman to hold an economic portfolio. Dame Margaret ensured that the voices of women and men were heard at the cabinet table and at the highest levels of government administration. One of her most important achievements was her oversight of the National Child Endowment Arrangements, which ushered in the change to cash payments from the previous tax rebate scheme. This proved to be life-changing for families on low incomes. And she campaigned for maternity leave for all women, not just sections of the workforce, such as employees of the Commonwealth. Despite the best efforts of others, she never sought to define herself or her work by her gender. She had no interest in being typecast. Despite the fact, of course, that after the 1975 election, the Liberals and Labor each held only three women in the parliament. Of course, this is in stark contrast, as we have heard from Senator Payne, from my entry into the Senate last year, which was the first time that men and women were in equal numbers in the Senate. Born in Belfast, Northern Ireland in 1926, Dame Margaret's family migrated to Melbourne shortly after, and, and tragically, her father died when she was just 10 years old. With her mother now raising three children, Dame Margaret said later that she learned that at any time, a woman must be capable of independence. Dame Margaret married Stan Guilfoyle in 1952, and in the 1950s she became active in the Liberal Party, uh, having joined the South Camberwell branch of the party. And what good fortune for the Liberal Party and good fortune for Australia that Dame Margaret became so active in politics. She had a calm demeanour, a razor-sharp mind, and a fighting spirit which was evident from the moment she contested pre-selection in a field of 20 candidates. When asked who would look after her three children if she became a senator, and as we've just heard from the president, such a good story, I'm telling it again, she politely responded, I'm asking you to make a decision to give me responsibility to be a representative of the Senate, and I, and I would ask that you would accept that I have responsibility to make the decisions regarding my family. 
Day Margaret served in ministerial portfolios for childcare, education, social security and finance. She was formidable in and out of Cabinet. Perhaps her most famous battles were with the then Treasurer Philip Lynch over his quest for social security cuts and her refusal to accept these reductions in government expenditure. The then Treasurer had labelled her as unhelpful, which she wore with a badge of honour. At a conference many years later, she said, Perhaps the nicest headline I ever had during my time was the one in a Sydney paper that said Minister Unhelpful, unhelpful in cutting programs that coherently gave income security to millions of people, and maybe unhelpful in trying to persuade other ministers that there were essential matters that needed to be built upon and not destroyed from time to time. Dame Margaret's record of public service to the nation, to the Senate for 16 years and to the Liberal Party will serve as a lasting tribute to her memory. My sincere condolences to her husband Stan, her children Georgina, Anne and Geoffrey, and to her extended family and friends. Dame Margaret was an incredible woman of substance, integrity and compassion. May she rest in peace. I ask that all senators join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I thank senators. So I believe that we are now at the placing of business. I'll just check that that's correct. Yes, it is. Um, so is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? No. no. Okay then. Um, Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for is, senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following sen senators for personal reasons. Senators Dodson and Billick for 30th November 2020 till 3rd of December 2020, and Senator Carr for 30th November 2020 till 10th of December 2020. Thank you. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Hume. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Hume for today for personal reasons. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged for the following notices of motion listed for today. Business of the Senate notice a motion in Senator O'Neill's name to the 1st of December 2020. General business notice a motion 864 in Senator Wong's name to the 7th of December 2020. General business notice a motion 868 in Senator Waters' name to the 7th of December. General business notice a motion 852 in Senator Hanson Young's name to the 10th of December. General Business Notice of Motion 853 in Senator Hanson Young's name to the 2nd of December, and General Business Notice of Motion 854 in Senator Hanson Young's name to the 2nd of December. Thank you. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Um, and I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. So I think we've just postponed business of the Senate number one. Yes, so um, so we'll just go to uh, yeah, I'm just trying to get them in an order. Thanks, Senator Water. I wasn't Waters, I wasn't going to go to you immediately, but I'll note that I need to come back to you. So I think we go to um, government business number one. Yes, Senator Darien. Thank you, Darien. Uh, 
the government business notice of motion number one relating to Senator Thorpe's first speech be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Dunian. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Dunian be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So I'll now move to general business notice of motion number 854, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. That's postponed, beg your pardon. Um, yep, I'm just trying to get them in an order, as I said, um, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, okay, so we'll now go back to um, business of the Senate number two, standing in your name, Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Deputy President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number two, which would disallow the cutting of jobs, job keeper, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
So the question is that uh, beg your pardon, business of the Senate number two um, be agreed to. So the ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 27 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I advise senators there is likely to be further divisions. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 865, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that motion number 865, standing in my name for today, relating to the establishment of moratorium on destroying koala habitat, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I move the motion. Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunning. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Since 2014, the Coalition Government has invested over $26 million on projects supporting outcomes for koalas, ranging from tree planting, the propagation of food trees and reconnecting koala corridors. The Morrison Government recently announced a further $18 million investment to support this iconic species. $40 million of this package will be directed to habitat restoration in priority areas, with the remaining funds supporting the National Koala Census and health research and, and wildlife care. All EPBC assessments take into account the impacts of habitat loss on relevant listed threatened species and communities. Published reports on the impacts of the 2019-20 bushfires, including for koalas, are also taken into the consideration in the context of each individual assessment. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 865 standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Um, ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 865, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 27 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 867, standing in the name of Senators Keneally and Wong. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam. Deputy President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 867 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. Move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The Australian government is doing everything possible to support Australians who want and need to return. More than 432,000 Australians have returned since the 13th of March. And around 31,900 have been assisted by the Australian government, including on 74 directly facilitated flights. On the 17th of March, the government advised Australians overseas who wanted to return home to do so as soon as possible by commercial means. In order to manage and maintain quarantine arrangements in Australia and at the request of the states, the National Cabinet agreed to international passenger arrival caps. While critical to the integrity of Australia's quarantine system and safety for the whole Australian community, the caps have restricted the availability of flights for Australians overseas. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has made available a hardship program with further emergency assistance for the most vulnerable Australian citizens overseas. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 867 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I uh, believe the noes have it. The division required. Um, ring the bells for one minute. Thank you.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 867, standing in the name of Senators Keneally and Wong, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 27 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We we'll now move to <clears throat> general business notice of motion number 872, standing in the name of all Australian Greens senators. Senator Steele, John. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President, uh, Madam Deputy President. I'm a little bit out of practice. Okay. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 872 uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steele, John. Thank you. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. A short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunyon. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, the EPBC Act requires the government to table the statutory review within 15 sitting days after it's received. The government is currently considering the review and its response, and both will be uh, released prior to the statutory deadline. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 872, standing in the name of all Australian Greens, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe uh, the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 872, standing in the name of <coughs> all Australian Green senators, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes.
order, there being 28 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is negated. We will now move to general business, notice of motion number 873, which was agreed to this morning, uh, standing in the name of Senator Griff. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 873 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Griff. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government is investing $36 million in additional FCC resourcing, including four additional judges and seven judicial registrars, as part of the 2020-21 budget. This will allow the court to resolve more matters every year, including an estimated 1,000 additional migration cases, which responds to the increase in FCC migration filings from 3,544 in 2014-15 to. 6,555 in 1920. The resourcing will be offset by an increase to the migration application fee with all revenue reinvested in the court. Currently, the FCC fee for migration matters is significantly lower than the AAT fee and the new rate is set halfway between the AAT and federal court fees. The government does not oppose the production uh, order but will necessarily have to consider any public interest immunity claim, for instance, given this was subject to cabinet processes. The government will endeavour to meet the time frame uh, and that will depend on the number of documents identified. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 873 standing in the name of Senator Griff be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I uh, believe the ayes have it. We now move to a deferred vote. So uh, <clears throat> I remind senators that on Thursday, the 12th of November, 2020, after 4.30 p.m., a division was called for on a motion moved by Senator Walsh relating to JobKeeper. I understand that it suits the convenience of the Senate for that division to be held now. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
stop the bells. So the question is that the deferred vote taken on Thursday the 12th of November or held over from Thursday the 12th of November 2020 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 27 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. That concludes general business. We're now moving to the urgency motion. And I would ask that you leave the chamber quietly. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 21 proposals were received in accordance with standing order 75. The question of which would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Keneally. Dear Mr President, pursuant to standing order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that in the opinion of the Senate the following is a matter of urgency. The need for the Senate to uh, the need for the Morrison government to take responsibility for getting stranded Australians home, including acting on the Halton Review recommendation to establish a national quarantine facility when the number of Australians who were stranded registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and wanting to come home has now doubled from 18,800 to, on the 20th of August, 37,000, and the number of vulnerable Australians has increased from 4,000 to 8,000 in just five weeks. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate time specific to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call senators. Oh, is the proposal supported? Beg your pardon. Yes, it, I believe it is, and I ask the clocks. The <laughs> <laughs> to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Billick. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. One of the values that Australians hold dear is that they never leave a mate behind. Yet this is what the Morrison government has done to thousands of Australian citizens and permanent residents, those who have become stranded overseas due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of these Australians have been trying to return home for over six months. And when the pandemic stopped the world in its tracks, they heeded the government's advice to stay put if they had employment and living arrangements. As economic conditions deteriorated across the globe, many lost their employment, had to give up their leases and are now stranded in a foreign country with no income and no support. Where flights are available, there has been price gouging with many airlines forcing Australians to purchase business or first class, first class tickets in order to reserve a seat. Stranded Australians have turned to their government in their time of need. They would expect their government to move heaven and earth to help them, but instead the government's turned its back on them. We know of around 37,000 Australians stranded overseas, and this figure has doubled since August, 
and it keeps on going up as Australians register with embassies, high commissions and consulates. The number continues to rise despite the Prime Minister's hollow promise that he will get these Australians home and out of quarantine by Christmas. As of today, Mr Morrison has only 10 days to deliver on that promise. Does the Prime Minister seriously, seriously expect us to believe, with his track record so far, that he will get 37,000 Australians home within the next 10 days? I think not. About 8,000 Australians overseas are considered to be financially or medically vulnerable. This means they are facing the risk of, or in some cases currently experiencing, financial hardship, poverty and even homelessness. Even for those with the means to get by in their host country, many fear that by the time they get home they could have lost their homes, jobs or livelihoods back in Australia. Now, one of my Tasmanian constituents stranded overseas contacted my office after he'd been discharged from hospital following a heart attack. He'd been unable to secure accommodation and was about to head to a homeless shelter. And another one who has been stranded overseas for seven months now has told my office that due to poor internet access, he's having great difficulty completing the online forms required by the Australian government, or by, the, by Australian government agencies particularly uploading large documents. His phone provider recently cancelled his SIM card, which has prevented him from receiving the SMS codes required to withdraw money sent by friends. What is particularly concerning for him is that his insurance company recently cancelled his travel insurance because of Australia's ban on overseas travel. It's pretty scary to imagine how many other Australians are stuck overseas through no fault of their own, those that are without insurance cover and who will struggle to access health care if they have a serious injury or illness, including if they contract COVID-19. It's got to be a scary scenario, a terrifying scenario for many Australians. Imagine how isolated and vulnerable they must feel. Get an idea of how some of them feel we only need to examine the Hansard transcript from public hearings of the Senate's COVID-19 committee. Peter, a Melbourne resident who addressed the committee while stuck in Serbia with her family, including her 79-year-old mother-in-law, posed this question to the committee. How am I supposed to instil a sense of national pride in my children and friends and people we know about being Australian when you're so poorly let us down? Peter also told the committee, the CAP has abandoned my family and it's abandoned our citizens who are overseas. They're not stranded, they are abandoned by the government. The CAP Peter was referring to is the limit placed on international arrivals and it's one of the main reasons why stranded Australians feel abandoned by this government. Adding to the sense of betrayal is the admission by the Department of Home Affairs that non-Australians with business uh, businesses, innovation, investment and student visas could be taking quarantine places from Australian citizens and permanent residents. Another stranded Australian, Diane, who was stuck in the UK when she addressed the committee, spoke about the sense of betrayal of being abandoned by her government. And she said, it just feels like a long-term boyfriend cheating on me. I've given my life to Australia and in my time of need, they have dumped me. Early in the pandemic, the government belatedly helped organise some flights for Australians in Wuhan and passengers of the Diamond Princess in Japan, but they haven't done nearly enough to repatriate stranded Australians. In fact, they have spent substantially more taxpayers' money chartering flights out of Australia for lobsters, prawns and abalone than they have spent chartering flights into Australia for Aussies stuck overseas. It's shocked and appalled many Australians that this government spends over $4,000 an hour on an RAAF plane to help former Senator Matthias Cormann lobby for his OECD job, and yet they can't task RAAF planes to help get Australians home. Most of the Australians who have thankfully been able to return um, back to Australia have done so on their own initiative. Some have come together with understanded Australians to book and share the cost of charter flights. And in doing so, they have undertaken a task that the government should have been doing months ago. 
There are three simple actions that Labor is calling on the Morrison government to take to help Australians stranded overseas get back home. One, increase the caps on international arrivals so that more Australians can return to Australia. Two, stop the price gouging by airlines flying into Australia. It's outrageous that simply to get home, some Australians are being forced to pay as much as $15,000 in airfares. Three, use all possible flight options to bring stranded Australians home, including working with airlines, to increase the number of commercial flights, charter flights, and using the fleet of the Royal Australian Air Force. There are thousands of Qantas and Virgin workers currently on JobKeeper and hundreds of planes sitting idle. And we acknowledge Qantas has provided some repatriation flights, but why isn't the government asking the airlines how they can use more of their spare capacity to bring more Australians home? Mr Morrison could also deploy the RAAF's fleet of VIP um, aircraft around the globe. As I said earlier, the government seems to have no trouble tasking an RAAF aircraft to fly a former Liberal Minister around Europe and provide him with eight staff so he can apply for a job. Mr Morrison has spent months dismissing our calls to use the RAAF fleet to bring stranded Australians home. Yet he thinks the extravagance heaped on Mr Cormann is OK. And what was the Prime Minister's glib explanation for this? He might get COVID. So does Mr Morrison not think that the 37,000 Australians stuck overseas might also be at risk of contracting COVID-19 too? And a lot of those would be at risk in countries where they've got no health insurance uh, cover. It's unconscionable that the government is putting one of their mates ahead of vulnerable Australians. Mr Morrison keeps blaming hotel quarantine arrangements for his government's lack of progress. He keeps pointing the finger at the states and the territories because we know he's never to blame for anything. But he is trying to pull the wool over Australians' eyes. He knows that his government could expand quarantine arrangements. He has clear and thorough advice from the Hotel Quarantine Review about how the federal government could do this including advice to run quarantine under federal legislation and to over up, open up further quarantine facilities such as the RAAF's Learmonth base. The Morrison's government failure to take the necessary actions to get stranded Australians home is a dereliction of their duty to their country citizens and it's a breach of these citizens' human rights. It's an indelible stain on the record of this government that they abandoned thousands of Australian citizens for months when they were at their most vulnerable and looking to the government for help. This absolute lack of care and concern for thousands of vulnerable Australians is outrageous. Australia should have a reputation for looking after its citizens abroad, but when turning to Mr Morrison's government, you're on your own. For anyone listening to these proceedings right now who want to add their voice to the thousands calling on the Morrison government to rescue stranded Australians, I encourage you to sign Labor's petition. And you can find this petition online at www.alp.org.au slash stranded Aussies. Thank petition you, Senator Billick. Your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I acknowledge that the motion with which we're dealing with now reflects it's signed by Senator Keneally, of course, and it reflects a drum she's been banging for some time. But I've got to say, with this motion, the pattern that I have observed, and I'm sure many people in this chamber have observed, of Senator Keneally overreaching on matters in the Home Affairs portfolio has reached a new high. Because if you're a person of my vintage, and I, you may well be, Mr Acting Deputy President, you might remember Inspector Gadget. Now, I liked Inspector Gadget as a kid. He had these extendy arms and legs that were very handy for um, the adventures that he would have. But, you know, not even he, with his super extendy arms, could reach as far as Senator Keneally tries to do so often 
with her efforts in the home affairs portfolio. Overreach is the order of the day when it comes to Senator Keneally. And the overreach here is so spectacular that even with his extendy go go gadget arms, Inspector Gadget would also topple over. So let's start with the first of those overreaches. First, her reference to the Halton Review recommending a national quarantine facility. Well, that's overstatement number one. Got the report right here, the, the relevant pages of it, and among a range of matters that are canvassed in that report, there's a suggestion for the government to, quote, consider a national quarantine facility, quote, in reserve. Not we must establish one now, the way Senator Keneally puts it, not the current status of demand requires it, but rather if or when required, should there be a need to scale up services significantly and at short notice. A far, far cry from the land of overreach that Senator Keneally inhabits. And as you would expect, perhaps, Mr Acting Deputy President, her overreach doesn't end there. Because Labor, who protests perpetually that immigration detention is cruel and barbaric and wrong, now wants to reopen immigration detention facilities and put Australian citizens in them. Well, they treat the government as though they're doing the wrong thing by refusing to reopen immigration detention centres immediately and filling it full of Australians who've been overseas. I mean, it is not wrong for the Australian government to canvass and pursue every option to avoid putting Australians in immigration detention, if at all possible. Perhaps Senator Keneally might also like to you know, mix some Australian citizens who have been overseas in with some of the convicted criminals that we have in immigration detention waiting for deportation, or perhaps send them in with the other non-criminal people but who are nevertheless in immigration detention because they're not entitled to be here in Australia. I mean, this is the most harebrained scheme I think Labor's ever come up with, and yet they come in here and argue it as though putting Australians in immigration detention would be some kind of supremely moral position. It truly is a bizarre thing. And then we go to the next one of her spectacular overreaches, pretending that it's the Commonwealth government that is forcing the imposition of caps on the numbers of people who can return to Australia each week. Perhaps that's the biggest dishonesty of the lot. Another overreach, those go-go gadget arms extending again to the point where every sensible person can see Inspector Topple. But of course, the smart Australians won't be fooled. They know that the caps are driven by state governments requiring hotel quarantine. They know that limit means that the number of people who can return has a natural ceiling associated with the number of hotel rooms available. And they know that the vast majority of the heavy lifting on bringing people back has actually been delivered by the New South Wales government through Sydney Airport. Now, are there other options that could be considered for bringing more Australians home? Well, yes. And is home quarantine perhaps one of them? Perhaps. Maybe more testing and shorter quarantine periods at either end of an international flight? It might also be worth exploring. But those are matters that lie in the hands of state governments. And the confected outrage that we hear from those opposite is a smokescreen for the reality that the states in overwhelmingly Labor governments hold the reins on this issue. Maybe Senator Keneally should pick up the phone to one of her Labor mates, maybe Premier Palaszczuk, maybe Premier Andrews or Premier McGowan, and start to negotiate with them a more reasonable attitude. But I'm pretty sure they don't want to throw Australian citizens in immigration detention either. Not least of which the fact that under the proposition that's being put opposite, 
it would have a whole lot of Australians return to immigration detention for Christmas. Now, to point out the madness of what's being argued by those opposite is not to dismiss the seriousness of the situation. There are Australians overseas who want to return, and we need to do all that we sensibly can to get them back as soon as is possible. And we're keenly aware that many Australians face hardship overseas because of global travel restrictions that result or have arisen because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so DFAT is helping vulnerable Australians. They're doing that by facilitating access to flights back to Australia, importantly, providing financial assistance where that's required through what's called the hardship program, because we know that at a time when the global market for aviation has taken such a big hit, it's just not as economically viable for flights to be as cheap as they were some months ago. So we're providing help for people to meet that higher cost that many are facing. And we're continuing to provide professional and responsive consular assistance to those people who are in need. And so many Australians have been able to return, not 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000. We have facilitated the return of more than 432,000 people. 432,000 people since the government advised Australians that they needed to reconsider their plans to leave Australia for overseas travel. DFAT has helped over 31,000 Australians return on over 370 flights, including almost 11,000 people on 74 government facilitated flights. Ten commercial flights have been facilitated by government since just the 23rd of October, and they've returned over 1,500 passengers, 1,583 to be precise. And that includes one that arrived in Darwin from London today, a Qantas flight from Delhi that landed in Darwin on Saturday. There is a steady stream of Australians being brought home, and that's happening as soon as it's practical to do so within the limits that have been set by National Cabinet at the insistence of state governments, because they're the ones that impose this hotel quarantine requirement, and they're the ones that face the, the management associated with imposing that rule. Since the 18th of September, over 39,600 people have returned from overseas, including more than 15,300 Australians who had registered with DFAT. Now, of those, more than 3,400 were vulnerable people. We are taking the necessary interest in making sure that people who are in hard situations, whether that's because of their health, whether that's because um, of their ability to meet living costs in the place that they're located, whether that's because of the cost of flights back, we're doing what we need to to make sure vulnerable, pe vulnerable people get the hand they need. And while the global pandemic is far from over and we don't know when we will return to the normal state of international travel, Australians can be assured of this, that we do very much care about getting them home safely and that at the federal level we are doing everything within our power to make sure the road home for them is facilitated as swiftly and as safely as possible. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. This pandemic has been challenging in so many ways. There's been so much hardship, so much hurt, so much suffering. And not least amongst that hardship and hurt and suffering has been the plight of the tens of thousands of Australians who are stranded overseas. And that number is increasing, and it's not surprising. As you see the pandemic making such huge impacts all around the world, people want to be able to come home. At the COVID committee hearing just on Friday, we heard that the numbers have increased from the 18,800 as they were on the, on the 20th of August, just a few months later, despite the people that have come home, we are now at 37,000 Australians who are saying, please, let us come home. And at that hearing, 
We heard DFAT acknowledge what the Prime Minister has been unwilling to acknowledge, and that's that they are not all going to get home by Christmas. On the 18th of September, the Prime Minister said, I would hope that those who are looking to come home that would be able to do that within months, and I would hope that we can get as many people at home, if not all of them, by Christmas. It's very clear that that's not going to be ca the case. In fact, we are going to fall well short of that. I did some quick sums during the hearing last Friday when we were told that over September and no, over October and November that there had been 7,000 people that had been returned home each month. So 14,000 throughout September and October. We were told that there's going to be some increase in quarantine spaces over the coming months because there are going to be some flights coming into Melbourne. There's going to be an increase in quarantine facilities in Tasmania and the ACT. But when I questioned, well, just how many more does that mean? Up from 7,000 in a month, what are we going to get up to? 10,000? Perhaps even at a max, we might even get to 15,000 a month. I wasn't um, contradicted. In fact, I would say that the likelihood is probably over the coming months, and it is only, it's less than a month to Christmas, it's, we're going to be lucky if we get another 10,000 Australians being able to come home. And of course, that, only me that means that only half of that 10,000, only about 5,000 of those 37,000 Australians stranded overseas are actually going to make it to be home with their loved ones by Christmas because of the two weeks quarantine that's required. So of those 37,000 people that in September the Prime Minister said we'd be hoping to get them all home by Christmas, we're looking at actually only 5,000 of them being able to get home. And in fact, at the rates of quarantine availability, we're going to be lucky if those 37,000 people all make it home by Easter time. They are going to be stuck there for many months longer. And this is tragic because each one of those people is suffering in their own way. They are people, there are people who are running out of money. There's people whose leases have run out, who have got nowhere to stay. There are families caring for their children who are worried, desperately worried, that if both parents catch COVID, that they haven't got the family networks or the support networks to have somebody else looking after their children. And this is a real risk. I mean, if you look at the tragic statistics in the United States at the moment, where in North Dakota, one in a thousand people have died of COVID. One in a thousand. That means we're looking at about one in ten people having caught it. These are really scary statistics. And if you're an Australian living in somewhere in the world with that sort of prevalence of this virus, you would be desperate to come home. And what also makes this such a tragedy is that there is something that we can be doing. There is a solution to this. What we heard on Friday, and it was confirmed, that the limitation, it's not the number of flights, it's not the number of places on flights, it's the quarantine facilities. It's having spaces available for people to quarantine in Australia, which means if you put the resources in, there are facilities all around the country that could be being used for quarantine. We could lift the number of quarantine spaces tomorrow by putting those resources in. And this is a federal government responsibility because it's the federal government who are, who, whose responsibility it is to be looking after Australians and, and our borders. So it is, and of course, it was a recommendation, as the motion says, it was a recommendation from the review that Jane Holton undertook to establish a national quarantine facility. There is a role that the federal government could be playing that this government is not playing. And I want to acknowledge the important work of Amnesty International in this debate in bringing attention to the plight of those stranded overseas, including through their report, Stories of the Stranded Aussies. As that report notes, there is a clear breach of human rights in the Liberal Party's actions to leave people stranded overseas. And they say the Australian government has an obligation under international law 
including Article 12.2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 12.4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to bring these people home. And they are not meeting this obligation. So we've got a breach of international law, and we've got a government that could be taking action but is not taking action, not meeting this obligation. And that goes, takes us to a really important point about this pandemic. It shows where your values lie. It's when the world's turned upside down, when hard decisions have to be made. And we've now seen what the Morrison government has decided. They have decided to leave Australians stranded overseas. And the Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be protected and respected in all countries and in all places, and, and for all people. And when you apply a human rights framework to the actions of countries, you can't pick and choose and say it's okay for some countries to protect human rights and it's okay for other countries to abuse them. And it means as a country that we have to keep challenging ourselves to make sure that we are living up to our human rights obligations. It is our responsi responsibility to call out human rights abuses in other countries and it is our responsibility to be respecting the human rights of our citizens. So we need to be getting people back to Australia. We need to be acting on black deaths in custody. We need to be not locking up asylum seekers in indefinite attention. We need to be bringing our citizens home. But while they claim that they value Australians, I mean, this government, the Liberal National Party government, has refused to take any ownership of this issue. And we just heard Senator Stoker basically saying once again, no, 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 it's all a matter for the states. I mean, the Prime Minister has got a nose for a photo op. He can sniff out a shiny announcement a mile away if he wants to be part of it. But when it comes to the real issues that people want help with, well then, no, it's a question for the state premiers. But meanwhile, of course, they have shown where their real priorities are. I mean, Matthias Cormann hardly had time to exit the building, and we've got a RAF jet at $4,000 an hour sort of flying him, whisking him around um, at great expense to be trying to get a cushy job. It really goes to show it's one rule for everyday people and another rule for the Liberal mates networks. So look, I want to be very clear. While the government has let Australia down during this crisis, there is a better way. Quite early in the crisis, we understood that there's a massive need for governments to intervene to be looking after people and protecting our people. And that's why we released our Invest to Recover plan I mean, that report recognised that we face and continue to face a pivotal moment. We said for many people things haven't been easy for a long time, but the inequality crisis fuelled by the neoliberal politics of the Liberal and Labor parties has been supercharged by the current health crisis and its disastrous economic consequences. And while we're rightly focused on responding to COVID-19, the climate crisis that drove the devastating bushfires early this year has not gone away. By recognising that this is a pivotal moment, we can take real steps, tremendous steps that will make a real difference for people, for communities and environment. We can intervene, we could invest and bring Australians home by Christmas if we wanted to. It's not a matter of money. The government spending tens, hundreds of billions of dollars, no, $99 billion in giving handouts to their big corporate mates. They could spend the money if they wanted to. I mean, this is a moment in time, and the Liberal Party is betraying future generations by not seeing it. They have let down thousands of Australians overseas and left them stranded. It's Thank not you, Senator good Senator enough. Rice, your time's expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And uh, I too would like to make a contribution in this uh, urgency debate. And, and to start with, I just want to put clearly on the record, as I think Senator Keneally and others have done, the constitutional requirement for the federal government to oversight quarantine is, you know, is clear. It is a Commonwealth government responsibility to oversight human quarantine. And I think anyone who's going to write with perfect 2020 hindsight, uh, the history of this pandemic, uh, that is going to be one of the clear 
failures of this government to not immediately take action, to immediately put in place uh, across the board rules in each state and each territory to safeguard the quarantine of, uh, of uh, the nation. And if you look at the Halton report, quite contrary to perhaps popular opinion, the, uh, the instance of uh, travellers uh, returning being, uh, having a positivity rate uh, is 0.66 per cent in the two weeks to 30th of August 2020 and a rate as, as low as 0.30 per cent based on 22 diagnoses of COVID-19 in excess of 6,500 international travellers. Now we know that one uh, case is capable of being, um, you know, affecting community transmission and being an exponential uh, growth in the uh, in the uh, in, in the rate of uh, contact in the virus. But I think when the when the history is written, it's going to be very clear that the Commonwealth had an opportunity, and it saw the Ruby Princess, it saw the Victorian experience, a similar smaller experience in South Australia where if there had been one set of rules across the nation on, in the states and territories in respect to how we were going to treat this quarantine issue, there would have been less failure in repatriating people quickly and effectively. And I mean, I know my home state of South Australia, and, and it's a very popular political decision uh, to cease taking any, uh, any more international travellers until we get uh, our situation firmly under control once again. And I know from speaking to many people in my street, in my neighbourhood, that it's very popular. They say, oh, we shouldn't bring them back. We shouldn't bring them back. We should you know, be very hard on it. Why are they over there anyway? Well, they're over there because that's what Australians do. I gave my daughter a 21st birthday present, which was a round-the-world ticket, and it took her four years to come home. Fortunately, there was no pandemic in that time. But had there been a pandemic, I would have been moving heaven and earth and everything else to get her you know, home as quickly as possible. And I really feel for these people who are stranded overseas in dire circumstances. I read the story the other day of a, a woman who lost their job because of the uh, infection rate in London and was now couch surfing and desperately trying to get a, a seat home. And, and it's true. We could bring them home. It's not, it's, as Senator Rice has said, it's not the, it's not the lack of um, planes and seats. It's the lack of a coordinated approach to quarantine. And the ad hoc nature of that uh, implications of it devolving that responsibility to the, state, to the states has set us back 100 years, in my view. Quarantine is simply, human quarantine is simply a Commonwealth responsibility. This government should have done better. And I'll just throw this out. In, at the 13th of July 2015, we had 637 asylum seekers detained in Nauru RPC. I don't think many Australians would realise the costs of running that RPC in 2015, figures of the department, to 30th of April 2015, were $350,419,000. So looking after 500 people, this government was prepared to spend, when you add in the operational costs, the staff costs and the capital costs, nearly half a billion dollars. Well, I'm sure faced with what appears to be a fairly successful operation in the Northern Territory in Howard Springs, where people come in. And I heard early Sunday morning as I drove over to Canberra, uh, a woman ring um, the ABC program, whatever it is, Macca all over, uh, and say, I am so relieved to be here. And all my cohort is so relieved to be here. And we're so thankful to be in the Northern Territory. You know, fairly open environment rather than a closed air conditioning in a city hotel. I mean, most of us in this chamber spent far too much time in hotel rooms. I could not imagine being put in an air conditioned, um, no window, no balcony hotel for 14 days and not allowed out for, for anything, basically. It would be extremely, um, it'd be tough on your mental health, it'd be tough on all sorts of things. So I think that the government had an opportunity to take control and a constitutional obligation to take control. And the Ruby Princess was one area where it failed. And I think, when this, as I've said, this, when this history is written, it's going to be classified as a, at least an abrogation of the uh, constitutional uh, position of the federal government. 
And I know that there's a lot of politics being played around uh, each state and each territory. And COVID incumbency is a very powerful thing. We've seen that over a couple of elections now. And I know that uh, the Premier in uh, Western Australia has been the hardest of all, hardest of all, in terms of uh, implicating his strong border protection. And uh, you know they've faced a, a High Court challenge and uh, won that. So basically, it's not going to change in a hurry. But we've got to think for these 37,000 Australians who probably are becoming increasingly desperate. And Australia is a travelling nation. When we get back to a million Australians overseas at any one point in a year, uh, perhaps we need to have a bit of foresight and look, if there is a problem, what are we going to do? Is it all going to be ad hoc? Are we going to just allow it to stumble and bumble along? Clearly the constitution written by our founding fathers gave the Commonwealth human quarantine as an obligation. And I think it's very clear in this, uh, this Scott Morrison government, uh, the Honourable Scott Morrison, has failed Australians in that respect. And when you contrast what, you know, in another natural disaster like uh, you know, Cyclone Tracy in Darwin, the place was evacuated in three or four days. They threw everything at it. Set a record of passengers on a plane. I was working at Darwin Airport in those days, so I saw it firsthand. The government saw Australians in need and did something immediately and straight away. And if they spent one tenth, one tenth of what they did on five or six hundred IMAs, irregular maritime arrivals, then this problem would have gone away. But that's not the case. We're now looking at people who may not get back to their families for Christmas. And I think it's a crying shame that you know, a federal government has done a lot of good work in this area. I can't be critical of you know, the government in terms of JobKeeper and that sort of thing. Done a lot of great work, but I think it increasingly is becoming more and more obvious in the matter of human quarantine, they abrogated or failed in their responsibility, and that is to Scott Morrison's enduring shame. And I think the legacy will be written, at least an abrogation of their responsibility, if not a downright failure of their responsibility. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. Um, if, if you were to listen to Labor, this government is heartless, uncaring and unfeeling towards the plight of our citizens who are overseas. But nothing can be further from the truth. And Labor are very, very loose with their rhetoric and very loose with their facts when they, when they grab at the heartstrings of Australians to paint the Morrison government as a heartless, unfeeling government that is quite happy to see our citizens languish overseas at the expense of all others. As I said, nothing can be further from the truth. From the very get-go, at the beginning of this pandemic, as early as January, we were talking about what this may mean for international travel. We closed our borders to people coming in from China very early in the piece. In March, our government made people overseas aware that they should seriously consider returning home if there was no requirement for them to stay overseas. And certainly many people did so. And yes, we acknowledge that those who chose not to at the time had their reasons. They may have been in stable employment at the time. Their family circumstances may not have allowed it, and we totally accept that, and no one should be derided for having made the choice to remain where they were. And some of those people now want to return home, for, again, for a variety of reasons, and we are working very hard to facilitate that, to ensure they can come home. Since March, we've returned over 400 and 20,000 Australians to our shores. They have returned home, they're back with their families. And indeed, my office has had many phone calls from people thanking our government for helping them to return home safely without the risk of, going, of getting COVID when they get home. And let's not forget, back in March, National Cabinet agreed on hotel quarantine for all arrivals. National Cabinet, all of the state governments and the federal government all agreed 
that hotel quarantine would be the method that we would apply to ensure that people returning to our shores can do so safely, monitored, securely, to protect our Australians here on shore as well as themselves. And since that time, we have been doing just that. The state governments let us know how many that they could deal with safely and effectively using whatever processes they chose to use. They identified the caps. The state governments identified the caps. And on that note, I commend the New South Wales government for having a cap three times higher than the other states, or nearly three times higher than the other states. We know, and as Senator Keneally knows, because we heard in the COVID committee, the Senate Select COVID committee, that hotel quarantine is the reason why Australia has been so successful at controlling the spread of the virus and vi the virus coming into our shores. We also know, unfortunately, what happens if we push our hotel quarantining system too hard and if we don't have effective control mechanisms in place, because we've seen what happens with Victoria and their tragic second wave. Thankfully, that is over, but we don't want to see that again. So we are committed to ensuring that our hotel quarantine system, working with our state governments, is effective and managed appropriately. We also heard last Thursday at the Senate committee that the result of Victoria's second wave meant that Victoria shut down their borders completely. They didn't accept any returning Australians, and that had a significant impact on our capacity to reshore re our citizens from overseas. But fortunately, Victoria are set to handle foreign arrivals again, and hopefully this time with much needed improvements to their hotel quarantining. This is all to ensure the safety of Australians the safety of Australians both returning home and the safety of Australians onshore. I mean, the other thing that Labor says is that we should just open a national facility. Where? Where can we open this national facility? Senator Keneally last Thursday suggested we reopen our closed detention centres, such as Port Hedland and Baxter. I never thought I'd see the day when Labor was saying we should reopen our detention centres. Now, believe me, Mr Acting Deputy Chair, our government has looked at all options, and we have looked at those closed detention centres, detention centres we're very proud to have closed because we addressed other border issues. But those ones, Port Hedland and Baxter in particular, they're not currently fit to put people into. So you cannot wave a magic wand. This is my message to Senator Keneally. This is my message to Australians out there, because this is about managing expectations. You can't have present a motion to this chamber and miraculously be able to manage 35,000 people pouring onto our shores with nowhere to go, nowhere to be effectively quarantined and not risk our population. Because we're seeing of the arrivals that we're currently dealing with, over 1 per cent of them have COVID. But we're containing that because we've got effective quarantine. The other option that Senator Keneally put forward was Christmas Island, the currently closed areas of Christmas Island. Now, the part, parts of Christmas Island detention centre that are fit for use at this point in time are being used. There is no extra capacity there. 
We have worked with the Northern Territory government. We've reopened the Howard Springs facility, which is currently taking 500 people a week, and negotiations are ongoing to expand that. We've also now negotiated with Tasmania and the ACT, who have now graciously allowed incoming passengers from overseas within what they believe they can effectively manage. This government is doing all it can. We have facilitated 72 repatriation flights to date. That are flights, they are flights wholly and solely committed to people who have registered on DFAT. But the other point that Labor make is that the list of Australians wanting to return home is growing. And that is true because there are people overseas at this moment, Australians overseas, and their situations change. So that list will fluctuate and it will grow as people want to come home and it will, might decline again as people, uh, things settle down overseas. But to hold the claim that our government has failed on a key promise which even Senator Keneally's own quote from the Prime Minister Scott Morrison wasn't a promise. He said, we hope, we hope to have all Australians home by Christmas, as who were on the list on that day. And yes, the list has grown. But since that day, we have had more than 35,000 Australians returned home, which was a far greater number than was originally on the list on the day that the Prime Minister said he hoped to have them return home. So we are very committed to doing all we can to return Australians home in a way that is safe, in a way that ensures we maintain our very good and very strong record on containing COVID on our shores. But my message to everyone listening today is we haven't forgotten our Australians overseas. We are doing all we can Thank you, Senator effectively. Daly. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to support this urgency motion this afternoon because the pr Prime Minister of our country has issued a statement of false hope to the thousands of stranded Australians when he said he would get them home before Christmas. We know uh, that this promise uh, was to 26,800 Australians who at the time were registered as stranded with DFAT. That was back in September. Now we know that the number of stranded Australians who want to come home now stands at some 37,000, and we do expect uh, that it's quite likely that that number will grow. In that time, we know we've seen uh, 35,000 Australians come, come home since the outset of the pandemic. And I think it's a bit rich to say, well, we've already got 35,000 people home. Many of those people came home quickly as they were instructed to uh, uh, under their own steam, no thanks to the government's assistance. Of those 26,800 uh, who were registered with DFAT back in September, 14,000 of them have been able to come home. And I know uh, the great joy and indeed the ending of stress and suffering that comes with families being able to be reunited. Uh, I've seen that firsthand among close friends and family about what a difficult and stressful time this has been, with dozens of tickets booked and dozens of tickets cancelled by airlines, people being bumped from flight after flight after flight. Now, the government says, has said uh, they've tried to cast some blame at state governments for needing to be rational about the number of people that they can afford to let into each state in terms of safely managing those quarantine provisions. And I do understand there has needed to be some limits in order that quarantine can be safely uh, managed. 
But I have to say that when the government said it was organising to prioritise Australians over other people wanting to enter Australia, uh, our inquiries at estimates demonstrated that there was no such plan to ensure that Australians uh, had priority over other people who the Department of Home Affairs has issued a visa for. Up to 70 uh, international students arrived into Darwin this week, and I know that universities made their own private uh, arrangements to be able to do that um, so that they could be safely quarantined. But I fail to see how the government can use as an excuse the lack of suitable options for uh, quarantine provision around the country uh, and that they failed to make provision for that when indeed universities have been able to, in this case, make accommodation uh, for those 70 international students to be able to quarantine. 300 Australians, uh, sorry, 300 foreigners, which should have been 300 Australians, uh, were, uh, were allowed into the country and allowed to take up a place in quarantine by this government when visa holders in business and innovation investment program were issued visas. And when we asked in estimates how this was possible, they said, well, once they'd been issued a visa, it was up to returning Australians and anyone else that had been issued a visa to get a spot on a plane and make their way here. Those very, very limited spots and places on planes. So, in fact, the government had no process or procedure for prioritising Australians being able to take those flights. Anyone with a valid visa to Australia was able to hop on uh, those flights. So, when they say, when they have said stranded Australians would be at the front of the queue, this was a falsehood, and I think many Australians would see it as an absolute slap in the face. So it's all very well for this government to blame the states for their caps. Uh, I have to say, with the lack of support that the Commonwealth has given, the complete non-support for creating uh, Commonwealth places. Uh, instead, our nation has entirely had to rely on the places created by the states. Uh, as Jane Holton uh, revealed, in uh, revealed in her report, travellers can be quarantined under either Commonwealth or state or territory legislation. It was highlighted in her report that it is indeed a viable option for this government to be setting up Commonwealth uh, quarantine facilities. And I simply do not take at face value what those opposite have said, that they've tried and they've looked hard enough at doing that. I know those opposite have raised the fact that Christmas Island uh, is full with its uh, legitimate immigration uses. Well, I have to say uh, that, may, that may well be the case. But why not, why not move people who don't need quarantining for COVID purposes? There are any number of different options that you could potentially look at in order to get Australians home. There are uh, any number of locations around the country that I think could be a viable place in which to conduct quarantine uh, under Commonwealth legislation. And yet, and yet, this Christmas. Thank you, any... Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I speak to the issue of Australians stranded overseas. The health and safety of our Australians, both at home and abroad, is the government's number one priority in these unprecedented times. Global travel and border restrictions that were introduced to curb COVID-19 
resulted in a consular emergency unparalleled in its scale and in its complexity. Without these measures, the pandemic would have hit our nation much harder. We recognise the caps agreed by National Cabinet are making it harder for people to return. We're keenly aware that many Australians face hardship overseas because of global travel restrictions. Many Australians, though, have been able to return, more than 432,000 since the government advised Australians to reconsider their travel needs. DFAT has helped over 31,000 Australians return on over 370 flights, including almost 11,000 people on government facilitated flights. Ten commercial flights have been facilitated by government since 23 October, returning 1,583 Australians to our shores, including a Qantas flight from London that landed in Darwin today with 165 passengers on board, and a Qantas flight from Delhi that landed in Darwin on Saturday with 148 passengers. Since National Cabinet on 18 September, over 39,600 Australians have returned home. Melbourne Airport, our second largest, has not been taking international arrivals since July. And we're pleased, though, that the Victorian government is now working towards 1,120 passengers per week in arriving on commercial flights from 7 December, and further flights will follow. Madam Acting Deputy President, the outrage that's being feigned by the opposi opposition is rather juvenile in this crisis particularly since the mismanagement of the crisis has resulted in states remaining closed to travellers. Labor would have you believe that Australians have been abandoned by the federal government when we all know that it's the Labor premiers running their own dictatorships that have hampered our nation's recovery. We saw what happened when Victoria's Dan Andrews tried to process returned and international travellers and the debacle that followed. Processing quarantined Australians is an important role for responsible leaders. In Queensland, Princess Palaszczuk's desire to close the borders to ensure her own re-election saw Australians and Queenslanders locked out of their homes, and not just the international travellers who wanted to return home. We witnessed families with small children torn apart, the dying denied rights to be with their loved ones in their final moments and the carnage that the closure of Queensland's borders has caused to the tourism businesses that's yet to be fully realised. What chance did Queenslanders stranded in foreign countries have? The answer is none. And the biggest overreaction has been in WA, where Premier Mark McGowan has traded the needs of travellers with a personal popularity contest proving more enticing than responsible leadership. It's interesting now that it's Labor demanding a solution that is truly of its own making. New South Wales has been doing an exceptionally strong job processing international travels. In fact, it has been holding up the absolute weight of this task for the nation. Its excellent record in managing the health crisis, superior contact tracing and a measured approach to closures means they have been carrying the quarantine burden for these failed Labor-led states. The global pandemic is far from over, and we cannot guarantee when international travel will return to a level of normalcy. However, infrastructure, the ABF and DFAT will continue to work to relocate and use any spare capacity to get vulnerable clients on board as a priority. We're helping vulnerable Australians overseas by facilitating access to flights to Australia and providing financial assistance where required through the hardship program. And our consular staff are to be commended for their efforts during this time. The Morrison government is committed to helping Australians to ensure that they can come home as quickly and as safely as possible. Even in the absence of sensible state Labor governance, and we will continue to do that until all Australians are home. The question is that the um, motion be agreed to. All that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Is, is Senator Brockman. 
Uh, yes. Uh, I just, at the request of Senator uh, Rennick, I rise to withdraw the notice of motion given earlier today relating to scientific methods. I believe I don't need to seek leave to do that. Thank you. So I will now proceed to um, the consideration of documents. Building and construction industry. Documents on, are listed on page five of today's order of business. Build, number one, building construction industry. Fair Work Act 2009. Auditor General's report for 2021. Okay. Documents on page five. Senator Urquhart. Madam Acting Deputy President, I take note of document number 14 on page 5 and number 10 on page 5 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, thank you. Is leave granted? Yes, leave's granted. We now go to page 6. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam De uh, Acting Deputy President. I take note of document number 22. 23, 28 on page six, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. We now. Oh, sorry, Senator Seawood. Could oh. I could I just indicate that Senator Steele John I think wants to talk to 28. Yes, thank you. Senator, sorry, Senator Steele John. Okay. Um, would do I have leave to? Uh... You can just continue. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, when, the, when the pandemic first became clear to uh, disabled people, to the entire community, uh, there was a great uh, ripple of, of fear that went through so many communities in Australia, particularly <clears throat> those in high-risk communities, older people, uh, First Nations folks, uh, folks that traditionally uh, don't get good service from the health system at the best of times, uh, and disabled people as well. Because we knew that uh, when times are good, when the system is working as it should, uh, we often struggle uh, to get access to the uh, services to the supports that we need, uh, to the health care services and supports that we need. I have said it before and I will say it again. The average life expectancy of an intellectually disabled person in Australia in 2020 uh, is 25 years less uh, than that of the average Australian. The primary driver of that differential in life expectancy uh, is the poor health outcomes than intellectually disabled folks experience. And this was before the pandemic. So we knew as disabled people uh, that our lives were on the line, that our community was at risk, that urgent action was needed. Uh, and we got to work, disabled people across this country, our organisations across this country, as underfunded as they are, as beleaguered as we are as, uh, as disabled people. Uh, and we were not alone in this. First Nations organisations got together, uh, organisations representing older people got together, and regardless of the threadbare funding uh, that is often available for uh, these national peak organisations to do work, uh, we dropped everything that we could uh, to uh, get government to act, to take the steps and actions needed to safeguard the people that we love, because there was a terrifying realisation that dawned among us that we had been forgotten in the plan, that the pandemic plan that was being actioned with great speed across the country did not include us, that government was not willing to listen, that we were being put to the back of the queue, told we were not a priority. And all around the world, we could see the impact, the conclusion of this lack of 
consultation as disabled people in Italy, in the United Kingdom, were told that you will just have to do the best you can because there will not be enough intensive care support to enable you to live. Now, all these months on, our Royal Commission has finally delivered uh, its report uh, of the inquiry that it held into the Australian government response to the pandemic in relation to disabled people, and it is damning. It is absolutely damning. It finds, among other things, that no Australian government agency made any made any significant effort to consult with disabled people during the early days of the pandemic. And I remember that. I remember those six weeks of terror as it dawned upon all of us that we were nowhere in the plan, that to this government our role was to do the best we could and that if we died, well, then that was an unfortunate reality of a global pandemic. I remember the late night phone calls with advocates across the country as we tried to decide which group to prioritise, which conversation to have, which minister to try to get into the next day. It was awful. It must never happen again. 22 recommendations have been made by the Royal Commission. 22 must be urgently implemented because we are not done with this pandemic yet. A third wave, a fourth wave may well come on the horizon at any point, and it is unacceptable that the government uh, remain unprepared and unable to include disabled people in the response. Our lives should be valued equally. These recommendations must be implemented. Senator Steele John, your time has expired. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Uh, yes, why not? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. So we now turn to page. Oh, Senator Seaw. Page six. I'd also like to take note of uh, item twenty, the National Registration Accreditation Scheme, Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency and National Boards report, and item twenty one, National Health Practitioner Ombudsman's report of 19, uh, 2019-20 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. We now turn to page seven, items 31 and 32. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I take note of documents 31 and 35 on page seven and seek leave to continue my remarks. Um, just, item 35 is for debate, uh, as I understand it, tomorrow. So is leave granted to con leave is granted. Um, now we'll move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Brockman. To ministerial statements. Could I just on behalf of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee, I present the report of the committee on the provisions of the National Commission for Defence and Veteran Suicide Prevention Bill 2020 and a related bill together with the Hansard recording of proceedings and documents presented to the committee. Thank you. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I table an, an implementation progress report concerning the special report of the Aged Care Royal Commission on Aged Care and COVID-19, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Senator McKeel. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Acting. So Oh, so going to speak oh, to sorry. it? Sorry. Minister? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I am pleased to inform the Senate today that this government is delivering on all the recommendations made by the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety in its special COVID-19 report. In Australia, 693 people are living in aged care facilities or getting services at home sadly have died. Each loss of life represents someone's mum, dad, grandparent or cherished friend. And I offer my condolences to all of those who have been impacted by COVID-19. 
Today, the government has tabled an implementation progress report in keeping with the Royal Commission's first recommendation. This implementation report shows every step is being taken to ensure the safety and well-being of senior Australians. The Australian government has already delivered four of the six recommendations and progress is well underway on the final two. As previously stated, the lead geriatrician of the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre and a member of the HPPC Aged Care Clinical Advisory Committee, Associate Professor Michael Murray said, Australia was as well prepared for a significant aged care outbreak as any country or jurisdiction in the world, with the probable exception of Hong Kong. Professor Murray, who was also clinical, head of clinical medicine, uh, geriatric medicine at Austin Health and adjunct uh, associate professor at La Trobe University's Centre for Evidence-Based Aged Care said, despite being as good or indeed the second best, it was not possible to prevent incursion into the aged care sector or any other vulnerable community during a mass community outbreak. Prevention of mass community transmission remains the first and best defence of any, for any community, and that was the first line of defence on, on the Australian government's plan. Importantly, it is worth noting that 97 per cent of residential aged care facilities in, in Australia have had no residents with COVID-19 cases. Madam Acting De Deputy President, we have increased our initial investment in the COVID-19 supplement from $205.3 million to a total of $422.9 million, directly responding to recommendation two, to support aged care providers with COVID-19 related costs. This means that aged care facilities can have adequate staff to keep their doors open to family and friends, ensuring residents don't become isolated. At the same time, revised visitation guidelines endorsed by the Australian Health Protection Principle Protection Principle Committee outline how residents can be protected in the least restrictive manner, balance, balancing their health needs with their personal well-being. And I should also mention, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, the Visitation Code of Conduct, which was led, uh, developed and led by Consumer Peaks and the industry. In addition, senior Australians are taking advantage of increased services for advocacy, grief and trauma support. This $19 million investment has produced, significant, has produced significant resources, including a dedicated COVID-19 support line for older Australians. The Royal Commission's special report outlined barriers for aged care residents in receiving the allied health and mental health care they need. In response to recommendation three, we're investing an additional $63.3 million to extend allied and mental health services for aged care residents. From the 10th of December, Extending these services will mean aged care residents can now receive up to 20 Medicare subsidised individual psychological therapy sessions with a practitioner of their choice, in line with the services available to everyone else in the broader community. We're also removing barriers and increasing access to essential allied health services for aged care residents. This means residents with a chronic disease management plan will have access to extra Medicare subsidised physiotherapists, occupational therapists and exercise physiologist sessions. In recognition of the COVID-19 outbreaks have had on many residents in uh, aged care facilities, we are going beyond the recommendations of the Royal Commission to support group therapy sessions in affected residential aged care facilities, to rebuild muscle strength and reduce the risk of falls following periods of lockdown and in inactivity. In line with recommendation four, we have updated the National COVID-19 Aged Care Plan. It is critical to ensure a national approach is, ta is taken to protect vulnerable senior Australians. The Australian government has continuously built and adapted the plan since 19 January 19, uh, 2020. As a part of that, we have worked side by side with state and territory governments to implement additional infection prote prevention and control training, establish joint approaches to the management of outbreaks and stand ready to activate emergency response arrangements when required. Also, as recommended, the Australian Health Protection Principles Committee, or HPPC, Aged Care Advisory Group, composed of national experts in aged care, geriatric health, infection control and emergency response, has been made permanent. This committee will continue to inform how to address outbreaks and update advice for providers. 
As endorsed by Recommendation 5, Madam Acting Deputy President, a robust, well-trained infection prevention control expert work workforce is being implemented, with a $217.6 million investment to, into residential aged care providers to employ an infection prevention control lead. Recommendation 6 advocates for Australian, state and territory governments and infection prevention control experts to work collaboratively. We are continuing to strengthen our preparedness for responding to a rapid escalation of COVID-19 in the aged care sector, learning from ongoing outbreaks, sharing knowledge and insights and prioritising training and assessments with aged care providers. To meet this recommendation, Madam Acting Deputy President, the Australian Government is doubling its contribution under the National, COVID National Partnership on COVID-19 Response to support this recommendation. That means that the Commonwealth Government will fund up to 100 per cent of activities undertaken by states and territories to support aged care services through infection prevention and control training, preparedness and response. Madam Acting Deputy President, in total the Australian Government has invested more than $1.7 billion in the aged care sector since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically to deal with COVID-19. While we hope there isn't another COVID outbreak in aged care facilities or home care, we are dedicated to putting everything in place quickly to ensure our senior Australians are protected throughout the pandemic and through the covered COVID recovery phases. This was evident in the rapid and effective response to the recent cluster event in South Australia. We know, and we've seen it so many times, where there is community transmission, there is a risk to aged care residents in local facilities. The loss of lives in Australia has underlined our fierce determination to ensure every effort is made to ensure it doesn't happen again. And I'm delighted to report that there have been no active cases of COVID-19 in aged care recipients in Australia since the 28th of October. One South Australian residential aged care facility does have four staff with COVID-19 and they are appropriately in isolation and being cared for. And the facility is being monitored closely with a regular testing regime. The successful shift in the tide for Australia comes as the battle against this virus continues around the globe. That is why we must not become complacent, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Australian Government is leading a systematic change in the nation's aged care sector to deliver an aged care system that meets senior Australians' needs and expectations. We are committed to building on the work underway and to elevate the key focus of improving the health, safety and wellbeing of aged care residents, home care recipients and their families. We will continue to work with our state and territory colleagues, aged care providers, peak bodies, industry partners and to transform aged care and provide Australians with a choice and control over the care and services they need as they age. Madam Acting Deputy President, we look forward to receiving the Royal Commission's final report in February, and we will con carefully consider all its recommendations, just as we have carefully considered and responded rapidly to the Commission's special report on COVID-19. The report tabled to today shows holistic, coordinated and considered actions to tackle the cr a critical threat, threat to the health and being of our senior Australians. I thank the Senator. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy Acting President. I uh, move to take note of the ministerial statement uh, from Minister Colbeck. I start by making clear that the Labor Party's capacity to respond to the substance of the minister's statement to the Senate is limited. It's limited because the minister has displayed a high degree, an unusual degree, of secrecy around this statement. It is the usual practice, the usual courtesy displayed by ministers in the Senate to provide a copy of a ministerial statement to the shadow minister in advance of tabling it. I can advise the Senate and thereby advise the workers in aged care and advise the residents in aged care and advise their families who care for them that that did not happen. We got a the shadow minister for aged care received a copy of this report at 6 p.m. at 6 p.m. by email. In fact, it's been incredibly hard to even work out 
the purpose of this ministerial statement from the minister today. So allergic is this Morrison government to scrutiny. So fearful are they of scrutiny in their custodianship of the aged care portfolio, in their custodianship of the care provided to our parents and grandparents in aged care, that they couldn't even bother to provide adequate usual courtesies of giving the statement to the shadow minister prior to giving it here in the Senate today. But why should we be surprised? This is a minister who has turned his back on the scrutiny of this place. A minister who persists in his role, despite being censured by this Senate for his mishandling of the COVID pandemic in aged care, it demonstrates he's learnt nothing. The Aged Care Royal Commission special report provided the scrutiny that the government clearly needed. And really, it's not just the government that needed it. It is the residents of aged care in Australia that desperately needed it. It is the staff who work tirelessly in aged care, underpaid, overworked. They need this scrutiny too. And the government's response is important. It's important for the families and the loved ones of the 685 people, older Australians who died from COVID in aged care. The government's response will be scrutinized by the opposition. We'll look to see what they've learnt, to see if their mistakes will be repeated. The minister and the Morrison government ignored warning after warning and failed to protect for COVID-19 in aged care. They displayed, they displayed the pretense of a plan. Who can forget the Prime Minister standing up and waving around what he said? Australian Health Sector Emergency Response for Aged Care. There it is. Section 4.1.4. The Australian government will also be responsible for aged care facilities. Black and white. The government said they had a plan. The government said they were responsible for aged care facilities and the maintenance of PPE, of infection control, of workforce protection, of looking after our parents and grandparents in the middle of a global pandemic. They said in this document that they were responsible. And then when we had an outbreak, what did they do? They found someone else to blame. What does Scott Morrison do when he's under scrutiny and under pressure? He finds someone else to blame. And he tried to pretend all of a sudden that aged care had nothing to do with him. It wasn't a federal government responsibility. Lo and behold, it's a public health responsibility. It's all the states, just like quarantine, just like Ruby Princess, just like everything else to do with this pandemic. Scott Morrison has looked for someone else to blame, and it's usually a state government. It's usually a state government because apparently all the things that the Commonwealth is supposed to be doing under our constitution and under our federal system, border control, aged care, quarantine, suddenly they are no longer federal responsibilities. They sit with the states and when it goes right, Scott Morrison is there to take credit and when it goes wrong, he avoids the blame and finds someone else someone else to blame for his failure. Now, I just want to point out to those who might be watching this debate, this government this week tabled another report into uh, the operation of the Aged Care Act in 2019-20. And this goes to the hubris of this government when it comes to aged care. That report failed to acknowledge a single death from COVID-19 in aged care facilities. We've got an Aged Care Report, Aged Care Act 2019-20, not one acknowledgement of the fact that 685 people died in residential aged care. Perversely, this report congratulates the government for its achievements in infection control, minimizing transmission, and maintaining a safe environment in aged care facilities. I mean, talk about patting yourself on the back. That's going to be really cold comfort to the almost 700 families with a loved one who contracted COVID-19 and died in an aged care facility this year. The Royal Commission into the Aged Care and Quality Services Special Report into COVID-19 stated that the Morrison government 
did not have a plan for COVID-19 in aged care. I noticed the minister got up his statement today and began with a whole lot of laudatory comments from supposed experts. I don't know. They might be experts. I don't know them personally. I do know one person who's an expert, and that is the Royal Commission, staffed with experts appointed by this government. They're experts in aged care. They've been studying the problem. What did they say? They said the statement in this document, this plan, was no plan at all. That the Morrison government did not have a plan for COVID when it came to aged care. And by the way, let me just acknowledge the remarks of Senator Steele, John, earlier when he said the government didn't have a plan for disability when it came to COVID. He's right. He's absolutely right. Age care, disability, the vulnerable, leaving people behind, just like stranded Australians. This government is leaving people behind. And it is shameful when they are leaving behind our grandparents, our parents, vulnerable older Australians who cared for their, their children, who built their businesses, who contributed to their community, who fought in wars. These are the people this government is leaving behind to fend for themselves. The Royal Commission's report into aged care for COVID-19, this special report, stated that there was difficulty for aged care workers accessing PPE. There was insufficient infection control training for aged care workers. There was no surge force work. There was no surge workforce strategy document. It's not like they didn't have warning. Earl Haven in Queensland, Dorothy Henderson Lodge in New South Wales, New March House. These were all warnings that they didn't heed. To listen to this government, to listen to this minister, you'd think that they couldn't have possibly imagined ever having to replace an entire workforce at an aged care facility. It had already happened a year earlier, and yet they had no plan for it. They did not have any idea of how many, of how many aged care staff were working across multiple sites. If there's one thing that this COVID pandemic has exposed, it's not just the shocking neglect of the Morrison government when it comes to aged care it is also the shocking impact of insecure work, of people who do not have job security, who have to work multiple casual jobs. And yet when it, came to, and when it comes to aged care, that happens. We know it happens. We know that it happens. And yet this government had no plan to try and understand the extent to which it was happening. Again, a failure to imagine, to anticipate, to plan when it comes to the impact of COVID in aged care. And the lessons learned from the early mistakes in aged care were kept secret for too long. They were not made public in a timely manner, and the capacity for the entire sector to learn and adjust. And by the way, I'm tired of hearing how much we are learning. 700 people later, dead, we should have learned a lot earlier. And I'm also tired of hearing this government say that they put $1.7 billion into the aged care sector to deal with COVID-19, because you know how much they cut out of aged care when Scott Morrison was treasurer? $1.7 billion, the exact same amount. Don't pat yourselves on the back over there that you put $1.7 billion in when you took $1.7 billion out under this prime minister when he was treasurer. That is the neglect. The Aged Care Royal Commission has an interim report into this government's handling of the aged care sector, and it is titled Neglect. It talks about people starving in their beds, soiled in their bedclothes, ants and maggots in their wounds. That is what we went into COVID with, an aged care system under neglect. 700 people died. For this government to continue to pat themselves on the back is a shame, and neglect is the shame of our aged care system. Senator Keneally, thank you. Uh, Senator Seawood. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise to uh, take note of the ministerial response and the ministerial statement in response to the Royal Commission's report into aged care quality and safety report, Aged Care and COVID-19, a special report. Well, government makes a lot of the $1.7 billion that has been, they claim, invested since the, for the pandemic into the sector. Of course, if the sector had been running effectively, we wouldn't have needed to be injecting $1.7 billion. It was quite obvious the sector was not ready to handle a pandemic. It had multiple, multiple issues, as is evident from the fact that we've got a Royal Commission in the first place. Now, here we have the government saying 
They've got an updated, they've got an updated plan in response to the recommendation four, which is to establish a national aged care plan for COVID-19 through the national cabinet in consultation with the aged care sector. But what the government says in the report that we've just that has just been tabled and that we've all just laid eyes on, the updated national COVID aged care plan. Well, the Royal Commission clearly felt there wasn't and knew, in fact, that there wasn't an aged care plan. But the government continues on the, the myth that there was an aged care plan. It, in fact, wasn't just the general plan where they ripped the cover off and put a new cover on that said aged care. They've updated that. And I hope it's more than just changing the title page of the report. Now, the, what's also in the funding that's allocated here, which of course is welcome, shall I, uh, I must say, which is the investment in mental health care and in allied health care. Now, the very interesting thing to note here is the government has now decided they can invest in better access in aged care facilities. For some of us who have been around in this joint for quite a long time, we advocated and advocated and advocated to extend better access to aged care. So first off, I'll say thank you goodness that now it's been extended, but why for all these years have we gone through this flawed approach of allocating a bit of separate money, which was better than nothing, I will admit, but separate money for mental health in aged care that had to be diverted, then delivered through the PHNs, all different around the country, which meant that somebody in aged care facility could not get the same mental health supports that anybody else in the community could get. But now, all of a sudden, from the 10th of December, they can get it. Oh, but it's only for six months. Finishes in June next year, so then aged care residents have to go back to the same old, same old, where they do not get adequate mental health support. Now, when we look at that allied health, again, I will preface this with only having had a chance to have a brief look at it. It's only the funding will be targeted to aged care residents living in facilities which experience outbreaks and will fund initial assessment on adult health consultations for a six-month period, again, only for six months. Now, my reading of this is it's only for those that had the outbreak. Well, we know many, many, many aged care facilities around this country have been in lockdown where they haven't been able to receive visits and supports and the sorts of and the sorts of allied health that they need, and on top of that, they don't get proper access to allied health services in any case. Again, only for six months. So while the government's making much of all this new money, as was articulated early, there's been a whole lot of money taken out of aged care over the years, but this so-called new money, whereas it's only available for six months. Now, I know the government's going to say, oh, Royal Commission will be rolling out, though that's being reported in February, and therefore we'll be rolling out new services. But they won't be rolling them out that quickly, folks, because they didn't adequately cover this in the budget, the last budget, and of course the next budget's not till May next year. So what do people do in the interim? They will not have access to mental health services. They will not have access to allied health services. In terms of staffing, we all know, we all know that aged care are understaffed. The staff go above and beyond, absolutely. They've had to work across multiple facilities, and they will have to continue to do that across Australia, which is a perfect, again, perfect tsunami, potentially, if we get further waves or outbreaks of coronavirus in our states. We're going to be back to the same old, same old, where we have inadequate level of staffing, where staffing aren't getting adequately paid, where staff don't get adequately paid. So it's the same circumstances. We could well end up in those same circumstances. We need to make sure that we have a staffing system that ensures that we have 
four hours, and I think it's 18 minutes worth of care for residents. We need to make sure that we have the, the staffing expertise there that can deliver clinical care, because that is not being delivered in residential aged care facilities right now. Now, also in the report here is the fact the AHPPC has set up a subcommittee for aged care. Now, we have been through the COVID committee uphill and down dale to try and get the advice that AHPPC provides. And do you think we can get that? No. Senator McGallagher, uh, sorry, McCall um, sorry, not McAllister, <laughs> um, Gallagher will tell you very clearly how much we have been pushing in the COVID committee to try and get access to that advice. They also claim to have consumer advocacy. But last time I asked about this, there was no residents on that committee, nobody with actual lived experience. And that is not to cast aspersions on, on the consumer ad, uh, advocate that's there, but they don't have lived experience. What about nothing for us without us? People in residential aged care deserve a voice and deserve to have input into that committee. And again, just this morning we were talking about transparency when Senator Griff was trying to is moving uh, amendments and a bill to actually try and get better transparency for the aged care sector, and yet well, here we have a body providing advice to the AHPPC that's not transparent, where the community can't see that advice. Residents in aged care expect the best quality care. Families expect the best quality care, not more ad hoc decision making with bits of money being dripped in here, dripped in there, going for short periods of time. I'll come, I'll come back to the issues around mental health services. Across the board, we have, and all the experts are talking about it, a, pan, a mental health pandemic. And aged care residents are right up there suffering from the effects of the pandemic, particularly in Victoria but across the country, where they haven't been able to see their loved ones, where they've had to see their loved ones through glass holding up their hands. They've missed birthdays. They've missed so many family occasions. They need ongoing mental health services that aren't limited and they need access to better access or whatever that looks like after the review, but they need guaranteed access to mental health services and allied health services and clinical care and a staffing level that's guaranteed to provide the best quality care. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Is there oh. anyone else seeking the call to respond to the ministerial statement? Is leave granted for uh, Senator um, Senator keep the matter? Thank you. Um, if I could ask, the question is that the uh, motion moved by Senator Colbert. Being in continuation, then we adjourn it to the next day, and the question is that the motion moved by Senator Colbert. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of a committee. Minister. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of a committee. Um, is leave granted? Leave being granted. Thank you. Uh, I move that Senator Carr replace Senator Urquhart on the Environment and Communications References Committee for the committee's inquiry into media diversity in Australia and Senator Urquhart be appointed as a participating member. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Ciselja, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. 
I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forward, forwarding the Higher Education Legislation Amendment Provider Category Standards and Other Measures Bill 2020 for, for, for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the bill moved by Senator Seselja be proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. I call the clerk. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to higher education and for related purposes. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have a second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I, Minister. Move, I move the debate now be adjourned. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Seselja be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr Passon to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works. <coughs> Uh, the President has received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 13 laws, details of which will be incorporated into Hansard. Call the clerk. Government Business ordered the day number one, Appropriation Bill number one, 2020-21, and two related bills, uh, resumption of debate on second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Sheldon on behalf of Senator Gallagher. And Senator Watt in continuation, and do we have a time on the clock? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Nackety, Acting Deputy President. I'll uh, get through the remainder of my speech in the next seven minutes, having uh, begun just before question time today. I'm sure members, uh, senators opposite, have been waiting with bated breath for me to resume this speech. <laughs> and I, I aim not to disappoint. Um, what I was talking about prior to question time, when we were debating this bill was that there's an alarming tendency in this government, which we're seeing again this week, to clutch at any piece of data which they say indicates that the economy is performing well under their stewardship. And as I foreshadowed, we have already seen that this week in relation to what the government expects is going to come out of the national accounts data later in the week. The government is preparing the ground for that data uh, to, and for their intentions to show that the recession in Australia is over. And we saw a little bit of that from the government in question time today. And as I was saying before question time, if we do see this continued pattern from the government in arguing that the economy has recovered uh, and that things are going tickety-boo in the Australian economy, all that will demonstrate is exactly how out of touch this government is with what is really happening out there in Australia. Uh, even the most recent unemployment figures we had showed that unemployment is now at 7 per cent, with another 10.4 per cent of the Australian population underemployed. So that's over 17 per cent of the Australian population either out of work or seeking more hours than they can find. So that's one way of seeing that whatever the government might be saying, in fact, many Australians are doing it really tough right now. Uh, and that old barometer of the state of the economy, empty shops, uh, I do a lot of travelling in my job. Uh, in the last couple of weeks alone, I've been in Darwin, in Rockhampton, in Brisbane, the Gold Coast, and probably other places as well um, that I've, I've forgotten. Uh, and everywhere I go, you see empty shops in shopping districts. And even from talking to some of my colleagues today, similar things are going on in their towns and cities right across Australia. So again, whatever we see and hear from the government about the state of the economy improving, uh, both that sort of anecdotal evidence and statistical evidence in the form of data that's coming through the Bureau of Statistics shows that, in fact, 
things are really tough for people at the moment. And people are particularly concerned about what this government's plans are come March, when the JobKeeper payment is scheduled to end, when the coronavirus supplement is scheduled to end, and when we also expect to see banks calling in loans uh, from uh, small businesses and from homeowners who have been able to defer their mortgage. So already, under this government's leadership, we're seeing more pain to Australians and to the wider Australian economy than is necessary because this government has made decisions to exclude so many people from receiving JobKeeper. The government has wound down JobKeeper and the coronavirus supplement too soon before the economy has fully recovered. And in defiance of warnings from the Reserve Bank of Australia and other economic experts who have warned the government that they should not be withdrawing support too soon. But that's exactly what we're seeing from this government. Uh, and we saw it again in the budget, uh, which this bill relates to, where the government has made a conscious decision to continue excluding categories of people and categories from, of workers from receiving government support. Just one example in this, in this year's budget is that uh, the government's decision to exclude workers over the age of 35 from rece receiving the hiring subsidy means that nearly a million people who are aged over 35 and are currently unemployed will not be able to attract a hiring subsidy from the government when they seek employment with a new employer. That is obviously going to lead employers to exclude older workers from receiving not just the hiring subsidy, but from actually getting a job. And we already know from the figures that are coming out of the government's Bureau of Statistics and other economic commentators that older workers are finding it harder to find work and are languishing on the unemployment queues longer. Yet this government has decided in its budget to exclude those older workers from receiving the hiring subsidy. Again, another example of the government's conscious decisions making things worse for people, extending the recession, deepening the recession, prolonging the pain. It doesn't have to be this way. We have, we have been attempting to get the government to reverse course on some of these decisions, whether it be excluding old, older workers from receiving the hiring subsidy, whether it be the decision in what seems like years ago, but was only months ago, to exclude casuals, to exclude migrant workers, to exclude universities at workers, to exclude council workers, arts and entertainment workers and many other categories from re receiving the JobKeeper payment. So it's this government's decisions uh, that are making things worse for so many Australians, uh, making the recession go longer than it needs to be. Of course, there were so many other things that were missing from the budget that the country desperately needs from this government. There was no plan for childcare, no proper plan for aged care, uh, no plan for energy policy, um, no plan for the future of job seeker recipients. So many things that are essential to the current state of the economy, but also to setting Australia up to really rebound from this recovery. And all of those things have been omitted by the government. They seem to be putting all their eggs in the basket of granting tax concessions to business, some of which we support, but that's not enough on its own. There are so many other things that this government needs to be doing and isn't doing to make sure that we do come out of the recession as quickly as possible. And it is a real shame that, in contrast, what this government does is keep making decisions that are going to make the recession worse. Call Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, so tonight I'll also add contribution to um, the Senate's consideration of the appropriation bills before it. Uh, as we know, budgets come and go in this place. Some are of great consequence and some less so. And some budgets serve to illustrate a bold vision for our nation's future, whereas others might instead seek to reinforce our progression down a path already decided. Regardless of what type of budget any budget might be, each one gives us an insight into the character of the government which presents it. Each one tells us a great deal 
about what the government sees as important. There is no doubt that this budget, with some big numbers in it, such as a $213 billion deficit this financial year, with cumulative deficit of $480 billion over the forward estimates. Net debt will blow out to $703 billion this year alone, growing to $966 billion before too long. Gross debt, on the other hand, is forecast to reach $1.7 trillion over the decade. Now, with numbers this large, Acting Deputy President, Australians have a right to wonder and know where the money is going. What does this government see as important? Now, we know that this budget falls flat in the areas that really matter most. We know that it doesn't go far enough to either protect or create jobs, nor does it illustrate a bold vision that our country desperately needs or form part of a comprehensive plan to secure our nation's future economic prosperity. Last week, I had the pleasure of joining Labor's Shadow Minister for Agriculture and Resources, the member for Chifley, out in Gippsland in Victoria. And for those who may have never had the pleasure of visiting Gippsland, uh, it was quite an enjoyable road trip, I must say, and uh, described as many as God's country. The region is famed for the quality of its agricultural products, brimming with lush fields of green where vegetables are grown and cows wander. And as part of our travels with the member for Chifley, we met Sally Jones, an owner of a local dairy farm, Gippsland, Jersey. Now, Gippsland, Jersey is a small dairy producer with multiple farms across the Gippsland region. It was founded by Sally with the mission of supporting smaller family farms by paying them a fairer farm price for their milk, sidestepping the major processes. Now, from humbling beginnings, the business has grown to produce not just milk, but cream, butter, yogurt, and other value-added products. And I'd also like to add ice cream. Sally even has plans to produce many other fantastic products in the future. And I guess this is a, a great example of small business doing great things for their local community and for the region. And I'd like to see governments on both sides of uh, the political persuasion to support businesses like this, especially in the regions. Madam Acting Deputy President, Gippsland Jersey is a quintessential Australian success story and Sally and her team have very, and should be very proud of themselves and have much to offer. Businesses like hers are those which we in this place ought to be supporting. Businesses like hers should be able to count on the Australian government for support especially in the middle of a recession. I mean, there is so much opportunity in Gippsland and for primary producers, and they need to be encouraged to value add what they produce, to keep the farmland in the hands of Australians and keep profits in the pockets of regional Australia. Unfortunately, this budget is one that leaves far too many people behind. And as I mentioned earlier, budgets speak to the character of the governments that deliver them. So we shouldn't be too surprised to see a budget that leaves people behind because this government has always left people behind, unfortunately. If you need more proof of this, go and speak to the many timber workers of my home state, particularly those who have been who have been impacted by the uncertainty surrounding the Central Highlands Regional Forestry Agreement. Madam Acting Deputy President, I have spoken to these timber workers, I have visited and had a lot to say. And Again, last week, the member for Chifley and I visited Australian Sustainable Hardwoods in Hayfield, a world-class sustainable timber mill. Ash, as it is better known, is a mighty business. World class, in fact. 
the scale and sophistication of its operations are something that we should all be impressed about, and any Australian who might have the opportunity to witness it should go down there and pay a visit. Whilst Ash has worked hard to build itself into the success business it is today, it has often had to struggle as a result of the lack of support from this government and also that of my home state, Victoria. After all, it is on the watch of this government that their economic future has been thrown into some doubt, whether it is through the lack of work to shore up uh, the regional forestry agreements or the bungling of relationship with one of our most important trading partners, which has seen quality Australian timber turned away on the tarmac. One is left to wonder, Madam Acting De Deputy President, what do the folks at Gippsland Jersey and Australian Sustainable Hardwood get out of the biggest budget blowout in our time? What money is heading their way to support them and to grow their future? Heavens, don't we know that this government likes to talk about its economic credentials? And as we heard earlier from Senator Watt, you know, even earlier today, the government continues on as if there is nothing wrong. Don't we know how they like to tell us that they're good economic managers? Tell that to the additional 160,000 people who are going to join the jobless queues by Christmas. Tell that to the 2,000 Qantas workers who are about to lose their jobs. Tell that to the thousands who are going to have their job keeper ripped out from under them or the thousands who are going to find their bills hard to meet as job seeker is slashed. What little support Australians were able to rely on over the course of this year as we experience a once in a century economic downturn, the government came to only offer far too many had already been forced to suffer. We know this government didn't want to implement a wage subsidy and we know they never wanted to raise the rate of new start to a livable wage. It was pressure from the community pressure from Labor and others in this place that eventually brought them to the table. And whilst we got ourselves to here and what is the plan for the recovery, and that is the question that we're all been asking, what's the next step? How exactly is this government going to help Australia bounce back? Well, we know we can count on them for one thing. We can count on them to be there for the announcements. This government relies on these announcements for the headlines. They relish the photo opportunity, the media release, the quick interview and the social media post. What they don't relish is the delivery. What they can't be counted on for is to do the actual things that matter to most Australians. The doing. Take the shortages in our horticulture industry as one example. There is the government, those opposite, both national and liberal, unveiling a new pot of money and a half-page plan. Day one, all is well. The announceable is a success. The media mentioned locked in. Go back on day two, day 20, day 200. All the flashy subsidies are still there. As shiny as the day, they'll be un as they were un unveiled because they barely have been used. The thousands of new workers that were promised turn out to only number in dozens. But by the time the roadshow has moved on to the next announcement and the one after, the problems still persist with the homework, the hard work of service delivery left undone. But don't take my word for it. Go and speak to the many farmers in my home state. The broccoli farmers in South Gippsland, the strawberry farmers in Queensland, they'll tell you Good luck finding the solutions, though, because they can't, and they are desperately needing people to pick the harvest as we enter over the next period in summer. And you won't find it because these are Australians that have been left behind. They they have a problem too hard, one that government would rather be that would rather be forgotten, and they're not alone. They're not the only ones that the government has left behind. At a time when so many Australians are in need and so many industries need a leg up, this government is missing in action. Last week, I also met with representatives of the Gippsland Food and Fibre and visited a local business in Locke, the Locke Brewery and Distillery. And the folks at, uh, at Locke Brewery and Distillery have created a fine local business set 
in a very picturesque regional village. And there is success, starting with a still you could fit on this desk, now having just one about as big as your living room. No one can say that they're not having a go, but they are having a go. They've gone from making beer to making whisky to making gins and even their own Negroni. But are they getting a go? They're the kind of people that we ought to be backing, and yet the government can often make their lives harder with taxation obligations and other measures that get in the way of them doing what they do best. Sure, they're being grateful to have JobKeeper, and many businesses have a scheme of merit that we on this side also supported. But now, what is the plan beyond JobKeeper? What is the plan beyond JobSeeker? What is the plan for jobs and getting this country back on track, getting our economy moving again? What is the plan for regional Australia? We need a, ro a roadmap going forward, a government with vision and one that isn't afraid to put in the hard yards to get the outcomes our country desperately needs. Sadly, all that's going right now is a shiny media release and a whole bunch of debt. At the end of the day, Australians deserve better, and they really do need a government that's going to be on their side. Thank you, Senator Shikoni. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise tonight to speak on this appropriations bill and, in doing so, um, take the opportunity to um, talk again about this government's budget. Uh, budgets, as we know, are incredibly important documents. But in a recession, in this recession particularly, this budget could not be more important. But it's not just what's written down on paper that matters. In a recession like this, it's important what governments do, because governments have a job to do during recessions, to lead the country in an economic plan, to drive investment, to create jobs, and to make the most of the opportunities that we know this terrible recession has brought about for our community. It's about action. It's about doing things, rolling up your sleeves, getting things done, delivering on your promises. But we know when it comes to delivering promises, the only thing that the Morrison government is fast-tracking at the moment is announcements. They have no plan to deliver to deliver on these announcements. We know they've made many announcements before the election when they were asking the Australian people for their vote. And yet those announcements, even in a recession, remain undelivered. The Morrison government has their priorities wrong, and we know that they have underspent so far on housing, on nation-building infrastructure. They've spent plenty of money on advertising what their slogans are and um, putting up signs in shopping centres and on bus stops to tell the Australian public that there's an economic comeback on the way. But when you strip away the advertising and the slogans and the marketing, what we know we have is a very deep recession, a huge amount of debt, record deficits, but we need to know what we'll have to show for it after all this is done. How will this government build our nation back? At the moment, this budget, this document, does not show the way forward for the Australian people. This government has presided over record unemployment with one million unemployed, and its forecast to remain unacceptably high for unacceptably long. Young people particularly have been hit hard by this crisis. The government's hiring credit subsidies are not enough to so support the secure and permanent jobs that they need in the future. The hiring credit scheme hurts 
the 928,000 Australians over 35 who have been excluded from the program. The Morrison government has formed with fail, has formed with failed policies when it comes to targeting youth unemployment. We know that programs like the PATH program, which was so ineffectively, was quietly cut. 678 elder Australians have died in aged care during the coronavirus pandemic. But this budget doesn't include measures that are needed to make sure that there are enough workers on site, enough PPE, and the measures that we need to make sure that it never happens again. But I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to talk about this budget, particularly speaking ahead of the minister, because it means that I'll be able to uh, bring to the attention of the, the Senate and those opposite the one thing in the budget papers that I was really looking for on budget night. And I know that as the budget papers get dropped off around this place and people open them up and they're scanning through to try to find where are the jobs going to be? Where are the promises? How will we overcome these issues? There was one particular forward payment that I was looking for. As a Queenslander and a senator based in Cairns, housing is one of the biggest issues for people living in far north Queensland. It is one of the biggest issues that is holding back economic development, that is holding back the health and well-being of people living in Queensland. So when I looked to find what the remote housing funding commitment was from this government for the many years to come, you wouldn't be surprised to find out. As you flip through the pages, page 43 of the Federal, Federal Financial Relations Budget Paper number three, remote housing in Queensland for the next financial year and the one after that and the one after that, there is nothing. There is nothing in this budget, a recession budget, when we need to rebuild, when we need to create jobs, there is nothing in this budget that will make sure that we deal with the remote housing issue in far north Queensland. And can I tell you that I have stood here many times, many times be since becoming a senator, having the opportunity to travel through Cape York and the Torres Strait and to see the very um, desperate need for social housing, for remote housing. I've stood up here and I've gotten angry about it. And I've decided to not get angry tonight, but just explain to the Senate, to the minister, and to the people sitting opposite, the members of the government, why we need this fixed now. COVID was an opportunity for this government to understand how important it is for people to have a house. You can't isolate from coronavirus if you don't have a house. You can't isolate from coronavirus if you're living in a house with 28 to 30 people. But in our country, in the state of Queensland, under this government, that is exactly the situation that we face. And we were desperately concerned when there were outbreaks across the country, knowing the full situation about overcrowding and housing, that if if a case of coronavirus were to make it its way to the far north Queensland and to the Cape York or Torres Strait, it would be incredibly difficult to isolate any single individual or family. I've visited places like Yarrabah. I've visited places like Arakoon. I've been to the Torres Strait all over the islands there. I have visited places in Cairns that desperately need social housing. We need remote housing now. What did the government do in the budget? Well, they didn't deliver any reoccurring ongoing funding. And what that means for people living in far north Queensland is that the government went around before the election and asked for their vote. And they told them that they would deliver $100 million of remote housing to councils directly. 
They said, we will fund $100 million of remote housing. They didn't say to them at the time that they weren't going to continue to fund remote housing, but now we know that that money is a one-off. It's a one-off, and when it's gone, there'll be nothing more. So what has happened now through this budget is they have decided that now is the time during an economic recession, during a COVID-19 economic health crisis and recession, that now is the time that they should wash their hands of Indigenous communities in far north Queensland that need houses to survive. The money that they promised before the last election, $105 million, well, do you know how much money they've actually delivered to communities in far north Queensland? None of that. $5 million of that money has been transferred to the state. We are still waiting on $100 million. And sure, it appears on a, a line and small font on a piece of paper in the budget. But when you actually find out what this government has done when it comes to remote housing, after all the promises before the last election, after they went around, stood up in Cape York and told people that they would deliver housing for far north Queensland, for the Cape, for our First Nations people. They told them that and they said, vote for us because we will deliver housing for you. Well, they haven't delivered a single cent of that money. They haven't delivered a single cent of that money. Not a single house has been built after that promise over 12 months ago. And during the budget, when the government had the chance, to deliver ongoing, reoccurring funding to make sure that for many generations we were able to make sure that people have housing, that kids are not growing up in a house with 29 other people. Well, what did they do? They washed their hands of this problem. They said, no, nah, leave it to the states. It's got nothing to do with us. Well, how many times have they said that during this crisis? It's a matter for the states. It's a matter for the states. It's a matter for the states. Isn't it depressing when you've got a federal government that would rather leave important infrastructure decisions, funding for people to survive in housing, to somebody else? <laughs> you know what real leaders do? They stand up and they say, I'm going to make a difference on this. I'm going to fix this problem. I have the will, the power, the resources. And I'm going to do something to fix this. But this government just walks away. That's what they've done to people living in far north Queensland. So the minister tonight will give a speech about this budget, about the appropriations that are in this budget. And he'll talk a lot about the things that the government has done during this coronavirus uh, outbreak. And there'll be lots of discussion about jobs, but the, one of the easiest and quickest ways that you could create jobs in Queensland would be to fund remote housing and social housing for people who really need it. Those construction jobs, those jobs that could be created right now. And it's not an issue just for Indigenous councils. Can I tell you that all over regional Queensland, the areas that this government say that they support, that they represent, that they go out there and tell people that we stand up for people in regional Queensland, well, you don't. Because what they are saying right now is that they need housing. Mount Isa needs housing. Stanthorpe needs housing. There is nowhere for people to live and yet the Deputy Prime Minister gets up all the time and talks about this idea of regionalisation, that people should go live in the regions, pick up your bags and go and live in the regional Queensland. Well, I would encourage people to do that as well. But when they get there, there's a housing shortage. And yet this was the opportunity. This was the opportunity. This was the document. This was the chance for this government and the members opposite who say that they stand up for the regions, who say that they stand up for people living in the bush, to do something about the housing situation that we have in Queensland and all across the country, I would imagine. But instead of doing anything, this government shirked off responsibility, 
left pages blank in the budget papers. What a terrible indictment on this government that they'll say speeches about how fantastic states have done, pat themselves on the back for the work of other people, but not deliver something as crucial as a house for people to live in. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a parent making a decision to raise a child in a house with 28 other people, knowing that your government promised, promised to deliver housing, but walked away at the very first opportunity to do it. You know, at the end of this recession, at the end of this election term, Australians really will be wondering, what is the plan? Is the plan to use taxpayers' money to put nice advertising in shopping centres and bus stops when the plan really could be to deliver the things that our community needs right now? Not in three or four years, not 10 years down the track, but right now, people living in far north Queensland need houses. This government promised to deliver it. When they got the chance in the budget, they walked away from it. And that is a terrible indictment on this government. They don't care about people. They're leaving them behind. And it is a shameful, shameful thing to do to a group of people who believe that this government would do the right thing when given the chance. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. I call the minister. Senator Birmingham. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President, and, uh, and I thank all senators who have made contributions in relation to the appropriation bills. The appropriation bills is customary seek authority from the parliament for the expenditure of money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the last five months of the 2020-21 financial year and build on the appropriations already provided in the 2020-21 Supply Acts. Rather than providing extensive remarks in summing up this debate, uh, I of course point uh, senators to uh, the budget speech and other contributions that highlight uh, the focus and priorities the government brings to bear in relation to these bills. The total of the appropriations sought through these appropriation bills is just over $51.8 billion, providing essential support to the continuity of government business through to the end of this financial year, uh, including funding to give effect to our many budget measures uh, focused very much on the continued suppression uh, of the coronavirus uh, and, of course, our work through the associated economic crisis to ensure the preservation and growth of investment, trade, jobs, living standards and essential services for Australians. I note, Madam Acting Deputy President, that there is a second reading amendment moved uh, by the opposition, uh, which seeks to make uh, various, probably relatively predictable political points. Uh, I'd argue that, uh, that those points are uh, grossly internally inconsistent as they variously attack the government uh, over the scale of spending, uh, but then go on to call for much greater spending in a whole range of other areas. Unfortunately, Madam Acting Deputy President, the timing of, uh, of consideration of the second reading vote and this amendment is such that it will be put during the hour when the Senate does not divide. Therefore, in the interests of the timely management of the Senate and concluding debate tonight without interruption and passing the appropriation bills at the earliest opportunity to ensure the continuity of supply and maintain the essential operations of the government, I can inform the Senate that the government will not call a division on the second reading amendment, but of course I again stress uh, that we resolutely oppose it and do not accept the assertions in the motion. Once again, I thank senators for their contribution and commend these bills to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. The question is then that the second reading amendments moved by Senator Sheldon on behalf of Senator Katie Gallagher be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question then is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the ordinary annual services of the government and for related purposes. A bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for certain expenditure and for related purposes. A bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for expenditure in relation to the parliamentary departments and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken as a whole? 
There being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator Patrick. Um, I, I seek your guidance. Is this the correct time to move my requests? I understand. Yes, it Thank is. Thank you, Senator um, Ac uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Well, sorry, M Madam Chair, I might say. Um, uh, I seek leave to move requests number one to nine on sheet 1068 by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move uh, request one to nine on sheet uh, 1068. Madam Ac Acting Deputy President, on budget night, my worst fears were confirmed when the government denied the Auditor General his requested budget. The starvation of funds means the number of performance audits conducted per year will drop from 48 to 38. That's 42 this year, 40 next year, then down to 38. That's a 20 per cent reduction in the number of performance audits that the Auditor General will carry out. No other agency has copped a 20 per cent cut in outcomes as a result of this uh, budget. But that's what this government has done to what is one of the most important federal integrity agencies. This chamber has, uh, ha has got to save the Auditor General from being financially throttled. You can't blow the whistle when the government has its hands around your throat. We have to fix this, or else the government account account accountability and scrutiny will be busted. It's worth recalling that the Office of the Federal Auditor General is one of the oldest and most important of government agencies. It was first established by the Audit Act in 1901, and the first Auditor General, John Israel, took office in December of that year, 119 years ago. Critically, the Auditor General is an officer of the parliament. That is by design. He's an officer there that is there to assist the parliament in respect of oversight. We give him tenure, ten years, and we give him budget. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. It's absolutely vital to the parliament's ability uh, to examine and scrutinise the performance of government. Without the information often uncovered by a fully resourced audit office, the parliament's scrutiny processes, that is, Senate estimates and committee processes, question time would be greatly diminished. The government's cut to the auditor's budget are a direct assault on the oversight of government. It is entirely reasonable to, to conclude that the cuts were retribution for the Auditor General's continued exposure of government maladministration, cost blowouts and highly, conduct, highly questionable conduct by ministers and officials. The auditor has been responsible for uncovering covering the sports rot scandal, the ten times overpayment for Western Sydney Airport land, the total mismanagement of water within the Department of Agriculture and Water, and the repeated cost and performance failures in defence projects. These budget cuts mean that the Auditor General be, will be watching less. He will not be able to probe as deeply. He won't be able to over, uh, turn over as many rocks to find out what corruption and maladministration lies beneath. And while I have no doubt about the independence and the integrity of the Auditor General, there is no doubt that in the longer term the government's strangulation of the ANIO's budget will have a chilling effect on the, on the conduct of inquiries. Independence of the office must be supported by full funding and a guarantee that funding will not be cut according to the political whims of a government of the day. Now, I'll just digress slightly and talk about the, uh, you know, one of the areas in which the Auditor General conducts examinations, and that is the future submarine project. And I know that when I bring this up, the government cringes because it's a project that they've managed to get a blowout of $39,000 million, and they simply don't know what to do about it. And it's interesting. I asked my office to have a look at uh, how much that blowout is costing us per day, 
and the number comes up at, a, at, a, at, a me, at uh, $2 million per day when I amortise it across the 38 years of the project. This amendment seeks to give, or this request seeks to give the Auditor General $4.4 million. That's two days of future submarine cost blowouts. Two measly days worth of submarine future submarine cost blowouts. The, 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 the government, those on the other side of the chamber, simply don't want brought up in this place. Finance Minister of Birmingham, he ought to be really concerned about this. $39 billion blowout. But, if, but they focus on trying to shave uh, four million dollars off the Auditor General. It's just crazy. That's why, as a first step, I will move an amendment to the Budget Appropriation Bill to restore the funding of the Auditor. This is a vital measure to avoid an immediate contraction of the Auditor General's vital work. Now, I know that the Prime Minister says that uh, the JCP, uh, uh, JCPAA is carrying out a review of, uh, of the Audit Act and tries to, to, to use that as a facade for saying this increase is OK, we'll look at it in the review. We don't need a review to understand that the Auditor General's audits, performance audits are going down from uh, 48 down to 38 over the next couple of years, down to 42 this year. I know that because that's what the Auditor General said at estimates, and he's pretty good with numbers. He knows what he's talking about. In the longer term, there will need to be a legislative financial framework in place to, the ensure, to ensure that the Auditor isn't having to look over his or her shoulder to see whether a new budget cut is coming. Let's not forget that these cuts to the Auditor come at a time when there is no Federal Independent Commission Against Corruption, a freedom of information regime that is fuelled by cavalier FOI claims by officials, and I can attest to that through all of the different FOI exemptions that have been overturned over the years in, 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 in my own personal case. And, uh, uh, an FOI regime that's starved because the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner also has no increase in funding, despite the increases in FOIs, despite the backlog. Many of the basic integrity mechanisms of the federal government are either broken, sidelined, starved resources or simply not there. We must save the Auditor-General from being financially throttled. We have to fix this, or else there will be no one to keep the bastards honest. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. And I should have said this, I believe, when you first um, made the request for amendment. But with the concurrence of the Senate, the statements of reasons accompanying the requests circulated for this bill will be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate. There being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator Wong, you look to be seeking the call. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, well, first, just a few points. Um, first, on um, the government's approach to the Auditor General, and as someone who's questioned the Auditor General both in this estimates and at length across various estimates over many years, uh, it is an, uh, a critical office. It is a critical office for accountability. Uh, it is a critical office for the functioning of the Australian democracy, uh, and it has uncovered uh, a great deal of corruption and waste on the part of the Morrison government. Uh, the most recent of which was, of course, Leppington Triangle, but there have been many others. I think sports rorts was uncovered by the Auditor General. Uh, and uh, they ought to be funded properly. Uh, and despite the nothing to see here that Senator Birmingham engaged in at estimates, uh, and in this chamber, when the opposition has asked questions, uh, I, I was interested to see to, today to see Julian Hill, the deputy chair of the uh, Joint Statutory Committee of Public Accounts and Audits, which, in which he had released 
analysis from the Parliamentary Library confirming that over the next four years the Auditor General budget's budget will be cut by 22.1 per cent in real terms since the Liberals and Nationals came to power in 2013. So since we were in government, uh, almost a 22 per cent in real terms. Uh, and I'm not surprised because they're pretty embarrassed. And they kept, they've been able to, particularly in that, the other chamber, in the other place, they've been able to undermine many of the mechanisms associated with their Westminster system. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, under general standards of Westminster accountability, uh, accountability of the Parliament of Ministers, I don't reckon Mr Taylor would still be a minister. I don't think he'd be still be a minister after rocking up and relying on a forged document. And we could go on. So I can understand. I, I think it's uh, ethically uh, uh, deeply um, undemocratic and abhorrent. But I can understand why the government wants this hidden. It was the Auditor General and that office which uncovered the Prime Minister's involvement in the sports frauds uh, scandal. That's the first point. And, and that is also why uh, we moved a second reading amendment which called for this. The second point I would make, and Senator Patrick knows this, the Labor Party has a very clear, consistent, principled position uh, that we allow the government of the day to pass its appropriation bills. And Senator Patrick comes in here and he says, we must save the Auditor General. Well, I've got a suggestion to Senator Patrick, because you know, he's already flagged with us, he's going to have a go at Labor for not supporting his request. Well, we've had this position for many decades. The government passes its appropriation bills and we expect the same. But I tell you what, if you want to come in here and beat your chest about saving the Auditor General, oh, here's an idea for you. Well, you're going to trade your vote away if you already have it on a range of bills this fortnight. Why don't you make this one of your demands? So instead of grandstanding, why don't you actually say, if you want my vote on the cashless debit card, which I understand you might support anyway, if you want my vote on all these issues, why don't you actually deliver some funding in the way that you kind of do with Senator Cormann for votes? Why don't you do that? Because that will actually deliver funding much more than a than a request that you know we will not support. We will not support. We will not support for the principal reasons that we have had for decades, and you know about the, the, the political and constitutional background to that. You know that. You know that. You know that. So, well, you know, <laughs> I've made our position clear. We do support greater funding for the Auditor General. And you know, in government, we gave them more. We gave them more. And I, as Finance Minister, accepted the importance of funding that entity, unlike this gentleman and unlike his predecessor. So the government should do the right thing. They've managed to um, undermine so many of the democratic principles and conventions which go to accountability. They ought not undermine the Auditor General by um, depriving them of funding to do work that is important. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to keep making that ask of the government. I'm happy to continue to campaign for it, and most importantly, we will continue to campaign for a Labor government which recognises the importance of this sort of accountability. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I rise to speak in strong support of Senator Patrick's amendment, which would restore some of the necessary funding to the Australian Audit Office. And I want to just put a few facts on record. The ANAO sought additional funding from this government as part of the budget process they wrote to this government, and they specifically, and I know this because I asked them this in estimates, they specifically spelled out that their target audit numbers of 48 were not going to be able to uh, occur if they didn't have additional funding. Now, the reason was that is that the costs of their other audits that they're legislatively mandated to undertake have increased and therefore there's less money to go around. So they made a very uh, modest request for a small modicum of funds to be able to continue at their target audit level. They got no response at all to that letter. They wrote to this government saying, we stand on our record, we'd like to be able to do it, and this government didn't even see fit to respond, let alone give them the money that they had sought. So that's the first offence. 
But it's very interesting when you look at the um, distinguished and outstanding track record of the Auditor General and the office that he leads in holding this government to account and all governments to account. And that perhaps explains to us why this government is so desperate to muzzle them and to reduce their audit capacity by 20 per cent over three years. It sports rorts one. It sports rorts two. It's the Watergate scandal. It's the Leppington Triangle scandal. There's a few others here. It's the consistent failure to implement recommendations uh, to make the lobbying code of conduct mean anything and have any implications, which this government likewise has completely ignored. Um, they've also done um, some really revealing work into our environmental protection laws and a critique of the approvals process. Um, uh, all inconvenient matters for this government. And this government has such a glass jaw that rather than behave like a responsible, democratic, uh, modern government and cop this on the chin and fund this body to do that important transparency and accountability work, they'd just rather muzzle them and have them do less scrutiny work. It suits the government beautifully. The other interesting thing is I wonder what the ANAO have got planned that, gee, they might not be able to do 20 per cent of now, thanks to this government not giving them the extra funding. They were planning, and now don't know if they can, do audits into a whole range of COVID programs, JobKeeper, the job maker hiring subsidies, which had a huge amount of loopholes that we tried to fix in this place, but sadly didn't get the support that we needed to get the, um, the older workers protected. The COVID safe, COVID safe app. They were going to look at all of that, but gee, they might not be able to now because they're 20 per cent down on their capacity, thanks to this government not giving them the right amount of funding. They were going to look into the Great Barrier Reef Foundation partnership, another scandalous over allocation of money to a very small and perhaps meritorious organisation, but that didn't seek the money and frankly didn't have the capacity to properly administer the money. And when we have actual statutory authorities who are charged with protecting the reef that are used to doling out that sort of money, that would have been a very interesting audit that having this Senate already inquired into, we know there's an awful lot of questions that still need answering, but no, this government isn't going to give ANAO the money uh, to, to do that work. That's now got a question mark over it as well. Um, there, was some, uh, there was a proposal to look into the whole of government legal services panel, like how um, uh, Mr Sukar, uh, his old firm, ended up investigating whether or not he had acted with impropriety and the uh, mismanagement of conflicts of interest there. That too would have made for a very revealing uh, expose by the ANAO, another inconvenience for the government that they wanted to avoid, no doubt. Um, and an, a range of others. Defence's implementation of cultural reform. Well, that's topical this week, isn't it, folks? Another audit that the Auditor General may not now be able to do because this government didn't give them the extra money that it needs to do to maintain the output. They're not even asking to increase their output, which frankly they could because they're doing such great work. They just want to be able to maintain their output. And this government won't even give them the funding to do that. There's a few other things they were planning on looking at but now don't know if they can. Um, the administration of the COVID commission. Now, there's been an awful lot of debate over the selection of the folk that sit on that commission and the management of their own conflicts of interest, because many of them are steeped in the gas sector and the other fossil fuel sectors, and uh, the conflicts of interest rules are very weak and don't apply to all echelons of that commission. The ANAO could have looked into that and made some recommendations about strengthening those processes, but we'll never know now because perhaps that's one of the audits that it can no longer do because it's now got a 20 per cent capacity reduction over the next three years thanks to this government deliberately not giving them the tiny amount of money that they sought. And it's not just that they're not funding the ANAO. This is the same government that for years described a federal corruption watchdog as a fringe issue. And then finally, the Prime Minister saw the light and decided, oh, it's almost two years ago now that, yes, this government thought they would do something about it. They've done virtually nothing since. There's been a waffly discussion paper that's got so many loopholes in it, it it's basically a colander, and experts have rightly criticised it. That then got put on the shelf and gathered some dust, and they've just trotted it out again with no changes to the last version that they already consulted on. 
Um, and they're now doing new consultation and trying to claim that they're somehow champions of consultation. But it's got the same old problems that the last expert said it had when you did the first round of consultation. It's, it's sham consultation to avoid actually establishing a corruption watchdog at the same time as muzzling the most effective transparency body that we have at the minute, thanks to this government's intrans intransigence, which is, of course, the ANAO and the Auditor General. So this is exactly why we will be strongly supporting um, these amendments by, by Senator Patrick and the request for um, this Senate to uh, allocate a very small amount of funds that the ANAO will do excellent work with. Now, we actually think there should be a federal corruption watchdog, and actually this chamber thinks there should be a federal corruption watchdog, because in September last year—thank you all for your support, not you guys, but you guys—we passed a bill for a federal corruption watchdog with teeth. Now, that's actually what needs to happen. Yes, we need to fund the ANAO, but that's not the panacea. We need a whole range of, of um, improvements to whistleblower protection, to protection for public interest journalism. We need to get big money out of politics. We need uh, caps on election spending and on donations. There is a whole raft of transparency measures that actually there was a survey uh, about, that was the results of which were published today, that found that two-thirds of Australians think that corruption is indeed a big problem in politics. And a good 20 per cent of people thought that this government was doing very badly at handling corruption. That was a, a Transparency International Australia report done in conjunction with Griffith University, and it makes for some very sobering reading. People can see that the public interest is being sold out to the political interests of those in charge. They can see the influence that donors have on the decision-making process. They can see this government consistently failing to uphold the very basic standards of ministerial accountability that used to mean something in this place. Scandal after scandal after scandal that gets either pushed under the rug or glossed over. And now they've got the hide to not give the ANAO a tiny increase in funding to continue to do the job that they won't let anybody else do, because they know, sadly, that there are clearly more skeletons in the closet that they want to stay, uh, that they want to keep secret. And so this is a very modest request, and I hope that the Senate will uh, consider supporting it. But I, I I'm, unfortunately, uh, am informed that uh, the opposition won't be supporting this amendment either, which is. Uh, very perplexing, because in the second reading amendment that we just passed, in their name, it had a, a reference to the need for a strong and well-funded ANAO. We agree that is in fact why we're here, and that's in fact why we're supporting Senator Patrick's precise amendment to deliver that. So I'm a bit baffled as to um, why the opposition is is taking that uh, position, and I would urge them to reconsider, because frankly we've got an opportunity here. This amendment would otherwise pass, is my understanding. And we could, in fact, charge the ANAO with continuing to do the excellent work that they've done and empower them to do all of the things on that list that they had planned, their work plan for 20, uh, 2021, that they now might not be able to do because this government, and it seems perhaps with the opposition's full support, um, is happy to starve them of funds. So we'll see how the vote goes. But once again, democracy is for sale, transparency is at stake, and we've got a chance to fix it. So let's do that, hey? Thank you, Senator Waters. Uh, the Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, the government does consider the Australian National Audit Office to be a very important national institution uh, and recognises its work as being vital to help ensure accountability and transparency. Its recommendations do assist many agencies in identifying ways to improve public governance and administration. However, the amendments or requests that have been put uh, before the chamber uh, are based on a mistaken premise of there being cuts to the ANAO budget. The Auditor-General himself was asked during budget estimates whether his annual funding had been cut and was clear that there was no change in our budget and forward estimates in the budget process. Asked yet again, he emphasised there was no change from what we were expecting in our budget to what it was in it. Uh, the government simply moved through, as we had indicated previously, in terms of the budget allowance for the ANAO. 
It is notable that Madam Chair, on 2 September, over a month before the budget, the Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit commenced their 10 yearly review of the Auditor General Act 1997. Terms of reference include consideration of funding for the ANAO, uh, and I know that, uh, that Senator Patrick uh, referenced this review in his remarks. This is a once in a decade inquiry. It will look at the totality of the ANAO's operations, including its resourcing. And therefore, the government concluded it would be appropriate, in terms of changes to the funding model for the organisation, to look at that following receipt of that review rather than in advance of it. Indeed, the Prime Minister emphasised this himself, saying, and I quote, there is a 10-year review currently underway, and when the government receives the outcomes of that 10-year review, we will consider the resourcing for the ANAO. When we receive that report, the government will make its response in terms of their ongoing resourcing. But I do emphasise, Madam Chair, that the budget papers show growing appropriation over the forward years for the ANAO across its operating and capital costs. From $68.832 million in 2021 to $68.842 million the next year, $68.902 million the year after that, and $69.168 million the year after that. Uh, on top of this, the Auditor General's salary is funded through a special appropriation that also matches salary cost increases over time. So, Madam Chair, uh, the government will not be supporting these requests for amendments. We instead will respond, as I've outlined, uh, to the JCPAA um, review, uh, and, uh, and we reject the requests uh, that are provided. And we would emphasise that if they were received in the House, they would be rejected there as well, pending that more informed approach. Senator Patrick. Ask the minister some questions. I just want to respond to some of the statements that have been made around, uh, around the chamber. I will uh, indicate I'm very disappointed that Labor is not going to support uh, this amendment. I just want to uh, uh, read from the second reader of Mr Julian Hill in the other place, a man who I have a lot of respect for, uh, not just uh, as a person, but he's also the deputy chair of the JCPAA, fully informed uh, as to the funding uh, requests of the Auditor General. Uh, because they are tendered to the JCPAA before or at the same time as going to the Prime Minister, as, as is legislated, uh, a legislative requirement. Um, he, he says, they are talking about the government, they've used COVID-19 in this budget to cut the Auditor General's budget, to silence the independent watchdog. Make no mistake, this is revenge for sports rorts. It's revenge for exposing the corruption as it now looks in paying $30, uh, $30 million to a Liberal Party donor for land worth $3 million. The defence contracting blowouts, the casualisation of the public service. What's the government's response to this? Cut the budget of the independent watchdog that is exposing their rorts, waste and corruption. Who knows what else they're hiding? It's vengeful and it's pathetic. He went on to say, the Auditor General has been in structural deficit for the last few years because of the accumulation of cuts. They call them efficiency dividends. Let's be clear, for a small agency, this is a cut. The efficiency dividend piles up year after year and it's cut after cut after cut. Last year, he lost $3.3 million and the year before, $4.4 million. We're at a point now where the Auditor General said to the Prime Minister, who's supposed to look after him? He's an independent officer of the parliament and the Prime Minister is supposed to look after him. I can't do it anymore. I can't meet KPIs of 48 performance audits a year without fear or favour. Now that's what Mr Julian Hill said in the other place. Fully informed as, a, as, the, deputy chair, as the deputy chair of the JCPAA. He had it right. He had it absolutely right. So I sit here astounded, astounded. Actually, prob no, you're probably right. I'd take that interjection, uh, Senator Gallagher. Um, Ga um, Gallagher. Yeah. Um, that I take that. Uh, I take that objection. Uh, I'm not astounded because you do it all the time. You sit in the uh, in the seats of the opposition party, but you actually don't oppose. You just sort of wave things through. 
Now, Senator Wong stood up and said, talked about long-standing conventions. Now, I understand long-standing conventions. I understand about blocking supply. But there's nothing wrong with saying to the government, we're going to support Senator Patrick's request. We believe he's right. And you know what? You can take it back to the other place and you can, we can get the Prime Minister again to reconsider. That's not blocking supply. That's just asserting what is right. And you no, it's not blocking supply. So no, I did. I said I suggested privately that we could that, that you could simply uh, assert and support me. The government didn't need to know. You could have sent it back to the other place and actually had a bit of a fight. But I know that's a tough ask for you. And I say this disappointed. I don't, don't, I'm disappointed. I want a strong opposition. I don't want to see a situation after the next election where we've got even more of the uh, Liberal Party on the other side. I'm actually trying to work with you, but you've got to be a strong opposition before you've got any chance of being in government. <clears throat> It will move to the cash and debit card, if you like. I mean, there were accu accusations, and I, I acknowledge uh, what Senator Wong said that it often is the crossbench that holds everyone to account, and it's often the crossbench that that use their leverage to get much better things for the public. Would be good if the if the opposition were able to do that, but they can't. You seem seem unable to do that. Now, when it comes to the cash and debit card. I haven't given a position on that. I'm simply considering where I'm going to land. You might be very surprised at where I sit in the chamber next week. I haven't made up my mind, and to suggest that I have uh, is just simply ill-informed. So I urge the Labor Party be an opposition, be a strong opposition, because Australia deserves a strong opposition. Stand with me. Stand with the Greens as we stand up for the Auditor General. One of the few people left that is able to exercise powers. Go and have a look at Section 32 of the Auditor General's Act. Extraordinary powers that allows him to gather the sort of information you've been refused uh, at the COVID committee, refused in my view inappropriately, but nonetheless the Auditor General has extensive powers. You can't even deny cabinet documents to him. So let's fund him properly. Let's stand up for him. He's one of the few uh, agencies left in government, sorry, well, inside the government, and, in, but in, and including this parliament, that seems to be able to <clears throat> um, actually get to the, the, the bottom of things. So I'm not asking you to block supply. I'm asking you to send it back to the other place and let them reconsider. Maybe Mr Albanese can uh, stand up and, and uh, mount a convincing argument that causes the Prime Minister to change his view. You won't know unless you give it a shot. Now, moving to what, uh, what the minister said, he talked about, uh, he talked about <coughs> the need for a review. And this is just a huge furphy. The need for the, 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 to wait for the review. We know what the effect of this will be. It will be less oversight. That may well suit you, Senator Birmingham, but, it, but you know, we do not have to wait for the review to find that out. You could have essentially given the Auditor General what he wanted and the review could have continued, but instead we will get less oversight. Now, you as the Finance Minister, uh, you know, I accept that the budget remained the same, that it wasn't a cut, but don't be spending focused, be outcome focused. The Auditor General explains that the standard audits that he does, the financial audits, the sort of uh, audit that uh, revealed um, uh, 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 anomalies in respect of the, uh, uh, the chairman of ASIC's payments, they are the things that are taking up more time and costing more money, which means the Auditor General simply can't do as many performance audits. Don't be spending focused. Be outcome focused, Minister. That's what you ought to be doing. And with that, I will now ask the question, what's the basis for um, the decision of government to 
uh, only fund uh, the Auditor General this year for 42 performance audits instead of th the normal 48. What's, what's the reasoning behind that? I call the Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Thank Senator Patrick. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure that I accept the, the normal statement that, uh, that Senator Patrick uh, has made. Um, I think, uh, uh, indeed, the JCPAA, in terms of uh, their assessment and, uh, and budget day statement um, of the 6th of October, um, uh, noted that uh, the ANAO sought to work towards an annual target of 48 audits per annum by 23-24. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, they have identified uh, a target that they wish to, uh, to reach. Uh, the ANAO proposed uh, that its budget be scaled up over a period of time to reach that point. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it is entirely feasible, depending upon the recommendations of the JCPAA and the response of the government, uh, that that target uh, could still be met. In terms of this year's funding allocation, um, uh, it is, uh, as I've stressed before, uh, what had uh, previously been outlined in terms of uh, budget decisions and forward projections. Senator Patrick. <coughs> yeah, I, th I thank the minister for his answer, but I'll just refer to the Hansard uh, from Senate Estimates, where uh, Senator Ward has asked, uh, given that on the status of, the, of less funding you weren't quite able to reach the target of audit reports, what are you anticipating in terms of your ability to reach those targets for workflow in the future? And the Auditor General answers. In our portfolio performance statement, we are forecasting that in 2020 to 21 we will produce 42 audits, falling to 40 the following year, and then by 2022 to 23 down to 38. That is the order to general from the Hansard in response to Senator Waters. So uh, again, I, I ask the, the minister: Is he? Uh, uh, are you of the view that uh, the order to general will? Um, with the current budget left un, uh, unamended, as my request seeks to do, enable the Auditor General to do more than 42 audits? And on what basis would you make that claim? Uh, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, well, I wasn't making that claim. Uh, indeed, I agree that I understand uh, the ANAO has uh, projected a uh, delivery of 42 performance audits in 2021. Uh, what I was emphasising is that. It is the ANAO who has also advised the JCPAA uh, that it seeks to work towards a target of 48 by 23-24, and that is several years away. Uh, the 10 yearly review of funding will be received well within that time frame and well within the opportunity for government to respond to it. Senator, Senator. So I saw some. All right. Well, the question is that the request one to nine on sheet one zero six eight moved by Senator Patrick by leave together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Order. The question is that requests moved by Senator Patrick 1 to 9 on sheet 1068 by leave together be agreed to. The ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I call Senator Patrick to tell it for the ayes, Senator McCarthy to tell it for the noes. Order. There being 13 ayes and 31 noes, the request for amendment are defeated. Thank you, the question is now that the appropriate bill number 1, 2020 to 2021, be agreed to without request for amendments. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I Minister. move the bills be now read a third. No, no. 
You've you got to do your bit. That's right. Thank you. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Minutes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, the committee has considered appropriation bill number one, 2020 to 2021, and agreed to it without request. Minister. I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move the bills be now read a third time. The question is the bills now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the Ordinary Annual Services of the Government for related purposes. A bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for certain expenditure and for related purposes. A bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for expenditure in relation to the parliamentary departments and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2. Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill. Second reading debate. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the premise of this legislation is that Australia's national government should be responsible for our international relations. Well, that's a reasonable proposition and it's one we support. But if only the leader of Australia's national government, Mr Morrison, took this idea to heart. All the legislation in the world is not going to change the fact that we currently have a Prime Minister who doesn't take responsibility for anything other than political slogans and marketing photo ops. It is indeed past time for Mr Morrison to take responsibility for Australia's foreign relations. It is past time for him to take the action on climate change that enables us to be a partner of choice in our region and to stop leaving a vacuum that others will fill. It is past time for him to show leadership in preparing Australia to manage the impact of a more assertive China, rather than leaving it to the most extreme members of his backbench to score cheap points over China and diaspora communities. And it is past time for him to take responsibility for diversifying Australia's export markets, markets and the hard-working Australians who depend upon them. Having overseen Australia becoming more reliant than ever on China for trade. And it is past time for Mr Morrison to do what John Howard recommended and seek to engage leader to leader with the President of China to make our interests clear. It is past time for Mr Morrison to do what he says he wants to do in this bill, which is to take responsibility for Australia's foreign relations. But I'm afraid Mr Morrison doesn't actually want to take responsibility for it. He wants two things with this bill. First, to gain another weapon, to politically bludgeon state premiers he doesn't like, and a distraction from the tragic aged care scandal that was dominating the news when he rushed to announce this new law. He wanted to be able to say, don't be horrified by some 800 plus deaths in aged care homes regulated by his government. Instead, look over there to what state premiers are doing, forming partnerships with, their other, with other countries. And it's the same approach as Mr Morrison takes with another area of federal responsibility, our national borders and quarantine arrangements. Mr Morrison, who famously said, I stopped the boats, who stood up a federal quarantine facility with a moment's notice in the weeks before an election when he thought it was to his political advantage, the same Mr Morrison who then blamed New South Wales for not stopping the Ruby Princess and now says quarantine of stranded Australians returning from overseas is the state's problem, who sits back and points fingers of blame when something goes wrong in state-run quarantine but refuses to take responsibility for standing up federal quarantine facilities, which he could. All this despite 8,000 Australians being stranded overseas in vulnerable situations and an additional 29,000 desperate to come home. The same Mr Morrison who wants to take credit when there's a political point to score, when the headlines are good, when the photo op is nicely lined up, but who doesn't want a bar of it when there's a risk something might go wrong, which is what we saw in South Australia and Victoria. This legislation may assign responsibility, but only a leader takes responsibility. But regrettably, when there is so much at stake, 
Australia has a Prime Minister who wants to play politics for headlines and pose for photo ops. Yet we are facing some of the most grave strategic circumstances the nation has faced since World War II. An economic ground turned more severe globally than any since the Great Depression, escalating competition between the great powers, rising nationalism and waning international cooperation, all of which means we face a less stable, more divided and a riskier world. Our world is being reshaped and the assumptions we have long held about the stability of the global order and the resilience of our region no longer hold. And this means Australia will have to work much harder to secure our interests. We will, we will have to be more self-reliant and more ambitious. And we, will ha we have to act now to build the world and region we want, one that not only respects sovereignty but is also stable and prosperous. And this does require an honest assessment of our own capabilities and a reinvestment in all the elements of our national power. And it requires leadership, consistency and discipline from our prime foreign minister and our prime minister. Leadership to articulate our values and our interests and to advocate them internationally. To explain Australia to the world and the world to Australia. Because in an increasingly disrupted and complex world, this is more important than ever. Instead, we have a vacuum of leadership, a government that has kneecapped the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, slashed our development assistance and undermined Australia's credibility as a partner of choice in the region, just as a time we need to be the partner of choice. We have a foreign minister who appears to not like picking up the phone, not to universities or state governments or even her foreign counterparts. And we have a prime minister and a government that too often puts domestic political interest over the national interest. And nothing in this legislation changes that reality. If there were an amendment that could be moved to compel Mr Morrison to put the national interest over his political interests, I'd be moving it. However, instead, because there isn't such an amendment, we will be moving amendments to improve the bill. First, we will be moving a second reading amendment calling for the government to redraft the bill and address its flaws. And these include an absence of an oversight mechanism for decisions made by the foreign minister under the bill to cancel any arrangement entered into by a public university, state, territory or local government. The lack of any requirement subject to appropriate arrangements to protect national security for the minister to provide reasons for decision to cancel any such agreements, meaning an entity will have no idea what they should do differently and the lack of a process for review of a minister's decision. The lack of clarity in the definition of key terms in the bill, such as arrangements, and the regulatory gap in the bill. Private universities, for reason, which for reasons still not explained, will not find any international agreement they engage in subject to scrutiny to assess whether they're in the national interest. But public universities do. So Bond University can go about doing whatever foreign bills it likes, but the University of Western Sydney has to meet a higher standard. The lack of clarity on the treatment of the Port of Darwin, a strategic asset leased to a private Chinese company for 99 years under Mr Morrison's watch, and that has been conspicuously less subject to criticism by this coalition government than decisions taken by Labor states. The lack of clarity on how this new regulatory regime will interact with the existing legislation and guidelines that work to safeguard Australian sovereignty, including third processes, University Foreign Interference Task Force guidelines and the Foreign, Interference, Foreign Influence and Transparency Scheme, and concerns that the bill does prevent, presents sovereign, a sovereign risk that will undermine investment and cost jobs. Our amendment calls, as we have been for some time now, on the Minister to engage in genuine consultation with the Australian entities covered by the bill on the design of the regime. As it stands, the bill puts no responsibility on the federal government to do anything to help entities covered by the bill to play their part in supporting the national interests. You see, they only get told when they get it wrong. Just another opportunity to, for Mr Morrison to do what he does so well, which is point the finger at someone else. Surely, it is a core function of federal government to support the Australian entities that need to engage with the world. It takes time, energy and effort to provide the leadership that Australians, Australian businesses and institutions require. 
the leadership to understand Australia's interests and to understand how to weigh competing demands to help them act in a manner that is consistent with the national interest. That's the sort of engagement entities need. But instead, the engagement with those covered by this legislation is ad hoc. Well, I suppose we shouldn't be surprised. At a time when the world is more complex and when the impact of that complexity is felt ever more keenly in Australia, the Foreign Minister regrettably does so little, some might say nothing, to help Australians manage that complexity. You see, safeguarding our sovereignty is about more than passing laws. It is about our resilience. It is about the resilience of our parliaments. It is about the resilience of our institutions, our universities, the private sector. It means people need to understand what is happening and they need to know what to do. And it is one of the reasons why I have repeatedly asked the Foreign Minister to allow agencies to brief parliamentarians on our ever more complex, consequential and difficult and challenging relationship with China. And she keeps saying she's unpersuaded to do that. But somehow she's persuaded to go a whole lot further with this legislation. You see, it is hard to avoid the conclusion this government is simply not interested in improving the resilience of our institutions and equipping them to manage the recent opportunities of our international engagement. It is interested in playing political gotcha games when institutions don't succeed in managing these risks. Too often we've seen the Morrison government playing politics with state governments on matters of foreign and strategic policy by chasing media headlines, not by engaging them and actually working through these issues in the interests of all Australians, but having a whack through the media. That's not leadership. And what it demonstrates yet again is this is a Prime Minister not interested in delivering on the national interests. What he's interested in is headlines and political hits on his opponents. I think we will always remember Mr Morrison's first attempt at foreign policy was to announce unilaterally he was moving Australia's embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem to help win votes in the Wentworth by-election without any advice from our diplomats and security agencies and without any regard for the far-reaching ramifications of our foreign policy. You see, everything this man does is about scoring domestic political points. There's always an angle even in announcing this legislation. See, the background spin on this bill by the government was that it was a crackdown on the Premier of Victoria who entered into a Belt and Road arrangement uh, with Beijing. But the Morrison government has never explained its own secret Belt and Road deal with China in 2017, a deal which has never been made public and which the government still refuses to make public. And nor has it explained in the, co the commercial impl implications of this legislation in the midst of a recession. The government can't guarantee that major commercial projects won't be cancelled or jobs won't be lost. And it's not just state governments that have been dealt a hypocritical hand by this government. On Mr Morrison's watch, universities have been encouraged to, be, to, provide, to become more reliant on foreign interests. Cuts to our universities have forced them to attract more overseas students and increase engagement with foreign entities. And now they face any number of arrangements they have entered into, being cancelled by the foreign minister with no explanation and no capacity for review. So it is a bill that claims to seek transparency, but it is administered in, sequence, in secrecy a bill that claims to seek transparency that is administered in secrecy. Well, Labor will seek to increase the transparency for entities affected by the bill. If the, bill, if the government proceeds with this bill instead of withdrawing it, engaging in genuine consultation with affected entities on the design of the regi regime, redrafting the bill and representing it to the parliament as soon as possible, we will move substantive amendments in an effort to improve this rushed and flawed bill. We will move for the minister to be required to table an annual report outlining decisions made under the legislation and engagement with entities covered by the bill to articulate and explain Australia's foreign policy and how entities should engage with foreign entities in the national interest. And we will move to require this report be referred to the Senate if Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee for inquiry and report. We will also move for the minister to be required 
to provide reasons to affected Australian entities and for entities to have the capacity to appeal ministerial decisions to the AAT. And importantly, we will move for the minister to be required to prepare a report into the lease of the port of Darwin. And I hope, given the expressed desire for this bill to be a bill with bipartisan support, the minister would want to avoid the very obvious double standard being applied to the LNP decision to lease this critical strategic asset to a foreign company. I welcome the fact that the government has already moved an amendment in the House to fix the lack of definition of institutional autonomy, a concern we had previously identified. And I hope in the debate in this chamber the government continues to display a willingness to work in a non-partisan fashion to improve the bill by accepting our remaining amendments. So Labor supports the stated intention of the bill, but its flaws reflect a Prime Minister who puts his political interest above the national interest. The reality is it was announced in haste before it was ready and before affected entities were consulted, just so Scott Morrison could change the headlines from the tragic neglect in aged care on the same day as his minister walked out on scrutiny here in the Senate. That is not responsible stewardship of Australia's national interests. Labor calls on the government to rewrite the legislation and focus on delivering robust, carefully written laws instead of just grabbing the headlines. We look forward to the Morrison government giving this proposed bill further consideration and invite them to work in a bipartisan way to advance our shared national interests. And in conclusion, Mr De Acting Deputy President, I move the second reading amendment circulated in my name on sheet 1125. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020. This is a major piece of legislation that the government has put forward, with significant long-term implications. And the government says these bills are about foreign policy, and they are, but they are also about addressing the issue of foreign interference in Australia. In fact, the Prime Minister himself has framed it in that way, saying that where any foreign government seeks to undermine the sovereignty of Australia's foreign policy by seeking to do deals with sub-national governments, Australia needs to protect itself from that. Let's be very clear. We agree that where any interference by foreign governments occurs, it is a serious issue that needs to be addressed. And we would welcome the opportunity to have a serious, thoughtful debate about foreign interference and how to balance actions taken to protect people and governments from foreign interference with protecting legitimate activity and engagement and protecting people's civil and human rights, including through, by through introducing a charter of rights side by side with such legislation. We didn't have this conversation when the government introduced its foreign interference laws two years ago, and we aren't having it now. I mean, my colleague Senator McKim two years ago said that that legislation was shoddily drafted and too broad in scope and needed amendments to ensure that it was properly targeting foreign interference in our political system rather than allowing a raft of actions that impacted on freedom of speech, of speech and association catching legitimate dissent in their net. And again today, we see hastily drafted problematic legislation. And what's more, there's a distinct lack of clarity about how the legislation before us today intersects and interacts with the 2018 foreign interference legislation. And it's also worth pointing out how much, so much of this debate about foreign interference and foreign policy actually becomes shorthand for a debate about foreign interference by the Chinese government. We think any debate about foreign interference should be a much broader conversation that recognises the risks to Australia by being overly aligned with US foreign policy, the risks to our sovereignty by having US bases like Pine Gap on our soil, where some of the information and intelligence that flows through is for US eyes only. And that debate should include the risks to our soldiers when they're sent to fight in American wars on foreign soil, and the risks to the rights of Australian citizens like Julian Assange, who, uncovering evidence about US war crimes, is persecuted with ongoing attempts to extradite him to the US, where he could face charges that could result in decades in prison. So the Greens come to this discussion on foreign policy and foreign interference from a perspective that puts human rights first. And that critically includes being able to have a domestic debate 
where people are free to raise human rights concerns and act to apply pressure on other countries without being subject to threats and intimidation. It's important that we speak out loudly and clearly and take, human rights, take action about human rights abuses by the Chinese government against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang or East Turkestan in Tibet and that we speak out about the attack on democracy in Hong Kong and the Chinese government's ongoing persecution of others, including Falun Gong practitioners. And it's also important that we continue to advocate for meaningful action on human rights abuses wherever they occur, not just China, but in Russia, in Saudi Arabia, in Palestine, in African nations, the Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, India, Myanmar and in the US. It's important that we here in Australia voiced our support for the Black Lives Matter movement in America and internationally. And it's also important that we support a global environment that brings pressure to bear on us for our human rights abuses, the over 400 black deaths in custody since the Royal Commission, our own indefinite incarceration of asylum seekers. It's important that we have a domestic debate where, where we're able to do that, free of foreign interference, and that we withstand criticism, we withstand other nations' response to that criticism. Criticism, and we say stay true to our principles of not just accepting that our major trading partners have appalling human rights records. We must not just turn away and turn a blind eye, as has been the habit of previous governments and still is. Yes, we have become more vocal about China, but where is the outcry about what's going on in India, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, in Saudi Arabia, in Palestine? It seems that it's convenient for us to speak out about China in the current climate, but for other countries who are our allies or our major trading partners, there are different standards applied. And it's also important that when we are speaking about, out about the actions of foreign governments, that we do this in a way that doesn't leave the peoples who are originally from these countries subject to stigma here in Australia. So at the same time as we are outspoken against the actions of the Chinese government, we must be aware of the potential for this to have an impact on Australians of Asian origin, and we must support them against any racist attacks. I want to look more broadly now about what needs to occur if we are to seriously tackle foreign interference, and that's to talk about money, to follow the money, recognising, acknowledging and addressing the risks of foreign interference through corporate influence. I mean, for a very long time, we Greens have been sounding the alarm about the influence of corporations and, in particular, corporate donations on Australia's political system. We want to see systematic change to address that. We welcome the fact that foreign donations above $1,000 to political parties are now outlawed, but this doesn't rule out money politics from foreign players. Far from it. We have companies registered in Australia that can take up the slack and still serve the political interests of their foreign owners. So whether it's domestic or foreign interference on our politics from corporations and the incredibly powerful and wealthy people behind them, there's one straightforward way of stopping them in their tracks, and that's to get this money out of politics. Banning large corporate donations full stop. That would put an end to their influence on politicians and politics. They're pushing of policies and planet-destroying and people-exploiting developments that are not in the interests of ordinary Australians or people around the world, that are anti-democratic and destructive of our future. And my colleague Senator Waters has done incredible work advocating for electoral donations reform, and tightening our electoral donations laws would be a significant step forward. And crucially, I also want to recognise the work that Senator Waters has, and all of our MPs have done in advocating for a federal ICAC. And we're glad that the ALP has followed us on that charge because we think it's crucial. A watchdog with real teeth can make a meaningful difference, and we need to see that. It would lessen foreign influence, but it would also address corruption more broadly. We've seen sports rorts, Angus Taylor's Watergate scandal, and the many other. Taylor scandals and too many other scandals to list. And that corruption 
by the Liberal Party is having a corrosive impact on our democracy. And it's reflected in data released today by Griffith University and Transparency International, where their report shows Australians increasingly view corruption as either a very big or quite big problem, rising from 61 per cent in 2018 to 66 per cent. And the proportion of those who believe the federal government is handling corruption issues very badly has risen from 15 per cent to 19.4 per cent over the same period. So we think there's a lot to be done to address foreign interference, but do not believe that this legislation before us today is the right way to do it. And part of that reflects a set of concerns about the process to date. There was no regulatory impact statement prepared for this bill. There was no exposure draft released for comment and discussion. And the committee process itself was rushed. Most of the state governments did not make a submission or a appear before the inquiry. And given how important this legislation is, and how important it is to get it right, we think that, think that is profoundly disappointing. And that rushed process is reflected in the fact that the committee heard evidence from Professor George Williams that there could be a challenge to this legislation from a state government on constitutional grounds, that there is a fundamental flaw in the very premise of the legislation that relationships with other countries are purely the responsibility of the Commonwealth. And Professor Williams gave very compelling evidence to the inquiry that, in fact, the external affairs powers is vested in both the Commonwealth and the states. So the Commonwealth actually does not have the right to overrule the states in the way outlined in this bill. And so, given the magnitude of the issues involved and the importance of getting it right, it's extraordinary that something as fundamental as that hasn't been clarified before the government is seeking to pass this bill. And there's the philosophical element too, whether it's appropriate that the Commonwealth should be the sole holder of this role. There's a strong argument that having multiple levels of engagement is actually a much healthier situation, certainly in times like we are at the moment, when Senator Minister Birmingham, Birmingham isn't able to get his Chinese counterpart to pick up the phone on the escalating trade disputes. There is value to be had in multiple relationships and lines of dialogue, rather than all interactions resting in the hands of the foreign and the trade ministers. And if there is concern that the state governments and indeed universities and local governments don't have the skills to undertake the building of these relationships, then an obvious way forward is to build their capacity rather than cutting them off at the knees. I mean, you could argue that this, this legislation doesn't stop those multiple levels of engagement, but which state government is going to invest in developing relationship and arrangements and collaborations with foreign governments or in the knowledge that it can all be overturned retrospectively because the foreign minister doesn't think that these arrangements are in our national interest? And there's no appeal process, doesn't have to be based on published foreign policy, just the view of the foreign minister that it's not in the national interest. So, given that flawed approach, it's unsurprising that we've got a profoundly flawed bill. The bill captures university arrangements in a blanket way, with potential enormous implications for their resourcing. And keep in mind that this is a sector that's been under massive pressure and attack by the, by the Liberal Party. And that's, I mean, which my colleague, um, Senator Faruqi, I'm sure, is going to go into further detail. But that's not to say that some of the relationships that universities have entered into have all been desirable. In my conversations with people about this bill, I had a memorable conversation with one expert who said that it's no wonder that universities have been entering into foreign partnerships without necessarily doing their due diligence or determining whether they're in the national interest or even the university's interest because of the pressures that they are under. They're top of the list for every vice chancellor, top of the list for their key performance indicators has been developing MOUs with external parties, purely because of the massive decline in public funding. So rather than imposing an unwieldy framework that they haven't been consulted on, if the government wants to ensure that there is no risk of foreign interference in universities and to strengthen their capacity to undertake independent research, a key step is providing secure, adequate funding. So the Commonwealth should adequately fund universities, including increasing research funding, the Commonwealth contribution to allow free higher education, and increased funding per student. So we let me foreshadow that we will have amendments to reflect these concerns. 
And the other fundamental concern that we have with these bills is that they effectively provide an incredibly powerful tool for the foreign minister with virtually no oversight. In fact, the bills specifically exempt the minister from judicial review and merit review. And I want to be clear that this isn't a criticism of the current foreign minister and acknowledge her work and of her office and her department on a number of difficult consular <coughs> cases. However, the reality is that once the bill is passed, the power sits with whomever the foreign minister may be and provides the executive with a very far-ranging power without any checks in perpetuity. We think it's crucial that anything close to the level of executive power provided by this bill has some level of transparency and oversight. So again, I will foreshadow that we have a number of amendments to improve the processes setting, set out in this bill, and I hope that these amendments will be supported. So let me be very clear. We agree that foreign inter in interference is a serious issue that needs to be addressed, but we think the approach that the Liberal Party has taken is rushed and underdeveloped, and we will be moving amendments to improve this bill, but we, and, but we have profound concerns about the framework that is being proposed. So to, to, in summary, to genuinely ensure integrity and transparency in Australia's political system, the Commonwealth should enact donations reform by banning political donations from mining, property development, tobacco, alcohol and gambling industries, and capping all other donations and that make sure they are disclosed publicly in real time. They should root out corruption by establishing a federal anti-corruption commission and fund universities properly. We want to address foreign interference, and there's a lot that we can and we must do, but this bill isn't the right approach. I now want to conclude by moving the second reading amendment that has been distributed in my name. I haven't got the sheet in front of me, but I'm sure that that, that can be found out what sheet it's on. Thank you. Senator Henson, Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. It is my great pleasure to rise and speak on Australia's foreign relations bill which is an incredibly important piece of legislation. This bill is required because the Commonwealth has responsibility for foreign policy. It has the expertise, and yet there is no current requirement for states and territories to consult properly with the Commonwealth on arrangements with foreign governments. This bill is not about excessive intrusion into the states and territories' businesses, business. This is about providing governments, institutions and the Australian people with the confidence that due diligence is given to international arrangements to ensure they are consistent with our national interest and with our values. It is wholly unremarkable that the Commonwealth seeks to ensure that state and territory, the states and territories consult with the Commonwealth in relation to foreign arrangements. And it is a pity, I might say, that this legislation is now necessary. And it is necessary because there have been a wide range of arrangements, including between state governments and universities and foreign states, which have caused the Commonwealth significant concern, and this bill now put, puts in place the measures required to ensure that at the forefront of any arrangement with any foreign state, the national interest is paramount. It also reflects the fact that the Commonwealth, and particularly the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has the expertise necessary to assess whether arrangements with foreign governments are consistent with our foreign policy and therefore in our national interest. Without appropriate consultation, the Commonwealth has no opportunity to review the proposed arrangements and apply its expertise. Without due diligence, without this consultation, we risk as a nation, having a patchwork of contracts, MOUs, relationships and collaboration that could run counter to or have an adverse effect on our foreign policy. So what this says to the states and territories, 
and to our universities that we need to work together on the world stage and speak with one voice. Acting Deputy President, I am incredibly proud of the many measures that our government has introduced to combat foreign interference. And so I do really take issue with the characterisation of the Greens that this is a rushed approach. Nothing could be further from the, the truth. In recent years, we have recognised and taken many different measures, implemented many different measures, to reflect the fact that foreign interference can threaten Australian sovereignty, our values and our national interests, Australia's way of life. It involves, by very definition, coercive, clandestine, deceptive or corrupting activities undertaken by or on behalf of a foreign actor and which are contrary to Australia's sovereignty, values and national interests. Our bill is not focused on any particular country and neither have any of our measures. They include the National Security Legislation Amendment, Espionage and Foreign Interference Act of 2018, which criminalised covert and deceptive activities of foreign actors that intend to interfere with Australia's institutions of democracy. The Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Act 2018, which requires people to register if they engage in parliamentary lobbying, general political lobbying, communications activity or donor activity on behalf of a foreign principal. The Security of Critical Infrastructure Act 2018, which introduced a range of measures including a register of critical infrastructure assets that gives the Australian government visibility on who owns and controls these assets. The Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Funding and Disclosure Reform Act, which restricts political donations from foreign governments and state-owned enterprises. In December 2019, the Prime Minister announced the establishment of a counter-foreign interference task force to disrupt and deter those attempting to undermine our national interests. And then another measure, the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme, which aims to provide the public and government decision makers with visibility of the nature, level and extent of foreign influence on Australia's government and political processes. We have also made very major improvements to our foreign investment and takeover laws so that the Foreign Investment Review Board has the power to assess the sale of critical state-owned infrastructure assets to private foreign investors. This was an issue I raised in my first speech in this place. Keeping our critical assets in Australian hands is incredibly important, and now the Treasurer has a, a range of powers, including the last resort review power, which can give him the power, does give him the power, uh, when he deems necessary, to require the divestment of foreign interests in a business entity or piece of land. So the bill before the Senate today aims to ensure that state and territory arrangements with foreign governments are consistent with Australia's foreign policy. Australian public universities established under state and territory legislation and the Australian National University will be required to notify the Foreign Minister of all existing and proposed arrangements they have with foreign entities, including with foreign universities that do not have institutional autonomy. So this legislation is not about stopping arrangements which benefit Australia. The vast majority of university arrangements will continue as normal. But this will ensure that there is greater transparency to activities between the states and the territories and universities which involve foreign governments. And the government has now, the Morrison government, has now introduced amendments to the bill to describe the circumstances in which a foreign university lacks institutional autonomy and under the definition a foreign university does not have institutional autonomy if a foreign government is in a position to substantially control the university's internal governance, education, research or academic staff. Of course, this issue has been of particular interest 
in my home state of Victoria, where the Victorian government has entered into a very contentious agreement with the Chinese Communist government, the Belt and Road Initiative. And of course, it's very clear, and we have made very clear, that this bill does not target any country at all. But certainly, there have been very serious concerns raised about these arrangements. And once this bill, we hope, is law, the Victorian government will then be subject to proper scrutiny and accountability in relation to the agreement that it has reached uh, with the Chinese government. Because at the end of the day, this is all about ensuring that no matter whether it's a state, a territory or a university, any arrangement with a foreign government must be such that it does not adversely affect Australia's foreign relations or is not inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy. Australia faces many challenges across the globe. Uh, this bill before the Senate today is another critical step in ensuring Australia's national security and that our national interests are at the forefront at all times. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Uh, Acting Deputy President, um, I, if, uh, if I um, heard uh, that last uh, contribution correctly, it, it's only served to deepen my misgivings about the foundations of this piece of legislation, uh, the real rationale. Because when speakers on the other side of this chamber uh, talk about the agreements that states and territories have entered into. They've only got one state in mind, one institution. There's nothing that senators on the other side or members in the other place have got to say about the agreement that the Northern Territory government reached uh, with a, a Chinese company to lease the port of Darwin for 99 years. Nothing about the previous uh, agreements, Belt and Road Initiative agreements that the Commonwealth uh, signed in 2017. Uh, no reflection on their previous comments by the now leader of the government in the House and others senior in the government supporting uh, those arrangements. It's only an assault uh, on the Victorian government uh, with very little, as far as I can see it, very little foundation. Uh, that sits behind the political logic of this bill. As is so often the case, it's a government that misdiagnoses the problem, misconceives the solution uh, and is deeply directionless on such an important issue of national interest. It's an issue that requires consistency in approach. It's an issue that requires more voices, not less, uh, coming from Australia requires deeper engagement from all levels of government across the public sector and in a bit business to business from our private sector, NGOs, people to people. It's not challenged, I don't think by anybody in this place, the primacy of the Commonwealth on external affairs. But what we say if, is if the Commonwealth government has a primary role, then they should lead and provide leadership. And so far, they have been incapable of doing that. So far, incapable of articulating a plan to put Australia in the best position in our region, in the strongest position for our national interest. It should be straightforward to construct a proper understanding of the national interest here. It requires, at all levels of government and in our institutions, a culture of disclosure engagement, education between the Commonwealth and the institutions, particularly in this period of intensification of regional challenge. But this bill is a ham-fisted effort. It uses a hammer for a job that really requires a Phillips head screwdriver. And with the track record of the government on these questions, I think we're entitled to a little bit of cynicism about the origins of this piece of legislation. So we know from the Senate estimates process 
that there was no consultation with the organisations and institutions and levels of government that would be affected by the implementation of the legislation. There's no national security requirement for secrecy, not necessary to sneak up on Australian universities or the governments of the states or territories or the peak organisations that uh, represent local government. I think that there was no consultation, <coughs> Mr Ackney, Deputy Speaker, because they hadn't got anywhere close to finishing the job. What drove the announcement of this piece of legislation was not a properly constructed set of national interest concerns, but base domestic political expediency. It was done that week because the Prime Minister needed to get the aged care crisis off the front pages. And that is, uh, should be a matter of deep regret uh, if they were capable of it, for people, uh, senators on the other side. As Senator Wong said, the, the issues that face us in the region are more complex than they've ever been before, more challenging than at any other period since the Second World War, and more consequential for the Australian national interest than they've been in living memory. They affect not just our trade, our future security for us and for our children, uh, but the kind of collaboration and work for mutual gain that should be going on in our region. And instead of a considered, consistent approach led by the senior leadership of those opposite, what we've seen is a race to the bottom uh, of what passes for backbench thinking and backbench adv adventurism. Uh, about relations, particularly relations with China. In terms of the states and territories, it's been said that the primacy of the Commonwealth is an unremarkable proposition. It's the absence of the Commonwealth that's the problem. It's the lack of the leadership and the lack of clarity that Australia needs. And we've seen over the course of the last few years a botched, misconceived, ham-fisted approach to our foreign relations. Right from when the Prime Minister posed for what I call the, the, the Craig Kelly member for Hughes audience with this wacky speech to the Lowy Foundation about negative globalism, deliberately posturing for some of the uh, characters that inhabit uh, the One Nation Party and some of the elements of the backbench. Minister Payne, who's suggested that we need to improve the performance of global institutions, but the scale of resources and scale of commitment that Australia provides through its embassies and our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has dwindled as the challenges got bigger. The uh, suggestion, without any plan, without any means to achieve it, without any acceptance or reading of the geopolitical realities of it, that weapons inspector powers people should be sent in uh, to China without any capacity to deliver that strategy, another soundbite foreign policy that led us nowhere. A series of political appointments that give political appointments a bad name in foreign affairs. Uh, the buffoonery and clownish behaviour of former Treasurer Mr Hockey uh, and Mr Downer. Uh, haven't done us any favours at all on the international stage. You can't have any confidence uh, that this government has got a proper construction of the national interest in mind when it frames this kind of legislation. It's true that the states and territories have always had a global and external affairs role. Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane at the very least. Uh, I'm sure senators would make a claim for Adelaide and Perth and Hobart have been are global cities. Sister state relationships have been critical to growing economic relations, diversifying and growing our trade. The New South Wales Guangdong Province Agreement in 1979 has been critical uh, to the economic development of the state of New South Wales. Uh, what I hope not to see as a result of this legislation is less engagement from the states and territories. Less voices speaking up 
for the interest of Australians, of Australian businesses and of Australian communities. I suspect that what we'll see as a consequence of this legislation in terms of the Port of Darwin lease is nothing. I want to see more engagement from the states and territories. Of course, we'll never know uh, what the position of the states and territories would have been had there been proper consultation. They refused to turn up to the Senate processes because they saw it, I think, for what it was, a shortened up process. Let me just come to the universities for a moment. I do acknowledge that the explanatory memorandum and the rules that were issued after the processes of the committee uh, have whittled away some of the regulatory burden for universities. But it remains the case that there was zero consultation for a draft legislation that would have created an obligation for individual universities to have tens of thousands of agreements registered with the Commonwealth, albeit now whittled down to probably a couple of hundred for each university, that is an unacceptable proposition. The government wouldn't do it to any other business. They certainly didn't do it to private universities, but they've foisted this wall of regulation with very little public policy rationale, and it sits against the backdrop of an overwhelming hostility to the university sector that comes from this government. Why not carefully engage and consult? Build from the framework that's already been established in partnership with the universities, the UFIT framework, the University Foreign Inter Interference Task Force framework, Pursue the legitimate public and national expectation that institutional resilience in terms of foreign interference needs to be defended and protected and grown. Staff should be educated and enabled to participate in foreign engagements uh, in the national interest. Should build the culture of universities and university staff asking questions uh, and encourage more engagement. But the Liberals and Nationals don't understand how universities work. Global collaboration is fundamental to university research. Sharing expertise and research is fundamental to the work that our universities do. To name two things, the COVID-19 genome sequence and the Gardasil vaccine are both the product of deep collaboration and research between Australian universities and universities overseas, including in the People's Republic of China. And of course, the gaping hole in this legislation is that while there's a wall of regulation for our public universities, Bond University, the private universities, uh, they're not touched by the legislative framework. No regulation for them. I have seen in the um, government's response uh, to the committee's report that there's a prospect that hospitals will be included now at this late stage. No consultation, no public policy rationale, again, just uh, sucking up to a few elements on the coalition backbench who have demanded this position. We should be dealing with this issue, with this set of issues, from an understanding of the facts. There is increasing great power competition in our region. Australia hasn't done the work over the last seven years that is required on regional multilateralism and our, and our investment in relationships in the region. The work hasn't been done. There's been a withdrawal, a reduction a diminution of Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade capacity in terms of the scale of the challenge that we face. There are structural challenges for Australia in the region. And if events like today's uh, deeply shocking tweet are any indication, we are likely to face more of these kinds of challenges in the future. There's been an aggressive unhelpful and unfriendly series of actions in terms of our trading relationships. That requires a thoughtful, critical, strategic response that's founded in a clear understanding of our place 
and our role in the region and a capacity to articulate a regional commitment to multilateralism and a cooperative nationalism in the region. Instead, we've got a guff from the Prime Minister. I, I still don't quite know what negative globalism means. A series of unforced errors and no plan. No plan for how Australia is going to proceed in the region and how we're going to be uh, approaching these great issues of state. Most disturbingly, we've seen a nasty streak emerge uh, on the coalition backbench. I don't think that the interventions of Mr Christensen and others have been helpful. Um, I don't think that the adventurism of some in this place has been helpful. I don't think that recent events uh, on, in the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee uh, have been helpful. Uh, and I do think that for a government that says that it wants Australia to speak with one voice, it wouldn't hurt you to have a talk to your backbench and see if they could just let you do the talking for a little while in this period uh, of deepening challenge. Instead, disciplines required from the states and territories and the universities. Is your time for contribution has expired. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020. The Greens will be opposing this ill thought out overreach by the government that comes before us after a rushed and insufficient consultation process. Senator Rice's contribution and dissenting report to the limited inquiry into this legislation reflected the broader terminal issues with this legislation. I want to highlight the impact it will have on the work of our universities. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has carved a path of destruction through the higher education sector this year, allowing tens of thousands of jobs to be lost, performing legislative gymnastics to deny universities JobKeeper, abandoning international students to long queues outside food banks, slashing more than a billion dollars each year from core funding for teaching and learning, and more than doubling the fees for some degrees to create decades more student debt for a generation of young people facing flat wage growth and skyrocketing unemployment. His justification for refusing to come to the aid of university staff whose jobs were being cut by ruthless management was to appeal to the principle of university autonomy. Scott Morrison of early 2020 would have you believe the government ought not interfere with the independence of universities. Well, it suited, suited them financially then to ignore universities, but now it suits them ideologically to meddle where there is no need for them to do so, and no good will come of it. Across the university sector, staff and university management alike are gravely concerned about this legislation. The extraordinarily broad scope of this bill means that the minister, seemingly on a whim dressed up as concern for their conception of national interest, can tear up the kind of agreements between Australian universities and overseas organisations or governments that underpin vital research. Um, and arrangements for joint degrees, cultural and student exchanges, and happenings as basic as jointly held academic conferences. The potential and indeed opportunity for ministerial overreach created by the bill shouldn't be understated, particularly keeping in mind the tendency for liberal ministers to meddle at every available opportunity as they've done with local research grants they didn't like the sound of in the past. It took the government making last-minute amendments to their own legislation to address the question of what counts as institutional autonomy that was left wide open by the legislation introduced into the other place. But even with the government's own amendments to circumscribe the range of universities and overseas education providers the bill applies to, its scope is still too broad. The bill defines an arrangement as any written agreement, contract, understanding or undertaking. 
It should be no surprise to anyone that universities have thousands and thousands of agreements that are captured by this definition. Perhaps the education minister was distracted cutting fun uni funding while this was drafted and neglected to mention that to his colleagues. It should come as no surprise that most of the agreements, contracts, understandings, and undertakings captured by that definition are entirely mundane, and the broader effect will be, as submitters to the inquiry put it, creating a huge administrative burden on both them and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And I, I know that some of that uh, might have been addressed, but it is still a big issue. Curiously, while the bill captures public unis, it does not extend to other entities that routinely deal with the governments and institutions of other nation states, such as private universities, other NGOs, and private corporations. And I'm not suggesting it should, but indicating how baffling it is that were it not for the Liberals' particular ideological vendetta against public unis, it would be entirely unclear why the government chose to include them. With respect to our unis, I note also that they already point to the university's foreign interference task force that was set up to scope out and address the exact issue this bill is now wading into. The preference of universities as autonomous institutions that should be free to pursue collaborations and research is quite clearly to continue their work with the government in identifying and mitigating genuine risks without allowing the minister to arbitrarily rip up agreements that the coalition doesn't like. I should note, of course, that it's not any old kind of foreign interference in our universities that the government is concerned about. They have no concerns about the rivers of gold that weapons manufacturers use to associate their names with the likes of United States study centers to improve their PR or promote a sympathetic research agenda. It's selective concern about China that's driving this from the very start. This picking and choosing of when interference is bad both offends the principle of university autonomy and muddies our foreign policy. If the government were truly concerned about safeguarding university autonomy and protecting against interference, then they would have approached the issue holistically not try to ram through this bill crafted to suit the Liberals' approach to China. We hear the concerns of the university sector about this legislation and its impact. The government's two minor amendments pour a glass of water on a bonfire of this legislation. The problems remaining far outnumber those solved, and the only appropriate course is to remove universities from the scope of this legislation, and I will be moving an amendment to do so. If the government is genuine about reversing course and getting into the business of protecting university independence, then reversing their cuts and giving them financial independence is the first necessary step. In complaining about universities' dealings with groups in other countries, the government is pointing to the symptom caused by decades of systemic underfunding that they've been the biggest champions and cause of. The Greens' commitment to massive new investment in our unis, lifelong free university and TAFE for all, and building university democracy and the power of staff and students is the solution needed here. This work is only made more urgent by the Liberals' ongoing attacks on our unis. The issues with this bill are not limited to its impact on unis. In the first instance, it simply doesn't do what the government claims it will. They are now talking up the supposed alignment of agreements with the national interest. But when they hit the media to discuss it, it's all about imposing the liberal national vision of the world on states, territories, local governments and unis in an entirely unprecedented way. At its core, it ignores that the country benefits from a plurality of approaches to foreign policy and countless links between our communities and the rest of the world. It is not up to the government, and it never should be, to be the sole arbiter of foreign relations and to dictate every moment of every Australian institution's relationship with global organizations. The consultation around the Bill 2 has been 
woeful. This is legislation introduced during a pandemic when the government claims they're too busy to deal with the federal ICAC or the dodgy deals and questionable characters running wild in their ranks. There was no exposure draft, no preliminary consultation, and an undemocratically short committee process with only two public hearings into complicated legislation. The government can't explain properly how this will work in practice. The organizations affected haven't been given the time or information to determine its impact, and the parliament hasn't been given the opportunity to scrutinize it appropriately. We shouldn't be surprised at this behavior from those opposite. But we will add one to the rapidly rising count of major changes they're rushing through as far from the public eye as possible. Universities of Australia put it well in their submission. Apart from the inherent issues with the bill, its workability and the potential to deter the collaboration that is the lifeblood of Australian research, there is a range of outstanding questions. These apply to the bill, but also to the rules that will accompany it. Further detailed consultation is required with the sector on the core issues with the bill, as well as the many questions inherent in it. Add to that the questions of constitutional validity, the absurd scope of the proposed framework, and the broad or completely absent definitions of key terms in which the implementation turns plus the lack of ability to properly review ministerial decisions, and you've got another ideological mess from Scott Morrison. This bill should be opposed. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of this bill, knowing that there's been plenty of examples that show the need for it. But a good place to start is the Constitution of Australia, a document that, as a bit of a law nerd, I feel strongly about, but that the details of which matter a great deal. Section 51 of this document sets out what are the legislative powers of this parliament. And something that's listed in section 51 is to be the subject of the work of this body to the exclusion of state parliaments. And that's an important point for the purposes of this law. Because section 51, subsection 29, gives this parliament, to the exclusion of state parliaments, the right to legislate on external affairs. Now, to mum and dad listening at home who may not be as big a law nerd as I, they might go, well, what on earth is external affairs? But external affairs is about Australia's relationships with other countries in the world. It's about foreign relations and diplomacy. And so it's entirely appropriate that the dealings of Australia conducted with other countries be done from the Commonwealth level. That itself shouldn't be a controversial proposition. And yet, we've had a recent example in the Belt and Road Initiative where the Victorian government decided it wanted to sign up to China's global infrastructure project, a $1.44 trillion soft power initiative of the Chinese Communist Party designed to project its power among the world. 2018. Then Premier Andrews, still Premier Andrews, decided to sign up to it without the support of the federal government, without consulting the federal government, without the, providing any notice to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And it's worth noting that they were the only state government that wanted to sign up to the agreement. And it raised a really important question. Do they even have the right to do this? In circumstances where we know that the Belt and Road Initiative is all about the ability of the Chinese government to strengthen its ties with particular places and to achieve particular geopolitical objectives. Did a state government even have the power in the first place 
to make that kind of an agreement with the Chinese Communist Party. I'd suggest the conventional position is that they didn't, but the very fact that a state government thought that was something they could do without consultation or without discussion speaks to a need. And it's a need that is met by this bill. I might move on to another example. In several universities in this country, there are Confucius Institutes. They're joint ventures between Australian universities and particular Chinese universities and Hanban, an agency that is a part of China's education ministry. And these are funded by the Chinese government and they operate on 13 Australian university campuses. Now, if they simply fulfil the function of helping people to understand Chinese culture and get to know the language, then they could potentially be a really good influence. However, the experience we have come to learn is that rather than simply engaging in cultural and language education, they disseminate Chinese Communist Party propaganda, exert undue influence and attempt to outsource our curriculum to Beijing, striking agreements with our universities that allow them to veto particular subjects and topics and themes from being taught in those universities, well, then we're dealing with something different entirely. And I'll give you an example. The centres have signed agreements explicitly stating that they must comply with Beijing, that is the Communist Party government, based in Beijing, their decision-making authority over teaching in those facilities. And so if we take the agreement that was initially signed by the University of Queensland or Griffith University, La Trobe or Charles Darwin University, those agreements stated that they quote, must accept the assessment of the headquarters on the teaching quality at the centres. And the way that this played out meant that an economics class funded by the Confucius Institute at the University of Queensland was caught teaching propaganda in which Uyghurs and pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong were labelled as, quote, terrorists. Or just recently, the University of Queensland named Brisbane's Chinese Consul General in the position of honorary professor without any public announcement and in doing so showed the continuation of a tradition of strong influence that university management had told us had been superseded by the second agreement with the Confucius Institute. And last year, in the renewal of that agreement, which I have referred to just a moment ago, the UQ committed to those arrangements continuing for the long term. Now, the Department of Education has implemented a ban on Confucius Institutes operating in public schools. And in doing so, they've cited concerns about foreign influence. And it's worth noting that across the United States, institutes of this kind have been shut down in a number of public and private universities. Perhaps I'll go to a further example, the Thousand Talents Program. That program is a Chinese government plan to recruit top scientists from around the world. Now, of itself, and if done in a purely academic arrangement, that need not be a bad thing. It aims to recruit Australian scientists and academics by offering lucrative incentives, but, and here's a significant condition, it obliges recruits to abide by Chinese law. That means that those academics continue to work full time for Australian universities while making frequent trips to China to visit the affiliated Thousand Talents University with which they have made their arrangement. Now, that means they continue to apply for Australian Research Council grants with um, the hope that there will be no checks about where that research will end up. 
It means that their new inventions face the risk of being patented by China, often in secret. And it means that those inventions are often commercialised with China to reap the economic benefits, often of the Australian taxpayer's investment. Now, that program has been described by the director of the FBI from the United States, Christopher Wray, as a form of economic espionage, with scientists legally signing away the rights to their intellectual property to China at the same time they remain employed by Australian institutions. And additionally, China sends its researchers to work at Australian universities, and we need to be sure that when that happens, the intellectual property that's shared isn't at risk. Now, as I said, the Thousand Talents program need not be a bad thing. It's only when the arrangements associated with it are secret or that seek to bequeath the intellectual property in which Australians have invested to the Chinese government that we start to see problems. And so when people say this legislation isn't necessary, we can start with the Belt and Road example, but we can flow through many of the others that I've just pointed to. The fact is that the Commonwealth has responsibility for foreign policy. It's got the expertise to deal with it properly, to understand its implications, and yet, at the moment, there is no requirement for the states of this good country to consult properly with the Commonwealth and its departments about the arrangements it, they intend to make with foreign governments. And I think the average mum and dad in their homes tonight would be shocked by that. They would want to know that if any government of this country wanted to do a deal with a foreign government, that it would be something that those looking after foreign policy in this country would know about. The bill's not about intruding excessively into the territories and the state's business, but instead it's about providing Australians with the confidence that when international arrangements are entered into, those who do so are doing it with due diligence, with an understanding of its implications, and to make sure that at all times those agreements are consistent with our national interest and our values. Because it would have been quite easy for many of those university parties who entered into agreements to establish Confucius Institutes to do so, thinking that they were engaging in a perfectly positive exercise, not necessarily understanding that there was the potential for that arrangement to be misused. And so it's important that the Commonwealth seeks to ensure that states and territories respect our constitutional arrangements and, as a consequence, engage in processes that make sure they fully understand what they're entering into before they do so. Now, the Commonwealth and DFAT have the expertise necessary to make sure that state governments, universities and government agencies fully understand the consequence of the agreements they intend to enter into. And they have the expertise to help those governments or institutions understand the consequences of doing so, making sure it's consistent with our foreign policy. Because ultimately, it's all about the national interest. It's all good and well for a university to say, well, it was necessary to fund our bills this year, or um, for a state government to say we wanted to build this, that or the other. But ultimately, everything we do as servants of the Australian people in our various parliaments, or indeed in a publicly funded institution, has to be about the proper service of the national interest. And if consultation doesn't occur in the way that it should, the Commonwealth won't get an opportunity to properly review those arrangements. And if there isn't that due diligence and consultation, we risk, we have the very real risk, of having a messy patchwork of contracts, of memorandums of understanding, of well-meaning but ultimately undermining relationships and collaboration arrangements 
that could run counter to or have an adverse effect upon our foreign policy. And so this bill is a call to all of our states and all of our territories and our public institutions like our universities to come together, to work together and speak with one voice on the world stage. You wouldn't think that that was a particularly controversial proposition. It applies to Australian public universities, not private ones. And that's an important distinction to make. But, of course, all universities, public and private, are encouraged to be transparent about their arrangements with foreign institutions by taking up the opportunity to voluntarily consult, to publish information about those arrangements on their website, so that both the public and our diplomats can properly understand the foreign policy implications of potential arrangements before they're entered into. It's important that our universities are able to engage freely and fully on the world stage. It's the nature of good research in this era that our universities need to be able to collaborate with other universities. But it's important that when the Australian public makes an investment in research, that when it makes an investment in intellectual property, it gets a dividend of that, that it isn't snavelled up by another government with another agenda that doesn't necessarily align with the interests of the Australian people. And it is vital that state governments at all times understand not only the constitutional separation of duties that means the Commonwealth is in charge on this matter, but that consultation is key to our foreign policy being consistent nationwide. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> I rise to speak tonight in support of the Australian Foreign Relations Bill that is before the Senate today. But before I go into the details of these bills, can I recognise the government's continued commitment to participating in the international rules-based order and our ongoing efforts to ensure that Australia's best interests are at the forefront of our thinking. I think it is also important to note that just today we have seen a display of the sort of appalling behaviour that can occur when nation states feel that they are above the rules-based order and resort to belligerence rather than diplomacy. As I have said earlier in this place, Australia has a proud history of helping to found and support various international frameworks rules and institutions that have evolved since the destruction and carnage of the two world wars last century. Through the work of organisations such as the UN, World Bank, IMF, WTO, Australia and countries in our region have benefited from the expertise and assistance that those bodies have brought to bear in a time of crisis. And I think it is important, Mr Acting Deputy President, to remind people how important these international institutions are in providing a stable and prosperous international community. Without them, things such as trade agreements, international aid, responses to health crises would have been difficult to achieve. The capacity to raise standards of living in developing nations to lift people out of poverty would also not be possible. Australia, as a trading nation, relies on an open and free world trading system, and that is supported by an international rules-based order to maintain peace and prosperity. Without that system, Australia would not have enjoyed 28 years of uninterrupted growth, expanded export markets, both for goods and services, and an international reputation for low sovereign risk and measured diplomacy. Of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, no system is perfect, and I will not stand here and say that I think all multilateral bodies are perfect. They are not, and some reform is both needed and inevitable. That is why it is important that Australia has a consistent approach to dealing with the vagaries of international events through measured and thoughtful approach to foreign policy. Australia cannot afford to have a fragmented approach to developing foreign policy. International agreements that bind Australia's academic, uh, academia, research, 
state, territory and local governments to actions that are in inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy should not be entered into. If they are, then they show naivety, willful ignorance or blind incompetence to, in their development. So these bills will provide the public with confidence that state and territory arrangements and those of their entities with foreign governments are consistent with Australia's foreign policy interests. The Australian government, through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has the expertise necessary to assess whether arrangements with foreign governments are consistent with our foreign policy and therefore consistent with our national interest. Without consultation, the Australian government has no opportunity to review the proposed arrangements and apply that expertise. Without due diligence and consultation, we risk having patchwork relationship of a patchwork, relation, patchwork of relationships, contracts, MOUs collabor and collaborations that could run counter to or have an adverse effect on our, policy, our foreign policy interests. The Australian government and our states and territories need to work together on the international stage to speak with one voice. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, there is no better example of how important this is than in my home state of Victoria. The Andrews government, in signing up to, the, to China's Belt and Road Initiative, is just another example of how badly they manage Victoria's interests. Premier Andrews, signing up to an international $1.5 trillion initiative without even consulting those responsible for Australia's foreign policy is just willful irresponsibility on behalf of his government. I cannot imagine why a government, let alone its premier, thought that signing a memorandum of understanding with a foreign government and without thinking about its impact on Australia's interest was the right way to go. The secretive nature of how this agreement came about, the lack of consultation and the poor way it has been handled since just confirms that this ineptitude is business as usual for the Andrews government. And we've seen this ineptitude and the secretiveness more recently, with the failed ho hotel quarantine program resulting in lockdowns that has destroyed Victoria's economy. And just today that we hear ratings agencies are saying that it's a 50-50 bet that Victoria will lose its AAA credit rating. And as reported in the Financial Re Review today, a, an S&P analyst said, and I quote, we consider the downside risks to Victoria's AAA rating are rising substantially. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, these bills will establish an approval regime and a notification regime. The regime applies to a, a pr proposed and existing international agreements. If they are proposed, the Foreign Minister can declare that they will not go ahead. If they are already in place, the Minister can declare that they are invalid. State and territory entity wanting to uh, enter into an agreement, wanting an agreement with the government of another country or one of its agencies, will be required to notify and get approval from the foreign minister. If a state or territory or local government or an Australian university wishes to make an arrangement with the foreign entity, they must notify the foreign minister of that arrangement. The foreign minister's approval in these instances is not required. However, the Foreign Minister does have the discretion to declare that they are invalid or that they cannot proceed if they are inconsistent with foreign policy. These laws will ensure that, as a nation, we are consistent in how we deal with the world and that all states and territories conclude foreign arrangements that are only in our national interest. The test is whether the, foreign, whether, the, test is whether the Foreign Minister is satisfied that an arrangement or its negotiation does not adversely affect Australia's foreign relations or is unlikely to do so. And it is not inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy or is unlikely to do so. Now, Madam Acting De Deputy President, in concluding my remarks, it must be emphasised that these bills intend to address foreign engagement by state and territory governments and their entities. This approach reflects this government's focus on ensuring consistency in Australia's foreign policy and foreign relations across all levels of government. Through our network of academic, economic, trade, security agreements, alliances and membership, 
Australia draw, draws numerous benefits. Our economic prosperity relies on them, but they must overall be in the country's national interest first and last. Sovereignty cannot and should not outweigh money. Sorry, sovereignty can and should outweigh money. Without a measured and thoughtful approach that, take, that takes in Australia's national interest when entering into these sorts of agreements, we will find ourselves appearing fragmented, inconsistent and ununited in our approach to foreign affairs. I commend the bell. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Faraventi Wells. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Having participated in the Senate committee hearings, the evidence again reinforces concerns I have publicly raised over a long period of time about foreign interference and foreign influence in Australia, and most especially from the communist regime in Beijing. These bills are part of the suite of measures which the government is increasingly relying upon to confront the insidious and growing threat of foreign interference and foreign influence in Australia. It is important that arrangements of state and territory governments are consistent with Australian foreign policy. The Commonwealth and state and territories need to speak, uh, as has been said, with one voice. And this is especially the case when, in relation to China, we are finally recognising that it can no longer be business as usual with the communist regime. Whilst there are a number of other schemes that aim to protect Australia's interests in dealing with foreign entities, they serve different purposes. However, gaps remain. One concern that I have raised repeatedly is the exemption Commonwealth, state and territory and local governments enjoy from foreign investment review. Notwithstanding the proposed major reforms to the uh, FERB framework, the exemption remains in place except where a government proposes to sell to a foreign government and if the subject of the sale is public infrastructure or where the interest being acquired is a national security business or national security land. These bills seek to deal with another critical gap of facilitating Commonwealth oversight of foreign arrangements entered into by states and territories and their entities. And whilst they are an important step, I do not believe that they go far enough. Following the report of the committee, the government has included a definition of institutional autonomy. This is particularly important regarding the university sector. However, I am disappointed that there has not been consistency by also including a definition of corporate autonomy. I have repeatedly outlined concerns regarding the operation of foreign-owned enterprises, foreign state-owned enterprises in Australia, especially where those corporations are operating commercial activities in critical sectors, critical infrastructure and, more importantly, in sectors where national security concerns exist. Arrangement it, arrangements with SOEs that operate on a commercial basis, including commercial leases, are not the focus of these bills. But these are the very arrangements which have given rise to public concerns. Their exclusion from this legislation affects its very credibility. I think we need to be clear with the Australian public. Arrangements with entities that operate in a democratic framework are not likely to give rise to concerns. It is those entities which operate under totalitarian regimes and have no autonomy that are of greatest concern. I have used the example of Chinese companies where corporate governance is virtually non-existent. Article 19 of China's company law states, in companies, Communist Party organisations shall, in accordance with the provisions of the constitution of the Communist Party of China, be set up to carry out activities of the party. Companies shall provide the necessary conditions for the party organisation to carry out their activities. This puts the CCP front and centre, irrespective of whether companies operate inside or outside China. A South China Morning Post article of 3 November 2020 outlines Beijing's new plan for SOEs, citing comments by Xi Jinping that they form the economic and political foundation of China's socialist system and are a key pillar for the Communist Party's rule. They must be built stronger, better and larger, and that the sector's role cannot be negated or weakened. Indeed, Beijing calls the shots no matter how large the corporation. According to recent media reports, Xi Jinping personally made the decision to halt the initial public offering of Ant Group, which would have been the world's biggest after controlling shareholder Jack Ma infuriated government leaders when he compared the lending practices of state-owned banks in China to pawn shops. 
A 2017 paper titled Mapping the Legal Landscape China State-Owned Companies in Australia by Professor Tomasik and Dr Zhang explores the legal contours of China, Chinese controlled investment in Australia. It is noted that by 2016 there were 66 Chinese SOEs with 214 subsidiaries in Australia operating across most industry, industry sectors. The Productivity Commission's June 2020 research paper titled Foreign Investment in Australia finds our largest FDI sources remain the US, Japan and the UK. However, it states Chinese investors have significantly increased their holdings in the past decade, although identifying the precise value is difficult. Data suggests that flows into Australia for which the ultimate beneficial owner is from China are about three times as high as those for which they are the immediate owner, as funds flow through corporate structures in third countries. Chinese investment has grown in the past decade from low levels in 2008 to become Australia's fifth largest FDI investor, with 4 per cent of total FDI stocks at the end of 2018. The PC states that in recent years national security concerns around inward FDI have tended to involve Chinese investors and that in the past much of this concern was directed at SOEs or sovereign wealth funds as opaque arms of government accused of investing for non-commercial or strategic reasons. The PC also states that more recently FDI by privately owned Chinese companies has also generated consternation. In part, this is because Chinese law can require all Chinese companies to maintain national security or to support Chinese government security activities. It cites the American Enterprise Institute going so far as to state that there is no difference in the control the Communist Party can exercise over private firms and SOEs, so there is no justification to treat them differently with regard to national security. The PC paper cites examples where Chinese investment uh, has raised national security concerns in Australia, including the 2018 Huawei decision, the lease of the Port of Darwin uh, to Landbridge, the 2016 attempt by the New South Wales government to sell 50.4 per cent of Ausgrid on a 99-year lease to Chinese SOE State Grid Corporation and Hong Kong's Chung Kong Infrastructure Holdings and the March 2009 bid for Oz Minerals by China Min Metals. The PC pertinently highlights the increase in public opposition to Chinese investment. A 2019 Lowy Institute poll found that 68 per cent of respondents thought that Australia allows too much investment from China. The PC also notes that whereas Australia has previously seen community opposition to FDI during periods of rapid increase in investment from specific countries, namely the US in the 1960s and Japan in the 1980s, this is the first period of rapid increase in investment from a country that is not a democratic country nor a military ally. Considering the extent of Chinese investment both by SOEs and so-called private-owned companies and our failure to exclude arrangements with such entities in the bills weakens their credibility. It is the elephant in the room. What is the point of having such legislation when we are excluding from its reach the very entities that are most likely to engage in the very activities that these bills seek to cover? In relation to the university sector, I was especially concerned to note the negative attitude not only to the bills, but also that the government would even presume to affect the sector's activities through the enactment of these bills. Our university sector, together with a wide chorus of businessmen, have urged us to effectively ignore the communist regime's many excesses in favour of the continuation of the rivers of gold. The outgoing threats by China are symptomatic of the predicament we find ourselves in, noting that years of questionable and defective foreign and trade policy have made us vulnerable to economic coercion. For years, those who have had responsibility for our fellow traveller foreign policy were prepared to ignore CCP skullduggery so long as the rivers of gold continue to flow. This is a bad business model, and we are now paying the price for not having diversified our trade and instead concentrated one third of our exports into one market. It defies basic business practice 101. 
I know that many Australians who have contacted me do not agree with the Defence Minister's comments on 9 September that there are no security concerns regarding the Port of Darwin. How can one of our most strategic assets in Northern Australia, the gateway to Australia, be leased to a company with ties to the communist regime in Beijing? How can this not be a matter of concern? It simply doesn't pass the pub test. There is absolutely no doubt that were the lease of the port to be considered today, it would not only be subject to FERB review, but most likely would be rejected. It is obvious from the Northern Territory submission and evidence at the hearing that there is contemplation of a reacquisition of the port, given the clear reference by Chief Minister Gunner to compensation for declaring arrangements invalid. It is appropriate that the Commonwealth seek to ensure state territory consultation regarding foreign arrangements. The fact that no state or territory government chose to attend and give evidence is in itself indicative of their lack of appreciation of the need for their actions to be consistent with our foreign policy. I am especially disappointed that my very detailed questions on notice to New South Wales Premier Berejiklian and Chief Minister Gunner were not even responded to. As a senator for New South Wales, I and many of my constituents are particularly concerned about the extensive arrangements between New South Wales and Chinese entities in critical areas like energy, public infrastructure and transport. This is especially concerning given the actions of a number of governments, especially in their dealings with the CCP and its Belt and Road strategy. Whilst promoted as an avenue for providing infrastructure funding, it is basically a debt trap and influence strategy, mostly resulting in debt for equity arrangements. As Minister for International Development in the Pacific, I saw firsthand how debt trap diplomacy operated. Following my public warnings about China's activities, most especially in the Pacific, an international debate ensued about debt trap diplomacy and the examples in different parts of the world which had left countries and areas with unsustainable debts. In addition, BRI is not about local jobs with projects usually constructed by Chinese firms with their own labour. Here in Australia, we have seen the Beijing draft MOU and agreements between China and Victoria. The willingness of Premier Andrews to deal with the communist regime in Beijing has rightly earned him the label Chairman Dan. The government has made a number of amendments which have improved the bills, and I welcome that. I note that more amendments will be proposed. It is important that we keep an open mind about these so that the bills can be improved further. Thank you. Uh, thank you very